Chapter Fifteen of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A terrible story: the handcart immigrants crossing the plains. I promised to write and tell you all about our journey across the plains, but I little expected to have such a terrible tale to tell. You have heard so much of the journey to Salt Lake Valley that you know pretty well how we must have traveled to Iowa City, where it was necessary that we would wait until the whole company was quite ready for the long journey which lay before us. Our life up to a certain point was much the same, and we met with the same difficulties as all other emigrants who had gone before us. But there the comparison ends. Privation and toil and weariness and not infrequently sickness and death wore out many of the companies that went before us, but they never suffered as we did. It is utterly impossible for me to tell you all that we went through, and when I finish this letter and lay down my pen, and even when you read the fearful story of my own experience during that journey, you will still have but the faintest idea of the horrors and sufferings which we endured. At Iowa City we found nothing prepared for us. When we left Liverpool we were told that hand carts, provisions, and all that we needed should be provided before we arrived. If this had been done we should have had just fairly time enough to travel over the plains and reach Salt Lake before the terrible cold of winter set in. As it was, everything went wrong. The elders who had been sent out before us to buy tents and carts and all that we wanted had either been unfortunate or very careless, for as I said when we arrived in Iowa City not the slightest preparation had been made. You know how strong my faith was when we left New York and how Brother Shrewsbury and myself were ready to sacrifice everything. I can assure you that we were fully tested, and I do think that but for our strong faith not a single soul of all that company would have survived that journey. Three companies had, after a long delay, been sent out before we reached Iowa City. As it was then early in the season, they completed their journey before the cold of the winter set in. I afterwards heard that Brigham Young and the elders, when they saw those companies arrive safely in Salt Lake City, spoke of the scheme as a successful experiment. We had been taught that the scheme came directly from heaven, and was neither speculation nor experiment. And when I heard that, after all, the prophet himself spoke of it as a matter of doubtful issue. I asked myself, who then can we believe? We waited three weeks in Iowa camp while they were making the handcarts. They were very lightly made, and I think not at all suitable for such a long and wearisome journey and being so hastily put together, and most of the wood unseasoned, they were utterly unfit for the rough work for which they were constructed. Twenty of these carts, one to every five, were allowed to every hundred persons, who were also allowed five good-sized tents and one Chicago wagon, with three yoke of oxen to transport the baggage and provisions. We were only allowed seventeen pounds of bedding and clothing each, which with cooking utensils and so forth, made up about 100 pounds to each cart, and that was quite as much as the cart, itself only 60 pounds in weight, could carry. You can see, Sister Stenhouse, how difficult it must have been out of every hundred persons, men, women, and children, to find twenty who were strong enough to pull even such frail things as those hand carts were. The married men and the young men and boys did the best they could, but they could do no more, and some of the carts were drawn by young girls alone. The girls and women who had no husbands used to occupy a tent by themselves at night, but in the other tents whole families without respect to age or sex, together with the young men who assisted them during the day, used to find shelter. This you will see at once was exceedingly inconvenient, but we had no choice and we had been so long associated and had suffered so much together that we did not feel it as much as we otherwise must have done. What weary days we spent! Hour after hour went by, mile after mile we walked, 
and never never seemed to be a step the further on our way sometimes i recalled to mind a hymn which we used to sing at sunday school when i was a child an evening hymn in which we returned thanks that we were a day's march nearer home but day after day went by wearily hopelessly and when each night came on and tired and footsore we lay down to rest we seemed no nearer to our home in zion do not think sister stenhouse that we gave way to despondency what we felt god alone knows but our poor weary hearts were full of confiding faith in him and we placed undoubting confidence in the promises and prophecies which we had received through his chosen servants the young folks were light-hearted and gay and with all the enthusiasm of youth they pressed on thinking not of the way but only of the end and their example was most encouraging my husband was one of the bravest and truest of all that band he drew the cart which we shared with another elder and his wife and their grown-up daughter they were old people i mean the elder and his wife and the daughter was an old maid unpleasant thin and sour and too feeble to do anything there were reasons why i was excused from taking any share in hard work but i felt as zealous as the rest and day after day walked beside my husband thinking that if nothing more my companionship might cheer him the old folks walked behind and so did the children but sometimes when the little ones were very very weary indeed the parents would place them on top of the bedding in the hand cart and give them a lift but some of the elderly people who were unused to walking far and whom it was impossible to carry suffered a great deal and sometimes mothers with children at their breasts would trudge on mile after mile in all the heat and dust without a murmur or complaint until they almost dropped down with fatigue what some of those poor creatures suffered no words could tell the sun shone down upon us with intense heat as we traveled through iowa and the people from the farmhouses and villages came out to see us and wondered at our rashness in undertaking such a journey they were very kind to us and came and visited us in our camps and offered some of the men work and good wages if they would wait there instead of going on to zion a few of the people accepted these offers but the elders as you may suppose watched carefully every company and every man and in the evening when meetings for prayer and preaching were held we were earnestly exhorted to obedience and the sin of acting upon our own judgments was set forth in the very plainest terms the kindness of the iowa people however encouraged us and they freely gave to those who most needed whatever they could to help us on our way and we needed help and sympathy of course with only one wagon to carry all the provisions for a hundred persons besides five tents our supply food was very limited at that period of the journey the grown-up people were allowed ten ounces of flour a day and a little and but a very little coffee sugar rice and bacon this was a very scanty allowance for people who all day long had to draw the hand carts or to trudge mile after mile in all that burning heat and dust but we never complained some of the men ate all their rations at breakfast and went without anything more until the next morning unless they were able to beg a little of some friendly farmer by the way the little children received just half as much as the others with a very small amount of management this inconvenience might certainly have been avoided for provisions of all sorts were very cheap in the districts through which we passed some of the more thoughtful saints i know felt very bitterly the injustice of this for as you are aware we had paid all our expenses in full even to the uttermost farthing and we had been promised in return a safe and sufficient outfit with plenty of provisions and in fact all that was necessary had we been left to ourselves we should of course have provided for every contingency but we came in obedience to counsel under the direction of the church 
and after we had paid for everything, the church even took care of our money, so that we could therefore not procure necessaries by the way, as otherwise we might have done. Thus wearily and suffering not a little privation, we traveled all through Iowa, until we came to the Missouri River and encamped at Florence, a place about six miles north of Omaha, and there we remained about a week preparing for our journey across the plains. It was the middle of August when we arrived at Florence, and we had been delayed so much on the way that it appeared to many of the more experienced that it would now be the height of imprudence for us to cross the plains at that season. With old people, delicate women, and little children, and without carriages of any sort, except the frail handcarts that carried our bedding, it would be a weary long time before we could reach Salt Lake. Every step must be trudged on foot, and it was quite impossible that we could walk many miles a day, while there was before us a journey of over a thousand. Some of the elders proposed that we should settle where we were, or somewhere nearby, until the following spring, and then go to Zion. But others who were more confident urged that we should proceed at once. The elders called a great meeting to settle the matter at which we were all present. I should tell you that when we first started, our whole company was placed under the guidance of Elder James G. Willie as captain, and we were again subdivided into five parties of about one hundred each, and over every hundred was placed an elder or sub-captain. The first hundred was headed by Elder Atwood, the second by Levi Savage, the third by William Woodward, the fourth by John Chislett, and the fifth by Elder Amundsen. About two hundred of the people were Scotch and Scandinavians. Nearly all the rest were English. All were assembled at the meeting. You know, Sister Stenhouse, how meetings were held at home. Well, it was just the same there. We, of course, had nothing really to say. We had only to obey counsel and sanction the decision of the leading elders. I used to feel annoyed rather at that sort of thing in London, as you may remember, but now when life and death depended upon the wisdom of our decision, with all my faith I felt worse than annoyed, wicked as I had no doubt it was for me to feel so. My husband never uttered a word, but I know he felt much as I did, and in that he was not alone among the elders. We had neither vote nor influence. In all our company there were only three or four men who had been out to Salt Lake before, and of course they could not be overlooked, so they gave their opinion at the meeting. They must have fully known the dangers and difficulties of the way, and what hardships must overtake a company so scantily provided for as was ours, if we continued our journey. But for all that, they not only spoke slightingly of the danger which threatened us, but prophesied in the name of the Lord that we should pass through triumphantly and suffer neither loss nor harm. One man alone, Levi Savage, dared to tell the truth. People well mounted, or even with good ox teams, could safely and easily make the journey, he said. But for a band of people like ourselves, with aged folks and women, and little children, to attempt it so late was little short of madness. He strongly urged that we should take up our quarters there for the winter, when, he said, as soon as spring came on we could safely and successfully perform the remainder of our journey. The other elders thought that he was weak in the faith, and plainly told him so and one of them even said he'd eat all the snow that fell between Florence and Salt Lake City. The people, of course, believed without question what they were told to believe, for they had long ago made up their minds that the leaders were inspired, and therefore they dared not doubt them, and the prudent counsel of Brother Savage was rejected accordingly. I was not near enough to hear his words, but I was afterward told what he said. What I have said I know is the truth, but as you are counseled to go forward, 
I will go with you. I will work and rest and suffer with you, and if God wills it so, I will also die with you. Never was a man more faithful to his word than was Brother Savage, and often after that, when sickness and weariness and cold and hunger and death overtook us, as he had foreseen, he never for one moment forgot the promise which he had so solemnly made. Then the middle of August being past, we left Florence behind us, and began our weary journey across the plains, in much the same fashion as we had already travelled through Iowa. We had, however, taken in fresh provisions to last us until we reached Utah, and as the oxen could not draw so much extra weight, one sack weighing about a hundred pounds was placed on each of the hand carts in addition to the other baggage. This was a severe task upon the endurance of the people, but most of them bore it without a murmur. On the other hand, we fared a little better in the matter of provisions, for we were allowed a pound of flour a day each, and also, occasionally, a little fresh beef, and besides that, each hundred had three or four milk cows. As we continued our journey and the provisions were consumed, the burdens on the carts, of course, grew lighter. But this was only the beginning of our pilgrimage, the end we could not foresee. Every evening when we pitched our tents we endeavored by songs and jests and interesting stories to beguile the tediousness of the way. The days were not quite so warm now, and the nights were more chilly but altogether it was much more pleasant traveling than it was in the earlier part of the journey. And no one seemed to remember the almost prophetic remonstrance of Brother Savage. Still, we traveled very slowly, for the carts were always breaking down. The wheels came off, and we had nothing to grease them with. The boxes of the wheels were made of unseasoned wood, and the heavy pressure upon them, and the dust that got into them, soon wore them out. Some of the people cut off the tops of their boots and wrapped them round the axles, and others cut up their tin plates and kettles for the same purpose. And for grease they used soap and even their pitiful allowance of bacon. But as the days passed and the flour began to be used up, these accidents became less frequent. Upon an average, they said, we traveled about fifteen miles a day, which I think was very good. Some of the days we even made a little over twenty miles, but they were balanced out by the shortcomings. We tried to feel happy and hopeful, and even the aged and infirm tried to make light of their toil and privations, for we did not yet see that heavy cloud which was looming across our way. I frequently talked with the old and weakly among the people, to whom both my husband and myself were able to offer little kindnesses and they all spoke cheerfully of our prospects. Such faith had they in the promises of the elders. Just before we reached Wood River, vast herds of buffaloes appeared in our vicinity, and one evening all our cattle stampeded, and the men had to go in search of them. About thirty were lost, and after hunting after them for three days, we gave them up. We had only one yoke of oxen now for each wagon, and as the wagons were loaded each with three thousand pounds of flour, the teams could not move them. So they yoked up the beef cattle and cows and heifers, but they were unmanageable, and at last we were obliged again to place a sack of flour upon each hand cart. This sorely tried us all. Some of the people even complained but the greater part of us bore up bravely, believing that it was the will of the Lord. We still had faith that all would yet be well. This was, however, a hard blow. Our milk cows were useless to us, our beef rations were stopped, and the burdens which we drew were doubled. Everyone did his best, or her best, but many of us began to be disheartened, and could hardly get along. One evening there was quite a commotion in the camp. We had pitched our tents for the night on the banks of the Platte River, I think, 
when suddenly quite a grand turnout of carriages and light wagons came up from the east and joined us each carriage was drawn by four horses and the outfits were in first-class style nothing could be too good for apostles and other distinguished servants of the lord i was anxious to know who they were but was not long in finding out there was the apostle franklin richards and elders webb and felt and joseph a young the son of the prophet and elders dunbar and kimball and grant all returning missionaries they stayed with us all night and in the morning called a great meeting and the apostle richards delivered a speech which troubled me not a little and made me very sorrowful he had heard of what brother savage had said and then and there before us all he rebuked him he then exhorted us to remember the hope set before us and told us to pray and work on and especially to be obedient to counsel and he finished by solemnly prophesying in the name of the god of israel that the almighty would make a way for us to zion and that the snow might fall and the storm rage on the right hand and on the left not a hair of our heads should perish some of the people wept with joy as they heard these words my own heart was full to me this was the voice of inspiration the voice of god how could i doubt again sister stenhouse before a month was over i saw with my own eyes that prophecy those promises falsified to the very letter and yet at the time they came to me and to all else as the word of the lord from heaven tell me if men can thus deceive themselves for i do not doubt for a moment that the apostle believed his own prophecy and if we could be so sadly deluded as to believe that what was said was divine what surety have we for our religion at all i strive against these sinful doubts but they will sometimes creep into my heart unbidden the apostle and the elders with him told captain willie that they wanted some fresh meat and the elders killed and gave them of our very best what could be denied to the servants of the lord we were then more than four hundred in number aged men and feeble women with babes and poor little children too young to walk many of them infirm and sick all of them footsore and weary we were far away from home traveling slowly hundreds and hundreds of miles worn out and without sufficient provisions for the way or the remotest chance of obtaining any and yet o oh god i shame to tell it these servants of heaven our leaders our guides our example these chosen vessels who came to us riding comfortably and at ease in their well-appointed carriages took of our poverty took the very best we had as they left the camp i looked up into my husband's face and our eyes met we said not a word but in our hearts there was the same thought sister stenhouse there must have been that self-same thought in the mind of many another poor soul who watched those elders depart after they had lectured us on faith and patience and obedience they crossed the river pleasantly enough and pointed out the best fording place and then they watched us wade through the water there being nearly a mile in width and in some places two and even three feet in depth and though many of the heavy laden carts were drawn by women and girls they never so much as offered to lend us the aid of their handsome teams one sister told me that they watched the poor people crossing through glasses as if it were an entertainment but i did not see that and can hardly believe it was true all that they did however was to promise that when we reached laramie we should find provisions and bedding and other necessaries ready for us and that they would send help from salt lake valley to meet us end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of tell it all 
by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Burton's story continued. Terrible ending of the handcart scheme. It was early in September when we reached Laramie, but we found nothing awaiting us there. We were all very much discouraged at this, and Captain Willie called another meeting for consultation. We knew, of course, beforehand that our position was very bad, but figures when stated plainly become startling facts. We now learned that if we continued at the same rate as that which we had previously been traveling, and received each the same allowance daily, we should be left utterly destitute of provisions when we were yet three hundred and fifty miles from the end of our journey. Nothing remained but to reduce our allowance. So instead of one pound, we were rationed at three quarters of a pound a day, and at the same time were forced to make incredible exertions to travel faster. Not long after this, Captain Willie received a message from Apostle Richards. It is the custom, you know, for people who want to send messages to emigrants who come after them to write a note on a scrap of paper and tie it to a stone or a piece of wood and leave it on the way. No one disturbs it, as no one but the emigrants travel along that road, and they are sure to find it. It was from a rough post office like this that Captain Willie got his letter. In it the apostle told him that we should receive supplies from Salt Lake when we reached the South Pass, but that we knew would be too late. So our allowance was again reduced, and after that we were rationed at an average of ten ounces for every person over ten years of age. The men who drew the carts received twelve ounces, the women and aged men nine ounces, and the children from four to eight ounces according to age. Before this the men with families had done better than the single men, as they had been able to save a little from the children's rations. And of course they did not like this new arrangement so well. Picture to yourself these men in the cool air of September, drawing after them each one a loaded cart, with one or more children most frequently superadded to its weight, trudging wearily every day, ten, fifteen, or twenty miles over the rough desert, wading across streams with the women and children, setting up tents at night, and working as they never worked before in all their lives, and with all keeping soul and body together upon twelve ounces of flour a day. This is but one side of the picture, the physical toil and endurance of the working men. Think what the feeble and aged, the sick, the women and children must have endured. By this time many of those who had hitherto held out bravely began to fail, and the people in general were greatly discouraged. Captain Willie and the elders who assisted him did their best to keep up the spirits of the people and to get them over as much ground as they could each day. The captains over the hundreds had also no little work to perform in distributing provisions, helping the sick and infirm, and in fact superintending everything. For some time the nights had been getting colder and colder, and by the time we arrived at the Sweetwater River we suffered considerably from that cause. We felt that winter was fast approaching. In fact it came on earlier and more severely last year than at any time before, since the saints settled in Utah. Does it not seem strange that at the very time when they were offering up special prayers for us in Zion, that we might be defended from cold and storm? The terrors of a more than ordinary winter overtook us, and proved fatal to so many of our company. The mountains were covered with snow, and it was soon quite evident, even to those who had prophesied most loudly that the Lord would work a special miracle in our behalf, that the storm clouds of winter would soon burst upon us. You have never seen the Sweetwater River, so I may as well tell you that it is a very irregular stream and we had to cross it again and again upon our way. As usual, we had to wade through the water each time, and though the men helped over the women and children as well as they could, 
many of us got very wet indeed and quite chilled and we were all cold and miserable still our faith never gave way some i know began to doubt a little but they had not yet lost all faith and discouraged and wretched as indeed we were the greater number bore up with heroic resolution i noticed however on the faces of some poor souls men and women a peculiar expression which it is quite impossible for me to describe later on i was led to believe that at that time they were perhaps unconsciously felt the presentiment of that fearful death which so soon overtook them we suffered much at night you may remember that i told you we were only allowed seventeen pounds of clothing and bedding and that of course was of little use sleeping in a tent under any circumstances is not generally pleasant to those who are accustomed to the shelter of a house but sleeping in a tent exposed to the keen night air of the wilderness and with scarcely a rag of covering was almost sufficient to prove fatal to the stoutest and strongest during the summer time although our fare was scanty and our labor incessant we rose each morning refreshed and strengthened and ready for the toils of the day but now we crept out of our tents cramped and miserable half frozen and with our eyes red and tearful with the cold we seemed to have no life left in us these things soon began to tell upon the health of every one of us especially upon the aged and those who were sickly hope at last died out in their poor weary hearts one by one they fell off utterly worn out poor things how they had longed to see the promised zion and now all expectation of peaceful rest on earth was over the bitter end had come we dug graves for them by the wayside in the desert and there we laid them with many tears scarcely daring to look one another in the face for we felt that our own time might perhaps be nearer than we thought one by one at first they fell off but before long the deaths became so frequent that it was seldom that we left a campground without burying one or more this was however only the beginning of evil soon it was no longer the aged and the sickly who were taken off but the young and strong who under other circumstances would have set disease and death at defiance cold hunger and excessive toil brought on by dysentery and when once attacked by that there was little hope for the sufferer for we had no medicine and it was quite out of our power to give them relief in any other way i now began to fear for my husband for i had noticed for some time an expression of extreme weariness on his face our trials had not hardened our hearts on the contrary i think as death seemed to be drawing near our affection for each other grew more pure and devoted and in my heart i often prayed that if it were his will god would let us die together and rest in the same grave we never spoke a word to each other on this subject but we felt the more i exerted all my strength and day after day toiled along his side helping him all i could but although he never complained i saw in his eyes a dull and heavy look which more than any words told of failing strength and the approach of disease and my heart sank within me but my own troubles did not alone engross my attention there was too much wretchedness around us to allow any one to be absorbed entirely in his own griefs acts of devotion on the part of both parents and children came before me daily such as would have put to shame the stories of filial and parental piety which we used to be taught at school i saw one poor man whose health had evidently never been very strong draw the cart with his two little ones in it as well as the baggage mile after mile until he could hardly drag his weary limbs a step further his wife carried a little five-months-old baby in her bosom this did they day after day until disease attacked the husband and it was evident that he could bear up no longer the next morning i saw him pale as a corpse bowed down and shivering in every limb but still stumbling on as best he could before the day was half over the poor wife lagged behind with her babe 
and the husband did not seem to notice her. This was not the result of heartlessness on his part. I believe that even then he had lost all consciousness. He did not know it, but he was dying. Still he stumbled on until the short wintry day came to a close, and we pitched our camp, and then I missed him. There was no time to inquire, and a chill came over my heart as I thought of what might be his fate. Presently my husband came to the tent and told me all, and when the company halted for the night, he had turned aside, and sitting down he bowed his head between his knees, and never spoke again. Later still the poor wife reached the camp, and I saw her then. There was no tear in her eyes, and she uttered neither cry nor moan, but there was upon her features a terrible expression of fixed despair, which I dared not even look upon. A few days after this, one morning as we were almost ready to start, I saw that poor mother in her tent, just as they had found her. She was cold and still, frozen to death. Most of those who died, as far as I could tell, seemed to pass away quietly, and with little pain, as if every feeling of the heart were numbed and dead. But my own sufferings and fears at that time were so great that I could not be a very close observer. Strange as it may seem, the fear of death did not so much appear to terrify these poor victims as the thought that their bodies would be buried by the wayside, in the desert, instead of in the sacred ground of Zion. Poor souls, the absorbing passion of their life was strong in death. As death thinned our ranks, the labors of those who survived were increased, until at last there were hardly enough left with strength sufficient to pitch our tents at night. A great deal devolved upon the captain of our hundred, Elder Chislett. He is a very good man, and a devoted saint, and I am glad to say that both he and a lady to whom he was betrothed, and who was also with our company, escaped with their lives. I have often seen him, when we stopped for the night, carrying the sick and feeble on his back from the wagon to the fire, and then working harder than a slave should work in putting things straight for the night. He showed a great many kindnesses to my husband and myself. But individual efforts availed nothing against fatigue and hunger and the fearful cold. To the minds of all of us the end was fast approaching. Nothing but our faith sustained us, and foolish as many people would think that faith, I am quite sure that but for it, no living soul of all our company would have ever reached Salt Lake. At last the storm came and the snow fell. I think it must have been at least five or six inches deep within half an hour. The wind was very keen and cutting, and it drifted the snow right into our faces. And thus blinded by the storm and scarcely able to stand, we stumbled on that day for fully sixteen miles. What we suffered it would be useless to attempt to describe. The scenes we witnessed were too terrible to describe. There was a young girl with whom I was very well acquainted, and who I saw struggling in the snow clinging to one of the handcarts and vainly trying to help in pushing it on, but really doing just the contrary. She is now in Salt Lake City, and you can see her wandering about any day upon the stumps of her knees, her limbs downwards having been frozen during that storm, and subsequently amputated. A poor old woman, too, who I think you must have known in London, lingered behind later in the day. When night came on it was impossible for anyone to go back to search for her, but in the morning, not very far from the camp, some torn rags, the remains of her dress, were found, a few bones, a quantity of hair, and at a little distance a female skull, well gnawed, and with the marks of the wolf fangs still wet upon it. The snow all round was crimsoned with blood. We halted for a little while in the middle of that day, and to our surprise and joy, Joseph A. Young and Elder Stephen Taylor drove into the camp. We found that when the returning missionaries of whom I have already told you 
left us by the Platte River, they made their way as speedily as they could to Salt Lake City. Joseph A., who felt deeply for our sufferings, although he had been away from home for two whole years, hastened to his father and reported to him the condition in which we were. Brigham Young was of course anxious to undo the mischief which had resulted from the people following his inspired counsel, and at his son's earnest entreaty allowed him to return with provisions and clothing to meet us. Joseph A. lost no time but pressed on to the rescue, and having told us that assistance was on the way, hastened eastward to meet the company that was following us. I cannot tell you what a relief this intelligence was to the minds of all, and how much the poor people felt encouraged by it. But as for me at that time, my heart was sad enough. For some time my husband's strength had evidently been failing, and for the last two days I had felt very serious apprehensions on his behalf. He had been overtasked, and like the rest of us he was starving, with cold and hunger, and I saw that he could not hold out much longer. My worst fears were speedily realized. We had not journeyed half a mile from the place where we rested at noon, when blinded by the snow and completely broken down, he dropped the rail of the cart, and I saw that he could go no further. How I felt you as a wife and mother can only guess. In a moment my own weakness was forgotten. My love for my husband made me strong again. To leave him there, or to delay, would have been death to one, if not all of us. So I called to those who shared the cart with us, and they helped me as well as they could to lift my husband up and put him under part of the bedding. It was the only chance of saving his life, for, as I before mentioned, some previous to this who had been overcome and had lingered by the way had been frozen to death or devoured by the wolves. I then took hold of the crossbar or handle of the cart, and, numbed with cold and trembling in every limb, it was as much as I could do to raise it from the ground. To move the cart was impossible, so I appealed to the old folks again, and they exerted all their strength to push it from behind, and our combined efforts at length succeeded, but the chief weight fell upon me. How gladly I bore it, how gladly I would have borne anything for the mere chance of saving my dear husband's life, your own heart can tell. The snow drifted wildly around us and beat in our faces so blindingly that we could hardly proceed. The greater part of the train had passed on while we delayed on account of my husband, and now everyone was making the most desperate efforts to keep up with the rest. To be left behind was death. Had I been asked whether under any circumstances I could have dragged that heavy cart along in all that storm, I should certainly have replied that it would be utterly impossible. But until we tried, we do not know what we can bear. It was not until the night came on and we pitched our tents that I realized what I had passed through. They helped me to carry my husband to the tent, and there we laid him, and I tried to make him as easy as was possible under the circumstances, but comfort or rest was altogether out of the question. All that night I sat beside him, sometimes watching, sometimes falling into a fitful sleep. I do not believe that he would live through the night. In the morning he was by no means improved, and then I felt too truly the abject misery of our position. It is a painful thing to watch at the bedside of those who we love when hope for their recovery is gone. But think what it must be to sit upon the cold earth in a tent, upon the open desert with the piercing wind of winter penetrating to the very bones and there before you the dear one your life your all on earth dying and you without a drop of medicine or even a morsel of the coarsest nourishment to give him oh the bitterness of my soul at that moment i tried to pray but my heart was full of cursing it seemed to me as if even god himself had forgotten us the fearful misery of that dark hour has left on my soul itself a record as ineffaceable as the imprint of a burning iron upon the flesh. The morning broke at last, dark and dreary, 
and a thick heavy mantle of snow covered all the camp but we contrived to communicate with each other and soon it was whispered that five poor creatures had been found dead in the tents want and weariness and the bitter cold had done their work and we did not weep for them they were at rest but for ourselves we wept that we were left behind and we looked at one another wistfully wondering which of us would be taken next we buried those five poor frozen corpses in one grave wrapped in the clothing in which they died and then we comforted each other as best we might and left the dead who were now beyond our reach that we might do what we could for those who were fast following them to the grave a meeting of the elders was held and it was resolved that we should remain where we were until the promised supplies reached us we could not in fact do otherwise for the snow was so deep that it was impossible for us to proceed and the sick and dying demanded immediate attention that morning for the first time no flour was distributed there was none all that remained besides our miserable cattle was a small quantity of hard biscuit which captain willie bought at laramie and a few pounds of rice and dried apples nearly all the biscuit was at once divided among the whole company and the few pounds which remained together with the rice and apples were given to elder chislett for the use of the sick and the very little children they also killed two of the cattle and divided the beef most of the people got through their miserable allowance that very morning and then they had to fast captain willie set out that morning with another elder to meet the coming supplies and hasten them on and as we saw them disappear in the distant west we almost felt as if our last hope departed with them so many chances there were that we should never see them again on the whole of that long long day i sat beside my husband in the tent and i might almost say i did no more there was nothing i could do the little bedding that was allowed for both of us i made up into a couch for him but what a wretched makeshift it was and i got from elder chislett a few of the dried apples which had been reserved for the sick but it was not until nightfall that my husband was capable of swallowing anything and then what nourishment to give a sick man the day was freezingly cold and i had hardly anything on me and had eaten nothing since the day before for my mind was so agitated that I do not think the most delicate food would have tempted me. God alone knows the bitterness of my heart as I sat there during all that weary day. I never expected to see my husband open his eyes again, and I thought that when evening came I would lie down beside him, and we would take our last long sleep on earth together. When night came on, and all was dark, I still sat there, I dreaded to move lest I should learn the terrible truth, my husband dead. I looked towards the place where I knew he was lying, but I could see nothing. I listened, and I fancied that I heard a gentle breathing, but it was only a fancy. Then, louder than the incessant moaning of the wind, I could hear in the distance a fearful cry, a cry which had often chilled our hearts at midnight on the plains it was wolves the darkness grew darker still so thick that one could almost feel it the horror of death seemed stealing over all my senses oh that there might be one long eternal night to blot out forever our miseries and our existence i threw my hands wildly above me and cried bitterly o oh god my god let me die God was nearer to me than I thought. As my hand dropped lifelessly to the ground, it touched some moving thing. It was my husband's hand, the same hand which I had watched in the twilight stiffening, as I thought, in death. The long, thin fingers grasped my own, and though they were very, very cold, I felt that life was in them, and as I stooped down to kiss them, I heard my husband's voice, very weak and feeble, saying in a whisper, Mary. 
I threw myself upon his bosom. In a moment the fear of death, the longing for death, the wild and terrible thoughts all had gone. The sound of that voice was life to me, and forgetful of his weakness, forgetful of everything but him, I threw myself upon his bosom and wept tears of joy. Very carefully and gently I raised him up, and in the darkness every whispered word conveyed more meaning to my mind than all his eloquence in bygone times. After some time I persuaded him to take a little nourishment, miserable stuff that it was, and presently he fell asleep again. I laid his dear head upon the best pillow that I could make of some of my own clothes, and then I slept a little myself. Not much, but it was more refreshing than any sleep that had visited my eyes for a long time past. Hope had come again. The next morning my husband was evidently better, and I knelt down beside him and thanked God for the miracle that he had wrought. For was it not a miracle thus to raise my dead to life again? How many stronger, stouter men than he had I seen fall sick and die? But to me God had shown mercy in my utmost need. We waited three long days for the return of Captain Willie. My heart was so full of thankfulness that my husband had been spared that I certainly did not feel so acutely the misery with which I was surrounded as I otherwise should have done. I was like the prisoner who feels happy in a reprieve from death, but whose situation is nevertheless such as would appear to any other person the most wretched in which he could be placed. The misery that was suffered in that camp was beyond the power of words to describe. On the second day they gave us some more beef rations, but they did us little good. The beef was, of course, of the poorest, and eaten alone it did not seem to satisfy hunger, and those who were prostrated by dysentery, although they ate it ravenously, suffered much in consequence afterwards. The number of the sick rapidly increased, and not a few died from exhaustion. And really those seemed happiest who were thus taken from the horrors which surrounded them. Had it not been for the intense frost, we should all probably have fallen victims to the intolerable atmosphere of the camp. I would not even allow my mind to recall some of the scenes which I witnessed at that time, scenes the disgusting and filthy horrors of which no decent words could describe. When you consider the frightful condition in which we were, the hunger and cold which we endured, you may perhaps be able in a small degree to conjecture as far as a person can conjecture, who has not himself suffered such things, what we then passed through. I saw poor, miserable creatures, utterly worn out, dying in the arms of other forlorn and hopeless creatures, as wretched as themselves. I saw strong and honest, honorable men, or who had once been such, begging of the captain for the miserable scraps which had been saved for the sick and helpless children. I saw poor heart-broken mothers, freezing to death, but clasping as they died, in an agony of loving woe, the torn and wretched remnants of clothing which they still retained, around the emaciated forms of their innocent babes, the mother instinct strong in death. And sometimes at night, when all unbidden, I see again in dreams the awful sufferings of those poor God-forsaken wretches. I start in horror, and pray the Almighty rather to blot out from my mind the memory of all the past, than let me ever recollect, if but in fancy, that fearful time. The third day came, and still no relief. There are mysterious powers of endurance in human nature, weak as we often deem it. But there is a point beyond which the bow, however flexible, will not bend. It was evident that if no help arrived speedily, the end was not far off. The sun was sinking behind the distant western hills in all the glory of the clear, frosty atmosphere of the desert, and many who gazed upon its beauty did so with a mournful interest, believing that they would never again behold the light of day. But at that moment 
some who were anxiously watching with the last hope, watching for what they hardly dared expect to see, raised a shout of joy. We knew what it was. Men, women, and children rushed from their tents to welcome the approaching wagons and our friends in time of need. Captain Willie and the other elder had found the rescue from Salt Lake overtaken by the storm, just as we were, but he had told them of our terrible situation, and they had hastened on without a moment's delay. It was he and they, convoying good supplies, who now approached us. The poor creatures shouted wildly for joy, even the strong men shed tears, and the sisters, overcome with the sudden change from death to life, flung themselves into the arms of the brethren as they came into camp, and covered them with kisses. Such happiness you never saw, everyone shaking hands and speaking joyfully, everyone saying, God bless you, with a meaning such as is seldom attached to those words. The supplies were more to us than food and clothing, they were life itself. Elder John Chislett was appointed to distribute the provisions and clothing, and everything was placed in his hands. He gave out to us all what was immediately necessary, but strongly cautioned us to be very moderate in what we ate, as it was dangerous to go from the extreme fasting to a full meal. After supper the clothing and bedding was fairly divided, and we felt more thankful for those little comforts than a person who had never endured as we had, would have felt had he become suddenly the recipient of boundless luxury. Two of the elders who had held forth such delusive hopes to the company, not long before, as I have already told you, were with the brethren who came to our relief. I have never ventured to ask how it was that they could hold out to us in God's name such promises, when they must have known, after a moment's reflection, that they were utterly baseless. But I think that probably they left their comfortable homes in Salt Lake City, and came across the stormy desert with supplies to meet us, only to show practically how anxious they were to atone for having led us astray. Next morning Elder Grant went on east to meet the company following us, but Elder W. H. Kimball took command of our company for the rest of the way. We could now journey but very slowly, for the road was bad. The sick and weakly were, however, able to ride, and altogether we suffered less. To some this change for the better arrived too late. The mental and physical sufferings which they had endured were too much for them. Poor souls, they alone, and their Father in heaven, knew what they had passed through. They seemed to have lost all consciousness, as if their faculties had been numbed and stultified. We talked to them of the past, but they looked at us with unmeaning eyes, as if we spoke of something in which they had no interest. We tried to lead their thoughts to Zion and the promises of the Lord, but it was all in vain. They turned from us with a look of terrible apathy, and one or two, who partly seemed to understand, only replied with an indifference painful to witness. Too late, too late. As we journeyed, the weather every day grew colder. Many of the unfortunate people lost their fingers and toes, others their ears. One poor woman lost her sight, and I was told of a poor sick man who held on to the wagon bars to save himself from jolting, and had all his fingers frozen off. Few, if any, of the people recovered from the effects of that frost. One morning they found a poor old man who had vainly tried the evening before to keep up with the rest. His corpse was not far from the camp, but it had been sadly mangled by the wolves. Then there came another snowstorm, only worse in proportion, as the weather was colder, and it was with the utmost difficulty that we could be kept from freezing. We wrapped blankets and anything else we could get around us, but the cold wind penetrated to our very bones. I was told that some of the people, even women and children who lagged behind, were whipped so as to make them keep up and to keep life in them. I did not see this myself, but I believe, if the story was true, 
it was an act of mercy and not of cruelty for to delay a moment was fatal the captain of our hundred more than once stayed behind the company to bury some unfortunate person who had died on the road how he ever got up with us again i cannot tell but he seemed to be as indefatigable in his labors as he was wonderfully preserved sometimes the carts came to a dead standstill and several had to be fastened together and drawn by a united effort and in more than one instance the poor people gave up altogether they were carried on while they lived as well as we could but their carts were abandoned the stragglers came in slowly to camp the night of the storm the people from the valley even went back to fetch some in and it was nearly six o'clock in the morning before the last arrived the next day we remained in camp for there were so many sick and dying that we could not proceed early in the morning elder chislett and three other elders went round to see who was dead that they might be buried they found in the tents fifteen corpses all stiff and frozen two more died during the day a large square hole was dug and they were buried in it three abreast and then they were covered with leaves and dirt every precaution being taken to keep them from the wolves few of the relatives of those who were dead came to the burial they did not seem to care death had become familiar to them and personal misery precluded sorrow for the dead as we drew nearer to salt lake valley we met more of the brethren coming to our assistance they supplied us with all we needed and then hastened on to meet those who followed us the atmosphere seemed to become sensibly warmer and our sufferings were proportionately less as we approached zion what the feelings of others might have been when they first saw the goal of our hopes zion of our prayers and songs i cannot tell weary oh so weary i felt but thankful more than thankful that my husband's life had been spared he was pale and sick but he was with me still i have written too much already sister stenhouse i cannot tell you more now but i may as well add that when we left iowa city we were about five hundred in all some left us on the way when we left florence and began the journey across the plains we were over four hundred and twenty of which number we buried sixty-seven a sixth of the whole the company which followed us and to which i have frequently alluded fared worse than we they numbered six hundred when they started but they buried one hundred and fifty on the journey one in every four may god grant that i may never again see such a sight as was presented by the miserable remnant of that last company as they came on slowly through the canyon toward salt lake valley End of chapter 16chapter 17 of tell it all by fanny stenhouse this librivox recording is in the public domain we forsake all and set out for zion our journey across the plains it was with strange feelings of doubt and unrest that i read that painful story but i folded up mary burton's letter and stored it away carefully in my desk and then i began to think certainly i was still a mormon at least i was nothing else but i was not now so firmly grounded in my faith as once i was and those terrible stories completely unsettled my mind then too i was well aware that before long my husband and myself would be called upon to cross the plains to zion and i felt that if our experience were anything like that of mary burton i and my children would never reach salt lake the prospect was not very cheering one morning we were surprised to receive a visit from the apostle george q cannon who informed us that he had received letters from utah 
and had come to take the place of Mr. Stenhouse as president of the mission in the eastern states, and that we might now prepare to travel with the next company of emigrants. To me this was most unpleasant intelligence. The knowledge that before long I should be brought personally within its degrading influence had now for years been the curse of my life, and I had welcomed every reprieve from immediate contact with it in Utah. But the time had come at last when I was to realize my worst apprehensions, and I think at that time, had I been permitted to choose, I would have preferred to die rather than journey to Zion. Besides this, ever since my husband had been engaged with the secular papers, we had been getting along very comfortably. We had now a pleasant home, and many comforts, and little luxuries which we had not enjoyed since we left Switzerland. And I was beginning to hope that we should be allowed to remain in New York for a few years at least. We had also by this time six children, the youngest only a few days old, and I leave it to any mother to determine whether I had not good cause for vexation. When I was told that we were expected to leave New York within two weeks with the emigrants who were then en route from England, my husband also was to take charge of the company, and therefore everything would depend upon me, all the preparations for our long and perilous journey, the disposal of our furniture, and, in fact, the thousand and one little necessary duties which must attend the packing up and departure of a family. In the course of a few days the emigrants arrived, and then my husband was compelled to devote all his time to them. When I told the elders that it was almost impossible for me, in the delicate state of health in which I was, and with a babe only two weeks old, to undertake such a journey, and they told me that I had no faith in the power of God, and that if I would arise and begin my preparations, the Lord would give me strength according to my day. Thinking that probably my husband believed as they did, I made the effort, but it cost me much. In the Mormon church, the feelings or sufferings of women are never considered. If an order is given to any man to take a journey or perform any given task, his wife or wives are never thought of. They are his property just as much as his horses, mules, or oxen, and if one wife should die, it is of little consequence if he has others. And if he has not, he can easily get them and if he is not young or fascinating enough to win his way with the young ladies, he has only to keep on good terms with Brigham Young, or even with his bishop, and every difficulty will be smoothed away, and they will be counseled to marry him. It is never expected, nor would it be tolerated in any Mormon woman, that she should exercise her own judgment in opposition to her husband, no matter how much she might feel that he was in the wrong. I have frequently seen intelligent women subjected to the grossest tyranny on the part of ignorant and fanatical husbands who were influenced by the absurd teachings of the tabernacle. One of the greatest Mormon writers has said, The wife should never follow her own judgment in preference to that of her husband, for if her husband desires to do right but errs in judgment, the Lord will bless her in endeavoring to carry out his counsels. For God has placed him at the head, and though he may err in judgment, yet God will not justify the wife in disregarding his instructions and counsels. Far greater is the sin of rebellion than the errors which arise from the want of judgment. Therefore she would be condemned for suffering her will to arise against his. Be obedient, and God will cause all things to work for good. The trouble and annoyance occasioned by leaving a comfortable position in New York to travel to such an unknown region as Utah was then, was not a trifle. But we hastened our preparations, sacrificing all that we possessed in the most reckless manner, and in due time set out. When we reached Florence, the starting point on the frontiers, we were detained on account of some mismanagement on the part of the church agents, and remained for three weeks in camp. Ours was what was called an independent company, 
by which I mean that we were able to defray our own expenses without borrowing from the church. The poorer immigrants were assisted from a fund provided for that purpose, the Perpetual Emigration Fund. More than twenty years ago, contributions were levied on the more wealthy saints for the purpose of providing the passage, outfit, and so forth, of those who could not otherwise have gathered to Zion. It was not, however, intended that a free passage should be provided. Thus who had a little money were assisted, and then, after all, they had to make good to the last farthing, with interest, what they had borrowed from the fund. I have known many people who contributed very largely, and it was represented constantly as the duty of all to do so. Men who contemplate entering into the patriarchal order of matrimony, if they are Americans, generally try to discover whether the emigration of their lady love has been settled for, and if their investigations end unfavorably, the result very frequently is that their devotion is turned into another channel, and some other maiden, whose expenses have been fully paid off, bears off the palm. Englishmen have not always been quite so prudent, and some have married according to their own sweet fancy, without asking a question, and to their dismay, not long after the wedding, an account has been sent in for the emigration of Miss Blank. Others, again, have not been allowed to marry the lady of their choice until she was first paid for. And if the old man was very much in love, this was a quick way of getting the account settled. The Mormon church never gives, it only lends to the poor. Many a man and woman has given enough to have emigrated himself or herself over and over again. This was because they were old people, and it was the young girls and young people generally who received the benefits of the fund. Many years ago, a poor old widow woman in England said to me, I have nearly starved myself to contribute all that I could to the emigration fund in hopes that I should have the privilege of going to Zion and mingling with the chosen people of God. But every season the young girls are all picked out of our branch, and I am told to wait. I cannot think that this is right, but I don't wish to judge the actions of God's servants. I suppose I must wait. She did wait, and died waiting. Our company was in an infinitely better position than that of those emigrants of whose sad fate my friend Mary Burton had told me for our journey was made at the proper season, and as far as was possible under the circumstances, convenience and comfort had been attended to. The incidents which befell us were few, and although, of course, every one of us felt weary and worn out, we were not called upon to pass through the miseries and sufferings endured by the handcart emigrants. Looking back to our primitive mode of traveling, it appears to me almost as if I must be making some mistake about my own age, and that it must have been several centuries instead of a few years ago since we crossed the plains. The ox team and wagon, the walk on foot in the day and the camp life at night, have been pleasantly exchanged for the swift travel of a few days in a Pullman palace car. What living contradictions we were as we crossed the plains, singing in a circle, night and morning, the songs of Zion, and listening to prayers and thanksgivings for having been permitted to gather out of Babylon. And then during the day, as we trudged along in twos and threes, expressing to each other all our misgivings and doubts and fears, and the bitterness of our thoughts against polygamy, while each wife confiding in her husband's honor and faithfulness, solaced herself with the hope that all might yet be well. How little sometimes do the songs of gladness reflect the real sentiments of the heart! How often have I heard many a poor heartbroken woman singing the chorus, I never knew what joy was till I became a Mormon! I never could sing that song, for my experience had been exactly the reverse. 
it was the month of september the beginning of our beautiful indian summer when we emerged from the canyon and caught sight of salt lake city everything looked green and lovely and in spite of all my sad forebodings while crossing the plains i involuntarily exclaimed ah what a glorious spot it looked like a beautiful garden another eden in the midst of a desert valley we had a glimpse of the great salt lake far away in the distance stretching out like a placid sheet of molten silver while everywhere around were the lonely looking snow-capped mountains encircling us like mighty prison walls it would be impossible for me to describe my feelings at that time even while i was enchanted with the glorious prospect before me there arose again in my mind that haunting spectre of my existence polygamy i believed that this little earthly paradise would probably be to me and my daughters after me a prison house and with a mother's instinct i shuddered as i thought of what they might be destined to suffer there lovely as the scene was there was a fatal shadow overhanging it all then too there was no escape if the sad forebodings of my heart were realized it would be utterly impossible for us ever to get away the idea of a railway being constructed across those desert plains and rocky mountains never for a moment entered my mind and even had i thought it possible i should have supposed that it would take a lifetime to complete no there was no help for me even if it came to the worst i felt that my doom was sealed and there were many women in our company who thought just the same as i did and who were troubled at heart with fears as sad as mine my first impressions of salt lake city when we began life there were anything but pleasant we had to rough it for nearly two weeks we were obliged to remain in our wagons as it was quite impossible to obtain house room at that time each family built their own little hut and there were no vacant houses to let the weather was now growing very cold and wintry and it was absolutely necessary that we should have some better shelter than the wagons afforded one day my husband told me when he came home that he had been offered a house which belonged to the church it was in a very dilapidated condition he said but that if i would go and look at it with him we could then decide about taking it no time was to be lost for companies of emigrants were coming in almost daily and if we neglected this chance we might not find another when we arrived at the house i was much discouraged at seeing the condition it was in the window panes were all cracked or broken out the floors and walls looked as if they had never known soap or paint and the upper rooms had no ceilings in fact it was not fit for any civilized christian to live in in point of size there was nothing to complain of but of comfort or convenience there was none the wind whistled through every door and every cracked window and altogether it presented anything but a cheering prospect for winter my husband had told me that daniel h wells who was superintendent of church property and also one of the first presidency of the church had promised him that if we took the house it should be repaired and made fit for living in before winter fully set in and under the circumstances we thought we could do no better than accept his offer thus we began housekeeping in utah and we unpacked our trunks and tried to give the place as homelike an appearance as we possibly could i had known what it was to be in a strange country and destitute and therefore benefiting by experience when i left new york regardless of the teachings of the elders and of my own husband's directions to the contrary i had secretly stowed away many little necessaries towards housekeeping indeed had i not done so we should have been as badly off when we reached zion as when we arrived in new york 
besides which I have no doubt that our wagons would have been filled with the trunks of those very brethren who counseled us not to take more than was absolutely necessary. The brethren who gave this counsel were, I noticed, constantly purchasing while they advised everyone else to sell, and I thought it wiser to follow their example than their precepts. Among my treasures was some carpet, and when that was laid down and the stove put up, we began to feel almost at home. The wind, however, soon drove away all thoughts of comfort, for it came whistling in through a thousand undetected crevices, and the tallow candles which we were obliged to burn presented a woeful spectacle. Even the most wealthy then had no other light but candles, and every family had to make their own. I have often seen people burning a little melted grease with a bit of cotton rag stuck in the middle for a wick. How pleasant the smell, and how brilliant the light thus produced, cannot be imagined. Everything was upon the same scale, and to keep house in any fashion was really a formidable undertaking, especially to those who had been accustomed to the conveniences of large towns. I believe that many women consented to their husbands taking other wives for the sake of getting some assistance in their home duties. We spent nearly all the first evening in our new house in trying to discover some means of keeping out the storm, but to little purpose. Nearly a fortnight passed before anyone came to see about repairing the house, but as it belonged to the church my husband seemed to think it must be all right. The Mormon men are always very lenient towards the church, very much more so than the Mormon women for the latter have somehow got mixed up in their minds the idea that Brigham Young and the church are synonymous terms. I remember one day a good young sister, a daughter of one of the Twelve Apostles, saying to me, I have just seen the church. And when I asked her what she meant, she said, I have just met Brigham Young and Hiram Clausen, and are they not the church? It was evident to me that others besides myself sometimes gave way to wicked thoughts. Nevertheless, I was still of the opinion that the church had plenty of money and ought to have repaired the house. One day a man whom I had never seen before called upon me and asked what repairs I should like done. I was not feeling very well and had been annoyed at the delay, and I answered rather ungraciously that I should like anything done, if it were only done at once, for I thought we had waited long enough. He answered me very politely and said that he would see to it immediately. When Mr. Stenhouse returned home in the evening, he said, So you have had a visit from President Wells. No, I said, there has been no one here but a carpenter, an ugly man with a cast in his eye, and I told him that I wanted the house fixed right away. Why, that was President Wells, he said, very much shocked, and I think I felt as bad as he did when I realized that I had treated one of the first presidency so unceremoniously. This Daniel H. Wells, besides being an apostle, a counselor of Brigham Young, and one of the three presidents, who share with Brigham the first position in the church, and are associated with him in all his official acts, was the lieutenant general of the Nauvoo Legion, and at the present time, and for some years past, mayor of Salt Lake City. It was a shocking indiscretion, to say the least, to speak slightingly of such a high and mighty personage. The repairs, however, were seen to, and the house rendered a little more habitable. We had now to begin the struggle of life afresh, and could not afford to be too particular about trifles. To obtain shelter was something. For the rest, we must still continue to hope and trust. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My First Impressions of the City of the Saints With the eager observation of a woman who has a great personal interest at stake, I took note of everything in Zion which was new to me, and especially all that related to the system of plural marriages, and all my worst fears were abundantly realized. Although I had looked at the dark side of Mormonism, and had pictured with horror the life of women in polygamy, there were nevertheless some truths which broke upon my mind with painful effect. In England we had heard so frequently from the lips of the apostles and elders that not only was polygamy contrary to the teachings of Joseph Smith, but that it was utterly unknown in Nauvoo during the prophet's lifetime. Directly when the revelation was published, we of course knew that if it really proceeded from Joseph, he could not have been so innocent of polygamy as we had been taught. But I was hardly prepared to meet several of his wives out in Utah, and yet almost the first thing that I heard was that there were living in Salt Lake City ladies well known and respected who had been sealed to the prophet. This I afterwards found was true. The Mormon colony in Salt Lake City had at first to contend with all those difficulties and submit to all those privations which beset the path of all new settlers in a strange country. Until very recently the greater number of the dwellings were small and low, like so many little huts, and not infrequently you might see a row of these huts with one window and a door to each, and inside a wife, a bedstead, two chairs and a table, with poverty to crown the whole. But even then might be seen in the laying out of the streets and in the other arrangements the germs of a great city. The roadways were broad and the sidewalks convenient, and provision was made more with an eye to the future than to present necessity for a great depth in the measurement of the houses and blocks. Down the sides of the streets flowed a sparkling stream, the water of which was brought from the mountains for the purpose of irrigating the gardens in the city. And as far as they possibly could, the settlers marked out and planned a capital worthy of that name for the Mormon people. When I arrived in Salt Lake City, a great many improvements had been effected, and expecting as I did that this would be our future home for many years, perhaps for life, I was interested in everything that I saw. But even then, in merely taking a walk about the city, I met with evidences of the degrading teachings of polygamy, and I saw that little deference was paid to the women. They were rudely jostled at the crossings, and seemed to be generally uncared for. Since the completion of the railway, and the constant influx of Gentiles, this, of course, has not been noticeable. The city is built on a slope, formed by a bend in the mountain range. Brigham Young's house is on the northern side and has a commanding prospect. The tabernacle and tithing office are in the same street. The tabernacle is a plain-looking building entirely devoid of any architectural beauty. It stands in the block where the temple, which has been building for the last quarter of a century, and is now only a few feet above ground, is waiting to be finished. Nearly twenty-six years ago Brigham wrote to Orson Spencer, the president of the Mormon Church in England, urging him to gather up as much tithing as he possibly could for glass, nails, paint, and so forth, to assist in building up the temple of the Lord in the valley of the Great Salt Lake. A large sum of money was collected, and millions have been raised by tithing and by other means. But there has been no one hitherto with courage and authority sufficient to demand of the prophet an account of those funds and the interest and compound interest which should be accruing thereunto. The first Sunday I went to the tabernacle I was greatly amused at the way in which some of the sisters were dressed. Quite a number wore sunbonnets, but the majority wore curious and diverse specimens of the milliner's art, 
relics of former days some wore a little tuft of gauze and feathers on the top of the head while others had helmets of extraordinary size there were little bonnets half-grown bonnets and grandmother bonnets with steeple crowns and fronts so large that it was difficult to get a peep at the faces which they concealed as for the dresses they were as diversified as the bonnets some of them presented a rather curious spectacle i noticed two young women who sat near me they were dressed alike in green calico sunbonnets green calico skirts and pink calico sacks on inquiring who they were i was told that they were the wives of one man and had both been married to him on the same day so that neither could claim precedence of the other outside of utah such a thing would seem impossible but so many of the young girls at that time came out to zion without father or mother or any one else to guide them and left to their own inexperience and afraid to disobey counsel it is no wonder that they soon yielded to the universal custom the two young women whom i have mentioned did not appear to me to be overburdened with intelligence they looked like girls who could be made to believe anything but after that i met with two well-educated women who like these foolish girls thoughtlessly tried the experiment of two or more marrying the same man on the same day agreeing with their lord that that would be the best way to preserve peace in their household but they were terribly mistaken and even before the marriage day was over the poor bewildered husband had to fly to brother brigham for counsel the tabernacle services seemed to me as strange as the women there was no regular order in conducting the proceedings but the prominent brethren made prayers or sermons as they were properly called upon to do so the sermons would be more properly called speeches they were nothing but a rambling disconnected glorification of the saints interspersed with fearful denunciations of the gentiles and not infrequently a good sprinkling of words and expressions such as are never used in decent society more unedifying discourses could hardly be imagined as for the spirituality and devotional feeling which characterized our meetings in england they were only conspicuous by their absence and many devout saints have told me that when they first went there before the erection of the great organ the free and easy manners of the speakers and the brass band which was then stationed in front of the platform made them feel as if they had come to witness a puppet show rather than to attend a religious meeting there was one lady at the tabernacle service whom i regarded with considerable interest this was no other than eliza r snow one of the prophet's wives i was told that she was the first woman married in polygamy after joseph smith received the revelation and i believe it was so people who lived in nauvoo respectable people and not one or two either have assured me that for four years before joseph is said to have received the revelation he was practicing polygamy, or something worse, and that the revelation was given to justify what was already done. After it was given, or said to be given, Joseph and his brother Hiram cut off from the church more than one person for preaching it, and nine years more passed away during which the Mormon elders, everywhere, most emphatically and solemnly denied it before it was publicly avowed however this might be it is generally understood that eliza snow was the first plural wife of the prophet and i was told by a lady from nauvoo that joseph did not care much for her but that she was getting to be quite a querulous old maid and he married her to keep her tongue quiet if that is true she has entirely changed her tactics since she left nauvoo for her principal occupation at the present time is converting rebellious wives to obedience to their husbands and convincing young girls that it is their duty to enter into polygamy 
unhappy husbands derive great consolation from her counsels. In matters of religion, she is a perfect fanatic, and in connection with the female relief society, she reigns supreme. But otherwise there are many excellent traits in her character, and I could tell of many acts of loving-kindness and self-denial which she has performed, and which will surely have their reward. She is said to have been tolerably good-looking when young, but in appearance there is nothing now to distinguish her. As the chief poet of the Mormon Church, and as the representative of Eve in the mysteries of the endowment house, she enjoys a reputation such as would be impossible to any other woman among the saints. Another of the late Joseph's wives is a Mrs. Dr. Jacobs, who was actually married to the prophet while she was still living with her original husband, Jacobs. Under the same circumstances, she married Brigham Young after Joseph's death. For some time, her husband knew nothing of the whole affair, but Brigham very soon gave him to understand that his company was not wanted. The sister of Mrs. Jacobs, a Mrs. Buell, was another of Joseph's wives, and she married the Apostle Heber C. Kimball, but does not appear to have made a very good bargain. Besides these, there is another lady, a Mrs. Shearer, or as she is familiarly called, Auntie Shearer. She is in every respect a unique specimen of womanhood, tall and angular, with cold yet eager gray eyes, a woman of great volubility, and altogether grim-looking and strong-minded. She was an early disciple, and is said to have sacrificed everything for Mormonism. She lived in Joseph Smith's family, and of course saw and heard a great deal about polygamy, and at first it was a great stumbling-block to her. She was, however, instructed by the Immaculate Joseph, and so far managed to overcome her feelings as to be married to him for eternity. Like the others, she is called Mrs., and I suppose there is a Mr. Shearer somewhere, but upon that point she is very reticent. Her little lonely hut is filled with innumerable curiosities, and little knick-knacks which some people are forever hoarding away, in the belief that they will come into use some day. She is a woman that one could not easily forget. She wears a muslin cap, with a very wide border flapping in the wind under a comical-looking hood, and is easily recognized by her old yellow marten fur cape and enormous muff. Her dress, which is of her own spinning and weaving, is but just wide enough, and its length could never inconvenience her. Add to these personal ornaments a stout pair of brogues, and you will see before you Auntie Shearer, one of the prophet's spiritual wives. I may as well explain what is meant by spiritual wives and proxy wives. Marriage is contracted by the Gentiles or by Mormons in accordance with Gentile institutions are not considered binding by the saints. That was partly the cause of my indignation and the indignation of many another wife and mother. We were told that we had never been married at all, and that our husbands and our children were not lawfully ours. Surely that was enough to excite the indignation of any wife, whatever her faith might be. For a marriage to be valid, it must be solemnized in the endowment house in Salt Lake City, or the persons contracting it can never expect to be husband and wife in eternity. Should the husband die before he reaches Zion, and if the wife loves him sufficiently well to wish to be his in eternity, when she arrives in Salt Lake City, if she receives an offer of marriage from one of the brethren, and does not object to him as a second husband in this world, she will make an agreement with him, and she will be his wife for time but that in eternity she and all her children shall be handed over to the first husband. A woman thus married is called a proxy wife. 
it can well be understood that if the lady had lost her youth and good looks there would be very little chance of her husband seeing her again in eternity as there would not be too many willing to stand proxy for him and in that case he would have to depend upon the generosity of friends now spiritual wives are of two classes the one consists of old ladies who have plenty of money or property which of course needs looking after and generous elders marry them and accordingly look after that same property and the owner of it becomes the elder's spiritual wife she will only be his real wife in eternity when she is rejuvenated the prospect of which rejuvenation is i suppose very fascinating to some men for i have known quite youthful elders who displayed their self-sacrificing spirit by marrying spiritually very old but very wealthy ladies the other kind of spiritual wife is one who is married already but who does not think that her husband can exalt her to so high a position in the celestial world as she deserves perhaps some kind brother who takes a great interest in her welfare has told her so she then is secretly sealed to one of the brethren who is better able to exalt her perhaps to this same brother and in the resurrection she will pass from him who was her husband on earth to him who is to be her husband in heaven if she has not done so before this is what is meant by proxy and spiritual wives i think it will be evident even to the dullest comprehension that under such a system the world the flesh and the devil are far more likely to play a prominent part than anything heavenly or spiritual all this is so repugnant to the instincts and feelings of a true woman that i feel quite ashamed to write about it and yet the working out of this system has produced results which would be perfectly grotesque were it not that they outrage every ordinary sense of propriety let me give an example one of the wives of brigham young a mrs augusta cobb young a highly educated and intelligent boston lady with whom i am intimately acquainted requested of her prophet husband a favor of a most extraordinary description she had forsaken her lawful husband and family and a happy and luxurious home to join the saints under the impression that brigham young would make her his queen in heaven she was a handsome woman a woman of many gifts and graces and brigham thoroughly appreciated her but she made a slight miscalculation in respect to the prophet he cares little enough for his first wife poor lady and few people who know him doubt for a moment that he would unqueen her and cut her adrift for time and eternity too if his avaricious soul saw the slightest prospect of gain by doing so he did not care for her but he would never allow himself to be dictated to by any woman so when the lady of whom i speak asked him to place her at the head of his household he refused she begged hard but he would not relent then finding that she could not be brigham's queen and having been taught by the highest mormon authorities that our saviour had and has many wives she requested to be sealed to him brigham young told her for what reason i do not know that it really was out of his power to do that but that he would do the next best thing for her he would seal her to joseph smith so she was sealed to joseph smith and though brigham still supports her and she is called by his name on earth in the resurrection she will leave him and go over to the original prophet the reader will certainly be shocked at this terrible burlesque of sacred things but i felt it my duty to state the truth and place facts in their right light 
it is not generally known that the mormons are taught that the marriage at cana of galilee was christ's own nuptial feast that mary and martha were his plural wives and that those women who in various parts of the new testament are spoken of as ministering to him stood to him in the same relation malicious first wives especially if they are rather elderly themselves frequently call the proxy wives fixins and the tone in which some of them utter the word is in the last degree contemptuous these poor fixins are seldom treated as real wives by the husband himself he may think sufficiently well of the proxy wife to make her his for time and to raise up children to his friend as the elders say but he never forgets that in eternity she will be handed over to the man for whom he has stood proxy and he expects that she also will bear that in mind and do all she can for her own support and never complain of his want of attention to her some men after having married a young proxy wife have become so enamored that they grew jealous of the dead husband and have tried to get the wife to break faith with him and be married to them for eternity as well as time this was certainly rather mean very few gentile husbands would fret themselves about possibilities in the world to come if in this world they had the certainty of enjoying the undivided affections of their wives mormon husbands are so influenced by their religion that they neither act nor think like other men i am thinking of one wretched family that i knew soon after i went to utah there was a man and his wife and four children all living together in a miserable poverty-stricken hut i had heard that the man was paying attentions to a young girl with a view to making her his second wife and i frequently watched the first wife as she went in and out doing her chores and wondered how she felt about it the poverty of the man of course was of no consequence living in the primitive style in which necessity then compelled the saints to live one or even half a dozen extra wives made very little difference and brigham and the leading elders have always represented it as a meritorious act for the young especially to build up the kingdom without regard to consequences or the misery of bringing up a family in a destitute condition i never can see children without loving them and in this case it was not long before i contrived to make acquaintance with the little ones one day while i was talking to them the mother came out she seemed pleased to see me for she had heard of me that i was not too strong in the faith and she told me that her husband had said in speaking of such women as myself who did not like the celestial order of marriage that their husbands ought to force them right into it and that would show what they were made of if they were true-hearted women seeking their husband's glory and exaltation in the world to come they would bear it well enough and if not the sooner it killed them the better for if they were dead their husbands could save them in the resurrection but if they lived they would only be an encumbrance this i found was the general opinion among the mormon men even in england the american elders taught us that the man was the head and saviour of the woman and that the woman was only responsible to her husband it was necessary we were told that the woman should keep in favour with her lord otherwise he might withdraw his protection and refuse to take her into the celestial kingdom in which case when she got to heaven she would only be an angel to be an angel is not considered by the saints to be by any means the highest state of glory those who do not obey the celestial order of marriage will like the angels neither marry nor be given in marriage they will be located the men in one place and the women in another and will serve as slaves lackeys and bootblacks to the saints brigham young 
once publicly said of a certain president of the united states that he would clean the boots of the mormon leaders in heaven he did not say this as a figure of speech but meant it literally those who have obeyed the gospel of the new dispensation but who have failed to enter into polygamy will be as upper servants but the rebellious the vile apostates and the wicked gentiles will join the angels and do all the drudgery for the men of many wives thus i learned in zion that my youthful notions about the glory of the cherubim were quite a mistake and that it was not such a fine thing to be an angel after all but i have run away from my story and had almost forgotten my poor acquaintance she was a woman who was likely to preserve a painful place in the memory of any one who saw her her face was as pale as death and her jet-black eyes glistened with an unearthly lustre it was easy to perceive that she was very unhappy although she tried hard to exhibit a cheerful disposition and when our conversation turned to that subject which to women here is all absorbing the nervous twitching of her pale face showed how deeply painful such thoughts were to her she told me that her husband was soon to be married to a young girl about fourteen years of age do you see she said that he is building for her and sure enough he was at odd hours adding another hut to the miserable hovel in which they already lived and thither when it was finished he intended to take his bride as i looked at the poor wife i felt little doubt that ere that time came her troubles on earth would have ended and her little ones would be motherless the mormon women as well as the mormon men are noted for attending to their own business they do not care to tell their sorrows and trials to strangers or to people who are not of their own faith in this way visitors to salt lake who have gone there with the intention of writing up the saints in the newspapers or in a book have generally been misled my own experience as a mormon woman leads me to form anything but a flattering opinion of the mormon stories told by gentile pens the following instance will show that the sisters are not quite so free in giving their experience as some writers would suggest one day while passing through the city I saw a young woman running across the road with a little child in her arms. The child was crying piteously, for the water was running from its clothing, and I saw in a moment that it had fallen into the stream which ran in front of the house. I followed to see if I could be of any assistance, but fortunately found that the little creature was not seriously hurt, but would soon recover from the fright and cold. I helped the mother to change its clothing, and while she was lulling her baby to sleep, we entered into conversation. At first she appeared to be very shy of me, and avoided speaking of anything in the slightest degree personal. But growing more interested, she said at last, "'Are you a Mormon?' "'Certainly,' I answered, but why do you ask me?' "'Because,' she said, "'we have had one or two Gentile women among us, and they go round among our people and question the women and get them to tell their troubles which god knows are heavy enough and then they go and write about it and brigham young finds it out and their husbands are called to account for allowing their wives to speak to the gentiles you are sure you are a mormon she added and you are not deceiving me i'm sorry you should think such a thing i said but if you suppose I would deceive you, I will not trouble you with my company. And I rose up to leave. Do not go yet, she said, and pray forgive me if I have wounded your feelings. It is simply the fear I have of getting into trouble. Brigham Young and the elders have frequently told us to have nothing to do with the Gentiles, for they are enemies to the kingdom of God, and are seeking our overthrow. And I suppose it is true." "'How long have you been here?' I asked. "'Over two years,' she replied, "'and it seems almost twenty. 
time has passed so slowly i left father and mother sisters and brother for the gospel's sake and i do not regret it because it is right but it was a very great sacrifice to make yet i believe that god blesses us for the sacrifices we make and i shall get my reward you have it already i said in that pretty child on your knee and your husband i hope is a good man and kind to you yes she answered my child is a very great source of happiness to me and i love my husband very much but hesitatingly are you in polygamy no not yet but i do not know how soon my husband may take it into his head to get another wife are you first wife she asked yes i replied and i suppose you are also no i am third wife she said i wish i were first wife but why i suggested do you wish that if polygamy is the true order of marriage i do not see that it makes much difference whether one is the first or the twentieth wife oh dear yes she replied it does make a great deal of difference for the first wife will be queen over all the others and reign with her husband if i had known that before i was married i should have made my husband promise to place me first men can do that if they like but do you think you would be doing right in trying to gain the position of first wife in that way why not she said didn't jacob obtain his brother's birthright by deception and was he ever punished for it do you think that brother brigham notwithstanding that he is the inspired servant of god could have obtained his position and all his money by simple honest dealing if you think so i don't and it is just as proper and right for us women to secure a position for ourselves by such means as it is for brigham young and the end justifies the means if that is so i said it is a wonder to me that any woman should consent to become second third or fourth wife seeing they cannot be queens i can see that you have not yet had your endowments she said or you would understand more about these things but as you are a good mormon i can speak freely to you you see it is not always those who are first wives in this world who will be first in the celestial kingdom it all depends upon the amount of sacrifice the wife is capable of making for her husband her faithfulness to him and the number of children she has borne him if she pleases him in every particular and is good patient and above all things obedient to all his wishes and commands then she is almost certain to be made queen unless the first wife is just as good and then i don't know how they would fix that and so you see it is safer to be first wife at once well but i asked knowing all this i am surprised that you consented to be third wife but i did not know it then she continued my husband told me that all the wives were queens all equal and he says so still when i talk to him about it but he can't deceive me i have spoken to some of the old nauvoo women who know all about it and they tell me that all the polygamic wives will be subject to the first wife but the first wife having suffered the most will be the one who has gone through the fire and been purified and found worthy but do you think that your husband would wish to deceive you about such an important matter i said wait till you have lived a little longer here she replied and you will be able to answer that question yourself or else your experience will be very different from that of the rest of the people here just then the husband made his appearance and put an end to the conversation he was a tall dark-looking man with gray hair old enough to be her father he appeared to be well educated and to have seen better days though everything about their home indicated poverty the room in which we were sitting had no carpet on the floor there was a plain white pine table in the middle a small sheet iron stove four wooden chairs a small looking-glass and some cheap pictures 
this was the sitting-room for the whole family three wives eleven children one husband he asked me if i had seen the rest of the family i replied negatively and he said he would see if any of them were about presently he returned accompanied by an elderly woman whom he introduced as mrs simpson then came another not quite as good-looking as the first but a great deal younger and he introduced her as my wife ellen and this one he said turning to the one with whom i had been conversing is my wife sarah don't you think i have got three fine-looking women then after a pause he added and they are just as good as they are good-looking good obedient wives i have no trouble with them my wishes are law in this house here you have a family in which the spirit of god reigns we are not rich in worldly goods as you see but we are laying up treasure in heaven we all live in this little home of four rooms my wife ellen here has given up her room for a parlor for us all to meet together in and she sleeps in a wagon box it is not the most comfortable but she never grumbles then here is our sarah we are obliged to humor her a little and give her a room all to herself she is young and inexperienced and doesn't like to be put up with the inconveniences that the saints have to bear with while old mother here has got to have half a dozen children in her room but she never complains why did you not wait i said until you had a larger house then where would my kingdom be he answered young men may wait but old men must improve their time there came in now a troop of children of all ages they had been playing in the lot were miserably clad barefooted and some looked gaunt and hungry manners to match these he said with all a father's fondness these constitute my kingdom and i am proud of them i felt thankful that i was not destined to be queen over such a kingdom wished them good-bye and with a sad heart went home to my own darling little ones not knowing what might be their fate End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of tell it all by fanny stenhouse this librivox recording is in the public domain brigham young at home we visit the prophet and his wives shortly after our arrival in salt lake city we visited president young who received us very graciously and appointed an early day for us to dine with him on that occasion he invited some of the apostles and leading men to meet us at his table and we passed an exceedingly pleasant evening the prophet made himself very affable talked with us about our missionary life and other subjects of personal and general interest and expressed a high opinion of the energy and ability which my husband had displayed his wives too who i found as far as i could judge from such a casual acquaintance to be amiable and kind-hearted ladies made every effort to render our visit agreeable i was much pleased with the manner and appearance of brigham young and felt greatly reassured for he did not seem to me like a man who would preach and practice such things as i had heard of him while i was in london this i was glad to see for it encouraged me to think that perhaps after all matters might not be as bad as i had anticipated we were in fact very kindly received in salt lake city by every one with whom we came in contact for having been missionaries for so many years we were of course well known by name and had a wide circle of acquaintances among the chief elders and emigrants fifteen years have of course worked a great change in the appearance of brigham young but though he is nearly seventy-three years of age he is still a portly i might almost say handsome man his good looks are not of the poetic or romantic kind at all he is very commonplace and practical in his appearance 
but long and habitual exercise of despotic authority has stamped itself upon his features and is seen even in the way he carries himself he might without any stretch of the imagination be mistaken for a retired sea captain when i first knew him in appearance he was a little over fifty years of age was of medium height well built and as i just stated with the air of one accustomed to being obeyed his hair was light sandy i suppose i ought to call it with eyes to match and the expression of his countenance was pleasant and manly i of course regarded him from a woman's standpoint but there were others who were accustomed to study physiognomy and they detected or thought they detected in the cold expression of his eye and the stern hard lines of his lips evidences of cruelty selfishness and dogged determination which it is only fair to say i myself never saw the lines on his face have deepened of late years as what little gentleness his heart ever knew has died out within him but still he presents the appearance of a man who would afford a deep study to the observer of human nature in early life he had to work hard for a living and according to his own statement he had a rough time of it he was by trade a painter and a glazier and has frequently said in public that in those times he was glad to work for six bits a day and to keep his hands busy from morning to night to get even that whether or not the privations of early years fostered in him that avaricious and grasping spirit which of late years has been so conspicuous in him i cannot say but it is certain that it cropped out very early in his career as a saint an old nauvoo missionary a mormon of the mormons once but alas a vile apostate as brigham would politely call him once told me that when the prophet joseph smith sent the apostle young on mission a good deal of discontent was shown that the said apostle did not account properly for the collections and tithings which passed through his hands brother joseph who was then the church suggested in a pleasant way for the prophet smith was a big jovial fellow six foot two or three inches in height and withal somewhat of a humorist that the said apostle brigham would appear in his eyes a better saint if he displayed a little less love for filthy lucre thereupon the apostle like somebody else who shall be nameless quoted scripture and reminded the prophet that moses had said thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn true brother brigham said joseph but moses did not say the ox was to eat up all the corn brother brigham made no reply but is said to have sulked for two or three days i have not the slightest doubt that but for mormonism the prophet would have remained all his life a journeyman painter and his sweetness as the poet says would have been wasted on the desert air but he was born just at the right time and he fitted into the right groove and thus while the original prophet of the new faith joseph smith a man of ten times the intellect of his successor a man ignorant and deluded it is true but at the same time a man in whom was the material for one of those natural giants who from age to age have left the impress of their individuality upon the history of the world while i say this man's name and doings have ceased to interest any but persons of studious mind brigham young whose narrow soul could never look beyond the little circle in which he lived whose selfishness and heartlessness have been only equalled by his cruelty and degrading avarice has by the force of circumstances alone obtained a place in the recognition of the world to which by nature or by grace he had not the shadow of a claim i have often heard intelligent gentiles remark well brigham young may be a wicked man and an impostor but there must be a great deal of talent in him to manage those people 
for so many years. From this opinion I altogether dissent, and those who know Brigham best think with me, though many of them would not dare to say so. I do not think Brigham Young a wicked man, or an impostor in the sense in which those words are ordinarily used, and experience and a careful study of his life and doings have convinced me that he is certainly not a great man, or a man of genius in any sense of the word. There can be no doubt that he has been guilty of many and great crimes, but I believe that in the early part of his career he was so blinded by fanaticism that those crimes appeared to him actually virtues. The force of habit and the daily associations of his life have so completely taken from him all sense of right and wrong, while the devotion of his people has made the idea that he could possibly do the slightest wrong so utterly inconceivable to him and to them that his perceptions of justice, truth, honor, honesty, and the upright dealing are as utterly stultified as they ever were in the mind of the wildest savage who prowled among the cliffs and canyons of the Rocky Mountains. People think that Brigham Young attained to his present position by the exercise of ability, such as has been displayed, only on a greater scale, by all those men who, not being born to power, nor having it thrust upon them, have by the force of their genius seized it and held it, unlawfully it might be, but nevertheless with talent and moral energy. Nothing could be more untrue. The fact that he was of a certain age, at a certain time, and only that, was the cause of Brother Brigham's first step up the ladder of ambition. Joseph Smith endeavored, in organizing his newly invented religion, to make it resemble as much as was possible both the old and new dispensations of Christianity. And among other institutions he appointed twelve apostles, who were to assist in governing the church. He associated with himself his elder brother Hiram, and also Sidney Rigdon, who had so greatly assisted in every way to establish the new faith and define its principles. This Rigdon is the same who has always been suspected of the authorship of the Book of Mormon, though it must be admitted that nothing more than circumstantial evidence can be adduced in support of this statement. However that might be, the two Smiths, Joseph and Hiram, and Sidney Rigdon, formed what was called the First Presidency. In other words, they were the Church. Next, in order to them came the Twelve Apostles, and after them the seventies, and the other grades of the priesthood, of which I shall say more presently. The twelve apostles were first appointed according to a plan of Joseph's own. Lyman Johnson was placed first. Brigham Young came next, and the others followed. Not long after, however, Joseph made a new arrangement, and placed the twelve according to their age, and this plan was always followed subsequently. Thomas B. Marsh now stood first, and next to him came David Patton, and then Brigham Young. I am obliged to give these little details in order that the reader may understand Brigham's position after the death of Joseph Smith. When Joseph was murdered in Carthage jail with his brother Hiram, Sidney Rigdon alone remained of the First Presidency. At that time, Thomas B. Marsh, the first of the Apostles, had apostatized. David Patton had been killed in a fight with the mob, and consequently Brigham Young was now President of the Twelve, he being the next in age. Thus it will be seen that even had he been, which he was not, the most stupid and least fitted of all the apostles to preside over the church, his years would nevertheless have given him the leadership. Up to this time there is no evidence that any idea of becoming head of the church had ever entered into Brigham's mind. Indeed, it is reported that Joseph on one occasion, reproving him, said ironically 
that if ever the church had the misfortune to be led by brother brigham he would lead it to well a place which is understood to be uncomfortably warm but joseph was now dead and rigdon alone remained between the apostle young and the headship of the church then it was that his eyes appear for the first time to have been fully opened to the advantages of his position now when the ancients took the fox as an emblem of craftiness it was because they had never known brigham brigham worked cautiously and prudently for he probably is one of the greatest cowards in existence both morally and physically and like all cowards he was perfectly au fait in working in the dark in accomplishing the removal of rigdon rigdon himself was brigham's best assistant a man of prudence or even of common sense might have safely held his position against all the brighams in the world but prudence and common sense were qualities utterly unknown to rigdon he began to have wonderful visions and revelations announced the immediate ending of the world and stated that he would forthwith lead out the armies of the lord to the battle of armageddon in palestine and then return in triumph calling by the way as he said to pull the nose of little vic little vic was the english queen then a young woman but how she incurred rigdon's wrath i do not know in addition to all this absurd nonsense he ordained some of his particular friends to be prophets priests and kings and otherwise showed that he intended to carry matters with a high hand Brigham watched his chance, and when he considered that matters were ripe for a change by dint of secret maneuvering, he caused Rigdon to be tried before the High Council at Nauvoo. Rigdon sent word that he was sick and could not come, but the trial went on, and of course it could have but one ending. The result was, as the Mormon papers at the time reported, that elder young arose and delivered sidney rigdon over to the buffetings of satan for a thousand years in the name of the lord and all the people said amen poor sidney he tried to set up a church for himself and a good many people followed him but the attempt was a failure he is now a very old man and cannot live long but he still believes in the truth of mormonism as established by joseph smith brigham's next step was to declare that the government of the church was now vested in the twelve of whom he was the head later still he contrived by selecting a time when nearly all of the apostles would be promoted or in some way gratified by a change in the organization of the church to get himself elected president of the church in the place of joseph with the two apostles next to him as his associates under the name of counsellors and they together formed the first presidency thus brigham became in name as well as in fact the head of the mormon church every year brother brigham in common with all the other officers of the church is duly re-elected i need hardly say that the re-election is a matter of course an opposition candidate would stand but a poor chance of success brigham young is an uneducated man for that of course he is not deserving of blame but his opposition to education in others and to all that is intellectual and elevating does him little credit only a very few years ago he with his two counsellors heber c kimball and jedediah m grant who were both spoken of as model saints, held forth in the tabernacle, in the most unmeasured language, against schools and scholastic acquirements of every description. They were all three untaught men, and, like all persons of small mind, who have not themselves received any education, they hated and affected to despise those who had. Thoughtful men, although they may never have enjoyed the advantages of literary culture, never fail to see the great power that it is, 
either for good or evil, and in most cases they try to secure for their children the blessing of which they themselves have been denied. But the Mormon leaders, while they ridiculed and affected to despise men of education, were shrewd enough to see that if schools were established and the children of the saints permitted to attend them, the bonds of superstition would certainly be shaken and the fabric of Mormonism undermined. They, consequently, discouraged every attempt at self-improvement and taught the people to aspire to nothing higher for their children than the rudiments of reading, writing, and arithmetic for the boys, and a knowledge of household, dairy, and farm work for the girls. Before the Reformation, a few young men anxious to improve their minds organized what they called the Literary and Musical Society. They gave pleasant social entertainments to their friends, at which they gave recitations, read essays, poems, and other literary productions, varying the program with selections of music. The authorities looked upon the whole proceeding with disfavor and soon broke up the society. Not content with this, and in order to show their contempt, they humiliated the members in every possible way, even publicly pointing them out to ridicule, and appointing a good many of them to be doorkeepers in the tabernacle. Brigham Young, who, it is said, never in his life read a book, could not understand that they could find any pleasure in intellectual amusements, and accused them of pride, conceit, and even wickedness. Among the church leaders it is even now common to speak of anyone who has any literary acquirements as having the big head and being next door to apostasy. Recently, greater efforts to obtain a good education for their children have been made by the more intelligent among the saints, and the Gentiles in Utah have established some very excellent schools. A library and reading room have also been opened, and the latter has been well attended by the young men, both Mormons and Gentiles. Brigham himself has, with his usual inconsistency, even gone so far as to give his own children those advantages which he selfishly denied to his poorer brethren. Of the prophet's moral character, the less said the better. He has been remorseless and cruel in his enmities, and he has connived at, and even suggested, if nothing more, some of the most atrocious crimes that have ever been perpetrated on the face of the earth. In business matters, in the payment of money, to use a popular phrase, his word is as good as his bond, but in the accumulation of wealth he has evinced an amount of dishonesty which can scarcely be credited. Brigham always meets his obligations, and pays his debts, and gets a lawful receipt, and the prophetic business could not otherwise be carried on, but the way in which he has obtained his wealth would put to the blush the most dishonest member of any ring in New York or elsewhere. When he attended his first conference, he says he had to borrow certain masculine garments and a pair of boots before he could put in an appearance. Now it would be difficult to estimate the value of his property. He has taken up large tracts of land all over the territory. He has the uncontrolled and unquestioned command of all the tithing and contributions of the saints, and from gifts and confiscations and innumerable other sources his revenue pours in. It was once rumored that he had eighteen or twenty million of dollars in the Bank of England, but Brigham said that the report was not true. The church, he added, had a little money invested abroad. The difference between the church and the individual Brigham Young has yet to be determined. In the year 1852, the prophet of the Lord found that he had borrowed an inconveniently large sum from the funds of the church. He is trustee in trust, and of course legally responsible, but he never renders an account of his stewardship, and no one ever asks him for it. 
His sense of honesty was, however, so strong that he resolved to have his account balanced, and he went down to the tithing office for that purpose. There he found that his indebtedness amounted to two hundred thousand dollars, and he proceeded to pay it after his own fashion. The clerk was instructed to place to his credit the same amount for services rendered. In 1867 he owed very nearly one million dollars, which he had borrowed from the same fund, and he balanced his account in the same way. His contract for the Pacific Railroad is said to have yielded him a quarter of a million, and his other contracts and mining speculations, purchases and thefts of lands, houses, and so forth, have been very profitable. The expenses of such a family as Brother Brigham's must be something enormous, but the contributions by which honest and dishonest means he has levied have been so large that he must still be one of the wealthiest men in the States. Brigham is not a generous man. He has given occasionally, as for instance at the time of the Chicago fire, when he presented a thousand dollars for the sufferers, but even then his motive was evident. The affairs of Deseret were under discussion in Congress. Without the certainty of a profitable return, Brigham never gave assent. The story of his sordid avarice and his contemptible meanness in the accumulation of money would fill a volume. Morally and physically, the prophet is a great coward. When he and other church leaders were arrested a year or two ago, charged with the very gravest crimes, the effect upon the prophet was most distressing he had solemnly sworn in the tabernacle that he would shoot the man who attempted to arrest him. But when Judge McKean opened court and placed him under arrest, he swallowed his threats and played the coward's part. Before this the world has seen wretches who were notorious for their cruelty and tyranny, and who were also remarkable for their cowardice. For many years he has imitated royalty, and has had a strong bodyguard to keep watch and ward around his person every night. No man has less cause to apprehend personal violence than Brother Brigham, but the voice of conscience, which, as the poet says, makes cowards of us all, suggests his fears. No one probably ever possessed and lost greater opportunities of doing good and leaving behind him an enviable record than Brother Brigham. In him the saints, from the smallest to the greatest, placed implicit trust, and it was in his power to mold them at his will. The spiritual and temporal welfare of the people was in his hands. The ability to elevate them socially, mentally, and morally was his. A great trust was committed to his charge but he has basely betrayed that sacred trust and has not only left undone what he should have performed, but he has been guilty of the most grievous wrongdoing. He has set at naught all morality with his horrible and debasing teachings respecting a blood atonement, in other words, the duty of assassination. He has outraged decency and riven asunder the most sacred social and domestic ties by his shameless introduction of polygamy. He has sacrilegiously defiled the temple of God by teaching his followers to worship Adam as their divinity, and has robbed Christ of his birthright by proclaiming that men are the only saviors of their wives, and in that respect to women the sacrifice of our Lord was of no direct avail. In a word, both by his preaching and his practice, he has set an example so bad as to be utterly without parallel in this civilized age. Kings and emperors there are who hold in slavery the persons of men. Hierarchs there are who hold in bondage the souls of the deluded. 
but the despot meddles not with the eternal welfare of his subject nor does he pollute the sacred precincts of the hearth and home and the false priest is not permitted to meddle with temporal affairs but the mormon despot brigham young has played the tyrant in both spiritual and worldly matters has meddled with the person the property and the lives and the liberty of his dupes and has at the same time debased and enslaved their souls but let it not be supposed that i write this hastily or without due consideration people outside of utah may be deceived as indeed they frequently are by representations made in ignorance of what mormonism and the prophet really are but the gentiles long resident in utah the apostates and even the mormon people themselves if only they would tell the truth could testify to the truthfulness of the picture which i have drawn of brother brigham a better people aside from their religion than the believing mormons when they emigrated to utah it would be difficult to find their fault was in their faith they were honest sober industrious and ready to sacrifice everything to what they considered religious duty i cannot think of them and of the implicit confidence which they placed in brigham without wondering at his folly in throwing away the noble opportunity which was once within his grasp of establishing a happy and contented people instead of this he has gathered wealth to himself and family out of the poverty of his followers he has amassed enormous riches and with the power to leave behind him a name as one of the benefactors of the human race he has set the worst example which despot or false prophet ever presented to the world End of chapter 19chapter 20 of tell it all by fanny stenhouse this librivox recording is in the public domain the wives of brigham young their history and their daily life the wives of brigham young have always been subjects of interest to gentiles who visited zion and having spoken of their husband i think it is only fair that i should say a few words about them for many years I have known personally all the prophet's wives who reside in Salt Lake City, and I wish to speak of them with kindness and respect. They are women whom anyone would esteem, conscientious, good, earnest women, faithful, true-hearted wives who have devoted their lives to the carrying out of what they believe is the revealed will of God. When I first knew Brother Brigham, poor man, he had only sixteen living with him in Salt Lake City, and even now he has no more than nineteen. Perhaps I ought to say eighteen, since Eliza Ann has run away from him and left the poor old gentleman desolate and forlorn. The three whom he took after I came to Utah were Amelia Folsom, Mary Van Cott Cobb, and eliza ann but the reader will perhaps be interested in hearing about them all and so i will state the names and order of the ladies as they at present stand according to the date of their marriage making mention of the proxy wives last of all for the sake of convenience and without reference to date of course brother brigham has had many more than nineteen wives but the following are the living ladies others are dead or have strayed away no one knew whither and perhaps as brother heber once said to me nobody cared allow me to introduce the mrs young number one first in order is mrs mary ann angel young but she is not the first wife that brother brigham ever had once upon a time brother brigham was a methodist but after listening to the preaching of the mormon missionaries he became a vile apostate as he loves to call those who leave his present faith and he forsook methodism 
in those days before he apostatized and long before he ever dreamed of polygamy he had but one wife one only it must seem strange to the prophet to look back to that period of solitary existence his second wife was mrs angel young and i call her his first wife because she is the first of those living now as she was married to him after the death of his first wife she is of course his legal wife and would be recognized as such in any civilized country she is a very fine-looking old lady and very much devoted to her unfaithful lord and master firmly believing in his divine mission she lives by herself and is seldom troubled with a visit from her affectionate spouse once in a while brigham brings her out to a party when he has invited any gentiles just for appearance sake quite a number of persons in utah believe that she is dead so very little is seen and known of her she lives in the white house brigham's first residence in salt lake city and is much thought of by those who do know her her children are greatly attached to her and show her a great deal of attention making up in this way to a certain extent for her husband's neglect her three sons joseph a brigham who it is expected will succeed his father as the president of the church and john w as well as her two daughters alice and luna are all in polygamy each of the sons has three wives and each of the daughters has a half-sister as a partner in her husband's affections brigham has not the slightest objection to giving two of his daughters to the same husband lucy decker seeley young number two lucy decker seeley young was his first wife in polygamy her former husband was a mr seeley she is short and stout a very excellent mother and a devoted wife her son brigham heber is now one of the cadets at west point the sending of this young man to west point to be educated when it was noticed in the public papers excited some little interest and the faith of many good mormons was very much shaken by it they had believed that brigham really meant what he taught when he told the people not to allow their children to associate with the gentiles as it would cause them to lose the spirit but they were still further shocked when they learned that several other sons of brigham were to go to the eastern states to be educated they have yet to learn that the prophet does not intend them to do as he does but rather as he tells them my own opinion is that brother brigham has advocated one course of conduct for the people while he pursued another himself clara decker young is the third wife she is a sister of lucy seeley and like her is short and stout but otherwise good-looking she is more than twenty years younger than her lord with whom she was once quite a favorite but like many others she has had her day to use brigham's own expression and is now as a matter of course neglected number four harriet cook young is tall with light hair and blue eyes and is an intelligent but not at all a refined woman she is said to have given a great deal of trouble to brother brigham of whom she has frequently said very hard things in times past she had the reputation of being a good deal more than a match for her husband when she had any cause of offence against him but in her quiet moments she is a very sincere mormon she has only one son oscar young now about twenty-five years of age when he was born brigham kindly announced to her that because she was not obedient she should have no more children and during more than a quarter of a century he has kept his word why she has remained with him so long is a mystery for she makes no secret of her feelings towards him number five lucy bigelow young is quite a fine-looking woman tall and fair and still quite young she has three pretty daughters brigham has recently sent her to live in southern utah mrs twiss young mrs twiss young has no children 
but she is a very good housewife and brigham appreciates her accordingly and has given her the position of housekeeper in the lion house women have two great privileges in the mormon church they may ask a man to marry them if they chance to fancy him and if they don't like him afterwards they are able to obtain a divorce for the moderate sum of ten dollars which sum the husband is expected to pay mrs twiss exercised the first privilege in reference to brother brigham but has not yet availed herself of the last there are other ladies who thought it would be a great honor to be called the wives of the prophet and they have requested him to allow them to be called by his name this he has done but he has never troubled them with his society number seven martha bowker young is a quiet little body with piercing dark eyes and very retiring brother brigham acts towards her as if he had quite forgotten that he had ever married her and she lives in all the loneliness of married spinsterhood number eight harriet barney seegers young the eighth wife is a tall fine-looking woman she was another man's wife when brigham made love to her it is not supposed to be the correct thing for a saint to court his neighbor's wife but the prophet did so in the case of harriet barney and in several other cases too harriet was married to a respectable young mormon gentleman but after she had lived with him some time and had borne three children to him the prophet persuaded her to join his ranks and she did so believing that the word of the prophet was the revelation of the lord to her but she has since had bitter cause to repent of her folly to a gentile mind such an infatuation must appear very strange but the mormon people personally understand the powerful influence which their religion exercises over them and to them there is nothing very singular in all this number nine eliza burgess young is the only english wife that brigham has she fell in love with the prophet wanted him to marry her and even offered to wait like jacob for seven years if she might be his at last so she served in the family of her lord for the appointed time and he finally took her to wife as a recompense for her faithfulness she has added one son to the prophet's kingdom the tenth wife on my list is susan snively young she is a german woman smart active and industrious she has no children but has been quite a helpmeet to her husband in making butter and cheese in which she excels smart mormons always had an eye to business and while living up to their privileges have not invariably sought for wives who were only fair and pleasant to look upon but have frequently taken them for their own intrinsic worth one as a good dairy maid another as a good cook, a third as a good laundress, and a fourth as a lady to grace the parlor, perhaps even two or three of this last kind, if the saint were wealthy. There is a good deal of practical wisdom in this. Brother Brigham has gathered all sorts into his net, and has then sorted them out, placing each lady in the place where he considered she would be the most useful and profitable to himself number eleven margaret pierce young is very ladylike tall and genteel she has the appearance of being very unhappy and it is certain that she has been very much neglected but not more so than many of the other wives she has one son emmeline free young number twelve when i first went to utah emmeline free young was the reigning favorite and she was really the handsomest of brigham's wives tall and graceful with curling hair beautiful eyes and fair complexion brigham was as fond of her at the time as a man of his nature with such a low estimate of woman could be but a younger though not a handsomer rival soon captivated his fickle heart and he left poor emmeline to mourn in sorrow she has never been herself since then and probably never will be she is a broken-hearted woman she is the mother of quite a numerous family 
as she had been the favorite for so long a time, she had come to believe that her husband would never seek another love. But if this was so, she sadly miscalculated Brigham, for when his licentious fancy was attracted to another object of affection, he cast off Emmeline as ruthlessly as he would an old garment. What decent person could refrain from loathing such a man? How often has my heart gone out in sympathy towards that poor wrecked woman whom he has forsaken? What a pity I deemed it that so much love should be wasted upon a creature who could never understand or appreciate it. And yet, Emmeline's fate has been no worse than that of the others. But I was more with her, and saw how keenly she suffered, and I sympathized with her when her sorrows brought her nearly to the point of death. Number 13. Amelia Folsom Young is now the favorite, and it is supposed that she will continue to be so, for at last poor brother Brigham has found a woman of whom he stands in dread. It is doubtful whether he loves her, but nobody in Zion doubts that he fears her. It is said that the prophet has confided so many of his secrets to Amelia that he is obliged to submit to her tyranny for fear of her leaving him and exposing some of his little ways which would not bear the light. Be that as it may, it is generally believed that after all his matrimonial alliances he has found at last his master in the person of Amelia. Even good saints, friends of the prophet, secretly enjoy the idea of him being at last brought under petticoat government, for it is believed that Brigham used unfair means to obtain her, and that at last he only gained his object by deluding her into the belief that the Lord had revealed to him that it was her duty to become his wife. One thing is very certain, he was as crazy over her as a silly boy over his first love, much to the disgust of his more sober brethren, who felt rather ashamed of the folly of their leader. At the theatre a seat was reserved for her at his side, and in the ballroom the same special attention was shown to her. He would open the ball, and after dancing with each of his other wives, who might be present, simply for appearance sake, the remainder of the evening was devoted to her. For all that his inconstant heart could not remain faithful to her, and old habits and feelings, to all appearance, have come over him again, and he has gone astray. Julia Dean, the actress, was the first to draw him from Amelia's side, and it would have been a sorry day for Amelia if Julia had favored the prophet's suit. Then the charms of Mary Van Cott touched his sensitive heart, to say nothing of Eliza Ann, his last, but yet not his best beloved. With all this experience, and the constant evidences of the fickleness of Brother Brigham's heart before her eyes, there is no wonder that poor Amelia feels compelled to hold tight the reins now that they are in her own hands. For if it is not much to be known as Brigham's wife, it is a great deal to be known as his favorite. As for the future, it is whispered that Brother Brigham has lately been setting his house in order, and in the ordinary course of nature Amelia is almost certain to outlive for many years her aged lord. She therefore can afford to wait for the good time coming. But Amelia knows that she would sink into oblivion if he were to cast her off for another before his death. Number 14. Mary Van Cott Cobb Young, who became Brigham's wife after his marriage to Amelia, is a very handsome woman about twenty-eight years of age. She is tall, slender, and graceful, and has been married to the prophet about six years. At first he appeared to be very devoted to her, but Amelia soon put a stop to that. Nevertheless, she has, since her marriage, presented a little daughter to her lord, greatly to the annoyance of Amelia, who has no children, and who is reported to have said some naughty things about the matter, which was very wrong of her, for Mary Van Cott is known by every one to be beyond reproach or suspicion. She is said to be very unhappy, and though Brigham has provided her with a fine house and every comfort, yet she seldom sees him, 
not perhaps more than once in three months or so, though it is generally believed that his spirit is willing, but Amelia won't allow it. Number 15. Eliza Ann Webb D. Young, whose separation from Brigham Young has attracted so much public attention, has told her own story in her own words, which, as it forms an interesting page in the biography of the prophet, I shall now present exactly as it was written to the reader. I was living on my father's farm in Little Cottonwood when in the summer of 1867 Brigham Young informed my father that he wanted me for a wife. Brigham, with a number of the apostles and elders from this city, was visiting Cottonwood on a Sunday and held two meetings for preaching. It was at the close of the forenoon service on that occasion that he walked up to me and said, Had I not better accompany you home? I said, Certainly, if you wish to. On the way to my father's house, Brigham asked me if I had had any proposals of marriage since I had obtained a divorce from my first husband. I answered him, Yes, that I had had several proposals. He then asked if there was any one of them that I wished to accept. I said no, on which he said that he would like to give me a little advice. He advised me not to wait to marry a person whom I loved, but to marry some good man whom I could respect and look up to and receive good counsel from. I thanked him for his counsel, and as my home was so near to the place of meeting, the conversation abruptly terminated. I thought nothing further of it. His brother Joseph and George Q. Cannon joined us at the dinner table, and while there Brigham and the others remarked how youthful I had grown since I had got out of my former troubles. As I had much improved in every way, I did not regard his observations as any intended compliment or any indication of what afterwards I learned to be passing in his mind. At the close of the afternoon service, he went up to my father, took him aside and talked for at least two hours to him about me, and told him how he had watched me from my infancy, saw me grow up to womanhood, had always loved me and intended to marry me. But having taken Amelia just after the law was passed in Congress prohibiting polygamy, he feared to take another wife soon after, lest it should make trouble, or he would have taken me then. My marriage with the young man was unlooked for to him, and when he was made acquainted with it he did not just like to stop it, he said, and so he let it go on, but always hoped that the time would come when he would have me. He wanted father and mother to use all their influence with me, and it would be the best thing I could do. He asked father if a good house well furnished and one thousand a year pocket money would be enough for me, and added that if it was not sufficient, I should have more. Father answered that he thought it would be sufficient. Brigham stood two hours or more with father, and kept the whole of the carriages that conveyed the party standing, waiting till after sundown, and little did I think that I was the object of interest. When father came home, he told mother by herself, and then they told me. I cannot describe my feelings. I was frightened. The thought of it was a perfect horror. I thought father had gone crazy and I would not believe his statement for hours. When I realized that it was a fact, I could do nothing but cry. The idea of an old man, sixty-seven years of age, the husband of about twenty wives living, asking me at twenty-two to be added to the number, filled me with the utmost abhorrence and when I saw that my parents were under his influence and sustained his proposition, I was ready to die in despair. Oh, the horrible hours that I spend in crying and moaning no tongue can picture. When father saw that I took it so badly, he told me that I would not be forced into it, but if I could bring my feelings to it and accept Brigham, it would be pleasing to him, and mother favored it in the same way. About a month after this I was in the city with an intimate lady friend, and as we were walking near to Brigham's house, he came to the gate and waited for our arrival. When I saw him I thought that I would get up courage to tell him that I would not marry him, but I could not say it. 
that peculiar influence that he throws over everybody when he has a purpose to effect completely overcame me he did not allude to the subject at all i shook hands and passed on he became very kind to my parents and saw father frequently he sent for me to come to the city on several occasions and met me at my father's city residence and talked to me about marriage told me how pure his feelings were and that his only motive was to do me good save me in the kingdom and make me a queen all that had no effect upon me it only disgusted me the more and the fear that i dared not resist him never left me this continued for nearly a year my eldest brother had had some business transactions with brigham and one of his sons which resulted in trouble and ultimately in financial injury to my brother brigham had been very angry with him and threatened to cut him off from the church i heard of those threats and believing at that time in mormonism i heard them with deep sorrow and confess that in hopes of turning brigham's anger away from my brother i began to entertain the thought that i would yield to his request i argued as many inexperienced persons do that as i had had a sorrowful life and my heart was crushed my future life was nothing and if i could sacrifice myself for my brother's interest and please my parents i would at last submit finally brigham named the marriage day and informed me through my father that what i required in preparation for my marriage he would furnish but i would accept nothing a day before my marriage he brought me three dress patterns one silk and two merino and handed to me a purse with a fifty dollar bill on the blank april eighteen sixty eight i was married to him in the endowment house by heber c kimball his first counsellor my father and mother were present with others brigham's brother joseph also took to himself a wife at the same time after the ceremony i walked over with him to the conference and in the evening i returned to my father's house and remained there for a month for the first few months i had considerable of his attention his visits were frequent after that his business cares so occupied him he said that he could only call about once in three months after that he came just as it happened when i was married he wanted my mother to live with me in the city and a year from the marriage he sent us to take charge of his farm where we remained till last august and i removed again into the city while i was at the farm he came very seldom to see me and oftentimes while he would visit and look round at the farm he never came into the house i had caused him no trouble indeed he had said i was the best wife he had for i had never given him a cross word or look but for that good temper i take no credit for my silence was all through fear i never loved him and never said to him that i loved him i looked upon him as a heartless despot from the very beginning of my married association with brigham young his manner of providing for me was of the meanest character i had to come up even from the farm four miles distant to the commissary of his family and was glad when i could get five pounds of sugar one quarter of a pound of tea a bar of soap and a pound of candles that i would get about once a month about a year ago i complained to him that i had not sugar enough and he allowed me what i required when i returned to the city he furnished me a house in a very ordinary way and i continued to live in the best manner i could but it was the same stingy way when a beef was killed i got some fresh meat but i was frequently months without seeing it tired with this manner of existence i asked his permission to keep boarders with the view of aiding myself and procuring for one of my sons a musical instrument as he was passionately fond of music the permission was granted and i kept boarders from last march my house was small and the business was not very lucrative i consequently went to him six weeks ago and asked him to aid me to give me some assistance to make life tolerable he seemed angry and complained that he had so many expenses and that he wanted me to keep myself 
to take the money that I had saved to buy an organ for my son and keep myself and family with it. I got a stove out of him, but that was all. During the last year I obtained from him two calico dresses. This interview made me sick and I was in bed for a week with heart sickness. One of the boarders who was a lawyer and his wife asked what ailed me, and I told the story of my troubles and inquired if there was no redress. He said that he thought that there was, and he would consult with other lawyers and see what could be done. During all my sickness while I was his wife, he showed the utmost indifference. He would hear what I had to say, but make almost no answer. Last fall I was attacked with pleurisy, and I managed to get to his office to see him, to tell him how ill I was, and that I needed some few things. He appeared to comprehend something, and finally called John, the commissary for the family, and told him to get me two bits worth of fresh meat. He has not been inside my house for nearly a year. While I was feeling bad, I read Mrs. Stenhouse's book, and that showed me things in a clearer light than I had seen them before. I knew every word was true from my own sad experience, and it encouraged me to leave the hateful polygamic life, and I am glad I have done it. About five weeks ago I got very weak. I don't know what was the matter with me, probably general debility from grief and mental suffering. My boarders, seeing my condition, aided me freely, and were very kind to me. I resolved to leave his house, packed up my clothes, and instructed an auctioneer two weeks ago to take away the furniture and sell it, as a part of it was my own, and I thought it was entitled to the rest. The suit commenced has been instituted by my attorneys, who have every confidence that I can obtain alimony. But whether I do or not, I think the world should know Brigham Young as he is, and my story is a page of his biography. This is the story of Eliza Ann told in her own words. She is the only wife whom Brigham has not supported, but she has been allowed to keep Gentile boarders. I suppose Brother Young had some reason when he made this exception. Miss Eliza R. Snow, number 16. Miss Eliza R. Snow I mention here, as I have not followed the order of date. She and the three ladies whose names I shall presently give are the proxy wives of Brigham living with him. Eliza Ann, who has become notorious of late, is popularly known as his nineteenth wife. She is his nineteenth living wife and the last wedded according to date. But if the deceased wives were taken into consideration, she might perhaps be about the thirtieth. In this list I have put all the living wives who are sealed to Brigham for eternity first, and thus I count Eliza Ann number fifteen. But had I placed the proxy wives, who are only Brigham's for time, in the list, she would, of course, be the nineteenth. The newspapers which have written her into notoriety know nothing of proxy and spiritual wives. All are alike to them. Eliza Roxy Snow is always spoken of among the saints as Miss Eliza R. Snow. I have already mentioned her, and need therefore only add that Eliza is the high priestess and poet general of the church. She is highly thought of by the saints, and the year before last was one of a company of Mormon missionaries who visited the Holy Land for the purpose of consecrating it to the Lord. Last summer she traveled through the settlements in Utah, urging women to enter into the celestial order. She is only a proxy wife to Brigham, and will belong to Joseph Smith in the resurrection. Number 17. Zina D. Huntington Jacobs Young is another proxy wife, and a widow of the prophet Joseph. She, too, will have to be handed over in the day of reckoning. She has one grown-up daughter of whom I shall presently speak under rather interesting circumstances. Number 18. Emily Partridge Young is a tall, dark-eyed, handsome woman, and she also is a proxy wife, a relict of Joseph. When Joseph died, 
Brigham told his wives that they were at liberty to choose whom they would for husbands, and some of them showed their appreciation of his generosity by choosing him himself. Thus it was that Emily Partridge became Brigham's wife. The prophet has dealt kindly to his brother Joseph Smith through her, for she has quite a family of children to be handed over with her. She was young and handsome when the prophet died, but perhaps it would be wrong to suppose that that had anything to do with Brigham's generosity to his brother, for it is generally believed that he took all those wives of Joseph from pure principle. Number 19. Augusta Cobb Young is a very fine-looking woman, and must have been quite handsome in her youthful days. As I before stated, she formerly lived in Boston, but hearing Brigham preach, she fell in love with him, abandoned her home, children, and husband, and taking her youngest child with her went to Salt Lake City, and was married to the prophet. It was she who, when Brigham began to neglect her, wanted to be sealed to Christ, but was ultimately added to the kingdom of Joseph Smith. Now these are the prophet's wives, his real living wives, nineteen in all. How many spiritual wives he has had, it would be impossible to say. Probably he himself does not know their number. Lately, I believe, he has been making his will, and if so, I suppose he has taken count of all. He has, besides, in various parts of Utah, many other wives, who are all more or less provided for, but they are of little account, and he seldom or never sees them. The nineteen whom I have named form his family at home, as I may say, are all under his own roof, or at least they live in Salt Lake City, and are known to everyone as his wives. The number of his children it would be very difficult to estimate. I can count up by name between forty and fifty, and I think the prophet's living children are rather under the latter figure. His family has, however, been much diminished by death, though since I went to Utah this has not been the case so much as I believe it was formerly. One Mormon writer, a very reliable and trustworthy man, says that the children that the prophet has lost would fill a fair-sized graveyard. This very probably may be true, as in the early days of the settlement in Utah, privation and the lack of proper medical attendance must have constantly proved fatal to the young children of the saints. But it was before my time, and therefore I cannot speak from personal experience. A Mormon gentleman one day told me a very funny story in reference to the prophet and his little family. He said that he had just had occasion to call in at a store in Main Street to make some purchases, when Brigham himself came in and entered into conversation with him. A smart-looking, clever little boy entered the store a few minutes after and handed a note to the proprietor. Brother Brigham seemed to be greatly interested in the child and asked him several questions in a playful way. Turning at length to my informant, he said, "'That's a nice boy, Brother Blank. Whose child is it?' This was a very awkward question, for the gentleman was aware that the child was one of Brigham's own. He did not like to tell him so, so he replied indirectly, "'He's one of Mrs. Young's children, President.' The prophet looked somewhat amused, but did not utter a word in reply. I give this story only for what it is worth, and no more. The gentleman who told it doubtless expected to be believed, but knowing the prophet and his family as I do, I consider the statement exaggerated, to say the least. It is a heavy responsibility to have five and forty children, most of them girls, too, without being accused of forgetting their personality altogether. In his habits and mode of living, Brigham Young is very simple, or at least was so until recently. When I first knew him, he was dressed in plain homespun, homemade, and every article about his person and his houses was as plain and unostentatious as could possibly be. 
but the importation of Gentiles and Gentile goods since the opening of the railway has worked a great change. His wives, who once carried simplicity of dress almost to the verge of dowdyism, have now acquired a taste for Eastern fashions, and I think if Brigham were a younger man, and were likely to live another ten years, he would find that wives were more expensive luxuries now than they were in the era of dugouts and sunbonnets. The prophet's first home in Utah was a little cottage which is now known as the White House. The same house, I believe, which was valued at sixty thousand dollars, and which Brother Tennant supposed he bought. A more scandalous and barefaced robbery never was perpetrated. This on the hillside, north of the Eagle Gate, and is now the residence of his first wife, Mrs. Angel Young. The Beehive House is the official residence of Brother Brigham. There he used to reign supreme as Governor Young, and thence he now issues secular and ecclesiastical edicts to all who acknowledge his sway. There is one lady resident in this house, Mrs. Lucy Decker Young, and no one else is permitted to intrude upon its privacy. Here the prophet has his own private bedroom, and here he breakfasts when he has been home overnight. The Lion House is what ought to be the home of the prophet, for here nearly all his wives reside. He has, however, many other houses in the city. On the basement floor, the dining room, kitchen, pantry, and other general offices. The first floor is divided by a long passage with doors on each side. On the right hand, about a half dozen wives with small families find accommodation. On the left, at the entrance, is the parlor, and the other rooms on that side are occupied by mothers with larger families and ladies who have a little more than ordinary attention. The upper floor is divided into twenty square bedrooms. There is no extravagance in the furniture or apparel of these wives, but they are comfortable and kept neat and clean. Again and again, the prophet has declared that the ten-dollar fees which are obtained from the divorces provide his wives with pin money. I do not believe a word of this, as the amount thus obtained is far more than the avaricious soul of the prophet would allow to pass out of his hands for feminine vanities, but I know of another source of income which is open to the wives. They are allowed all the fruit, peaches especially, which they or their children can gather or dry. This, in fact, is pretty nearly their only pin money. Their lord is not a generous man, and they have to make the most of trifles. The prophet usually dines in the lion house at three in the afternoon. Mrs. Twiss Young, as I mentioned before, acts the part of housekeeper, and she acts it well. At three, punctually, the bell rings, and the mothers with their children move down to the dining room. They are all seated at a very long table, which is lengthened by turning round at the end of the room. Each mother has her children around her. Brigham sits at the head of the table with his favorite when at home, vis-a-vis, -vis, or on his left, and if a visitor is present, he sits at the prophet's right hand. The repast is frugal but ample for Brigham is a sober and exceedingly economical man. This is the first time he sees his family. In the evening, at seven o'clock, the bell again rings, and the mothers and the children again fill the sides and end of the parlor. When they are all seated, the patriarch enters, takes his seat at the table, and chats quietly with those who chance to go in with him to prayers. When all the members of the family are assembled, the door is closed. All kneel down, and the prophet prays, invoking special blessings upon Zion and the kingdom. This is the last that his family will see of him for the day, unless they have occasion to seek him privately. With his family, Brother Brigham is said to be kind, but it is supposed to be more the awe which his position as prophet inspires than the love which they bear him as a man, which renders him successful in managing them. At the same time, that sweet familiarity is destroyed, 
which should exist between husband and wife, father and children. With such a number of wives, he cannot possibly wait upon them in visiting, and in the ballroom and other places of amusement, with the exception of his reigning favorite, whoever for the time she may happen to be, no one expects his attentions. At the theater, a full number of seats are reserved, and his wives attend or remain at home as they please. They sit in the body of the parquet among the rest of the people, but one of the two proscenium boxes is reserved for him, and beside him is a chair for the favorite, Amelia. When he goes to the ball, the same attention is shown. He dances first with the favorite, and if half dozen more of his wives have accompanied them, he will dance with each of them once in the course of the evening. But with the favorite he dances as frequently as any youth in the ballroom with his first maiden love. The apostles and leading men of the community who dance attendance on him and desire his favor are sure to seek the pleasure of her hand and place her in the same cotillion with Brigham, who is thus able all the evening to enjoy her company. Some of the apostles and elders look with pain upon this boyishness of the prophet and deplore it. Many of them are attached to their first wives and have shown them consideration and attention, which has not always pleased Brother Brigham. I have heard more than one of them express a wish that the prophet had been a little more attentive to his own first wife. It is only fair to Amelia, the reigning favorite, to state that she has always been kind and respectful to Mrs. Angel Young. Up to within the last few years, the community heard nothing of the prophet's family but what was strictly decorous and creditable. If there was any wrongdoing, it must have been very effectively hidden from the knowledge of outside observers. His wives are kind and faithful mothers, seeking to live their religion and ambitious to increase the glory of their Lord. I know them all personally, some of them intimately, and while I have heard from some with heavy hearts of their difficulties in bearing the cross which all Mormon women have to sustain, they have tried, I know, to be submissive, and I think it due to them that I should make this present recognition of their goodness of disposition and purity of soul. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse The Origin of the Reformation Extraordinary Doings of the Saints From time to time in the course of this narrative I have had the occasion to allude to a certain period of extraordinary fanatical excitement among the saints in Utah, a period which was there popularly termed the Reformation and I think that a brief sketch of the terrible sayings and doings of that time and the causes which led them may be interesting to the reader and may help to explain much which to a Gentile must otherwise be very obscure. The popular idea of Mormonism is that the peculiar feature which distinguishes it from all other Christian sects is polygamy. To a certain extent this is of course true, but it is only a partial statement of the truth. If polygamy were to be relinquished, it would still be found that Mormonism had really very little in common with other sects, and very much that was completely antagonistic to them. The Confession of Faith published by Joseph Smith during his lifetime would certainly deceive an uninitiated person, and it was in consequence of the ambiguity of that very document that so many unsuspecting persons were from the beginning of Mormonism led astray by the teachings of the missionaries. The convert was told that the Mormon faith proclaimed the existence of one true God, but he was not told that Father Adam was that deity, and that he is like a well-to-do farmer. He was told that Christ was the Son of God, but he was not taught that the Virgin Mary was the lawful wife of God the Father, 
and that he intended after the resurrection to take her again as one of his own wives to raise up immortal spirits in eternity he was told of faith in a saviour he was not told that men were the only saviours of their wives and that unless a woman pleased her husband and was obedient and was saved by him she could not be saved at all he was told that the saints believed in the holy ghost but he was not told the holy ghost is a man he is one of the sons of our father and our god you think our father and our god is not a lively sociable and cheerful man he is one of the most lively men that ever lived and yet although such fearful and shocking blasphemy was of course hidden from the convert whom it was desirable to impress with the idea that mormonism was only a development of christianity it was openly taught in the sermons in the tabernacle before thousands of people and inculcated in the writing of the highest authorities the passages which i have just quoted were preached in public taken down in shorthand were revised under the superintendence of brigham young or one of the chief leaders were then printed and published in salt lake city and afterwards reprinted in another form the verbal repetition of such blasphemy as this would be simply painful and disgusting to any right-minded person i shall therefore endeavor to give an idea of some of these outrageous doctrines without entering too closely into details should the reader however wish to search and see for himself i refer him to the journals of discourses the files of the church papers and the publications of the mormon writers generally one of the first innovations upon the received faith of ordinary christians was the doctrine of polytheism there can be no doubt that even in joseph's time that doctrine was taught although as in the case of polygamy all knowledge of it was kept from everyone but the initiated the strong men who could be entrusted with the inner secrets of the church leaders that such a doctrine however was beginning even then to form parts of the faith of the saints may be seen in the following lines upon the occasion of the prophet's murder unchanged in death with a saviour's love he pleads their cause in the courts above his homes in the sky he dwells with the gods far from the furious rage of mobs he died he died for those he loved he reigns he reigns in realms above many other instances even stronger than this could easily be given the mormon idea of the other world while in some respects it differed from the teachings of certain modern spiritualists was not altogether dissimilar the soul was said to be immortal and it had three stages of existence the first was purely spiritual the state of the soul before it came into this world spirits in that condition were not perfect they must first take a fleshly body and pass through the trials of life before they could attain to the highest state of existence hence it was a solemn duty as well as their highest privilege for men to practice polygamy their duty as by this means and by this alone the yet imperfect souls now waiting to come into this world could ever hope to be admitted into the celestial kingdom and a privilege thus all the souls whom they thus assisted to emigrate would form their own kingdoms in eternity over which as kings and priests they would reign for ever and ever the second stage of the soul's existence is the mortal with which we are all sadly well acquainted the third is the condition subsequent to the resurrection when they believe the flesh and bones will form the raised body but the blood will not be there for the blood is the principle of corrupt life and therefore another spirit supplies its place in heaven that christ partook of some broiled fish and part of a honeycomb is evident from holy scripture the mormons therefore teach that heaven will be very much the same as earth only considerably improved we shall not marry there or be given in marriage hence it is necessary for us to marry here 
and to marry as much as we can, for then in heaven a man will take the wives whom he married on earth, or who have been sealed to him by proxy. They will be his queens, and their children will be his subjects. We shall eat and drink and feast, and spend a happy time generally. We shall henceforth never die, hence shall we ourselves be gods. It was in the pre-existent state, the Mormons teach, that the work of salvation was first planned, but not after the fashion believed by all Christians. A grand celestial council was held, at which all the sons of God appeared. Michael, the father of all, presided and stated that he proposed to create a new world, of which he proceeded to give some details. His first begotten then arose and made a speech in which he proposed that Michael, his father, should go down to the world when created with Eve, his mother, and do there much after the fashion of what is related to our first parents in the book of Genesis. He himself would descend some thousands of years subsequently and would lead his erring brethren back and save them from their sins. Lucifer, the second son, then stood forth and unfolded his plan. Jealous of the popularity of his elder brother, he proposed to save men in their sins. Great discussion ensued in which the unnumbered family of heaven divided into three parties, one under each of the two elder sons, and the third standing neutral. After a terrible conflict, Lucifer, the second son, was defeated and with all his followers, was driven out of heaven. They descended into the abyss, where they founded the infernal kingdom of which Lucifer became the chief. He was henceforth known as the devil. Adam created his world and carried out his part of the plan, and in due time the eldest son, who conquered in heaven, took upon him the form of flesh, dwelt among men, and was known as their Redeemer. The spirits, who stood neutral during the fight, subsequently took upon them forms of flesh, entering into the children of Ham, and were known as Negroes. Therefore it is that although the American Indians and all other races are eligible for the Mormon priesthood, the Negro alone can never attain to that high dignity. It is only natural amidst all this confusion of ideas to ask, who then is the real originator of created things? In the eternity of matter, the Mormons have from the first believed. But they have supposed that the formation of worlds and systems had definite dates, although they are unknown to us. Far away in the immensity of space is Kolob, the great and glorious son of suns, the abode of the first principle of Godhead, of which we can form any conception. Around that sun, countless other systems revolve, of which ours is one. That sun itself may be only one of many other systems, whose origin and existence is lost in inconceivable space, and concerning which we can form no just realization, while in this finite state. From the first source in Kolob, other gods have proceeded in precisely the same way as genealogies and family trees have been continued on earth. Each new patriarchal god has formed his own earth out of the aggregation of matter, and over that earth he reigns. On the 9th of April, 1852, Brigham Young publicly announced that, when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our Father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. This public declaration gave great offense and led to the apostasy of many. Nevertheless, Brigham Young thinks that just as Adam came down to Eden and subsequently became a god, in like manner he also himself will attain to the Godhead. 
Heber C. Kimball, zealous to go a step further, declared that Brigham was God, and that he, Kimball, stood towards him in the same relation as the third person in the Blessed Trinity does towards the first. It will hence be seen that subordination is one of the first principles of the Mormon faith, and this even in the church organization of the saints has been distinctively shown. For the purposes for which it exists, the Mormon hierarchy could not be surpassed. Of the priesthood there are two orders, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic, of which the former ranks first and highest. The lowest rank in the church is the deacon, and he looks after the places of meeting, takes up collections, and attends to other similar duties. Next comes the teacher. He visits the saints and takes notes of their standing, and reports the same. Weakness of faith or backwardness in paying tithing is never overlooked by him. After him is the priest, and above him is the elder, whose office it is to preach, baptize, and lay on hands. All these belong to the order of the Aaronic, or the Levitical priesthood. Bishops are simply church officers having local jurisdiction. The lowest grade in the Melchizedek priesthood is the elder. He administers in all the ordinances of the church. Above him there is no higher rank as respects the priesthood, but in respect to office there are various gradations, as for example the high priests, the seventies, and bishops, who occupy positions of authority, although both go on missions, and also the apostles. The apostles were chosen in imitation of the twelve appointed by Christ, and in the same way the seventies, in imitation of the seventy disciples, sent forth to preach and work miracles. They claim rank next to the twelve. The quorum of the apostles is presided over by the eldest of their number. The quorums of seventies are each composed of seventy elders with a president and six counselors. The number of quorums is unlimited, and over them all collectively is another president and six counselors. The highest authority in the church is the First Presidency. Brigham Young, George A. Smith, and Daniel H. Wells, who are said to represent on earth the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. As, from President Young down to the most illiterate elder, every one is supposed to be specially inspired and to be immediately guided by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Education is utterly unnecessary to the members of the Mormon priesthood. In fact, it has always been looked upon as an impediment to its possessor. Obedience is considered the highest qualification, and it was the strict enforcement of obedience on the part of the ordinary people and the lower grades of the priesthood towards the higher, that alone could have made possible that state of affairs which existed during the Reformation. Hence also it is that Brigham Young and the leaders are rightly held responsible for the deeds of violence and fanaticism which their followers may perpetrate, for it is well known that no Mormon, in a matter of grave importance, would dare to act upon his own responsibility and without he felt sure that what he did would meet with the approbation of those in authority. There is another class of church officer which I had very nearly forgotten, the patriarchs. The chief of these is called the presiding patriarch over the church, and the rest are patriarchs in the church. The office of these dignitaries is to bless the people and to be paid for their blessings. The price of good blessings is variable. Not long ago, when money was scarce and payments were made in produce, two dollars was considered reasonable, and if several were wanted for the same family, a reduction was made. Hiram Smith, the original prophet's eldest brother, was the first patriarch, and to him succeeded Uncle John, as he was popularly called, the eldest brother of Brigham. The present patriarch is the son of Hiram, still a young man, who
who obtained his office by inheritance and this i believe is about the only office in the church which brother brigham has permitted the smith family to inherit or enjoy odd as it may seem some of the people have quite a passion for these blessings i knew one old french woman who was said like the woman in the parable in respect to the physicians to have spent all of her living upon them i met her one day with a flannel petticoat under her arm which she was going to sell upon inquiry she frankly told me that she had given her last cent and had sold every scrap of any value which she possessed and nearly all of her clothes in order to obtain blessings and as she did not understand english she was now going to sell her old petticoat the very last article of any value which she now possessed in order to pay an old dame who knew a little english for her services in translating the blessings she was in a state of great sorrow at the thought that now her supply of blessings would be stopped she would have to do without the patriarchs however at no time possessed any particular official weight and from them never proceeded any of those strange doctrines which excited the people to violence and bloodshed in a religious sense this outrageous fanaticism was all originated in the first place in missouri by some of the more prominent men such as sidney rigdon dr avard david patton and others doubtless with the connivance of the prophet joseph not long after the organization of the church and subsequently by the extreme and preposterous doctrines constantly inculcated by brigham young among whom jedediah m grant and heber c kimball were the most conspicuous in a political sense it was the natural result of the peculiar position of the saints in missouri ohio and illinois and of the ridiculous threats of brigham young against the federal government after the exodus of the mormons to the salt lake valley together with the idea which had become popular among the people that a temporal kingdom was to be set up among the rocky mountains and that christ should personally reign and rule there the idea of reviving the old jewish polity was always uppermost in the minds of the first teachers hence they revived the priesthood and high priesthood in their various forms a magnificent temple was built in nauvoo just as another temple is now being erected at salt lake city and so far did they go that it was even determined that the ancient sacrifices should eventually be restored at the same time while the minds of the mormons newly converted and fired with zeal were bent upon founding the kingdom of the saints on earth the people of missouri among whom they dwelt heard that even in social life the customs of the jews were to be introduced and that polygamy was to be practiced husbands and brothers trembled for their wives and sisters and the hatred to the new religion was increased when it was observed that the mormons in every political movement held all together and voted as one man thus exercising an influence which no ordinary religious sect could have possessed or wielded this the discipline of the hierarchy to which i have already referred enabled them to do ill-feeling was shown on both sides in a thousand petty ways at first with more serious results presently the mormons were accused of circulating large quantities of base coin of cheating and defrauding the gentiles as they called every one even jews who rejected the new religion and of even being guilty of darker crimes which last charge however was only at first hinted at on the other hand the mormons accused their enemies of every possible villainy of which men and women could be guilty the real fact would appear to be that both the mormons and their enemies were at that time guilty of much wrong-doing against each other while at the same time much that was alleged on both sides was utterly groundless and only originated in the natural jealousy which western pioneers rough and ready frontiersmen such as the people of those parts then were would naturally feel when enlisted in two parties animated by religious and political hatred against each other 
now came whisperings of still more atrocious deeds it was alleged that among the mormons a secret body of men had been chosen who were enrolled under the most frightful oaths to avenge every wrong which might be perpetrated against the saints this band was said to have originated with sidney rigdon and dr samson avard and as i have somewhere else mentioned thomas b marsh and hyde the present chief of the apostles both made affidavit that such was the case and that the band was sworn to commit the most shocking acts of vengeance and surely marsh and hyde ought to know various names were chosen for this death society first the members were called the daughters of zion from micah four thirteen but as it sounded rather ridiculous to speak of bearded ruffians as daughters that name was abandoned and the title avenging angels substituted and that with some other names then temporarily used were subsequently dropped for the name danites from genesis nineteen seventeen which has since been retained not by the mormons for they have ever denied the existence of any such band but by the gentiles it matters very little what the name of such a society might be so long as it existed at all and that it does and has existed in some form cannot reasonably be denied there probably is not at the present time any formally enrolled society but it is quite certain that for many years past if the church had only dropped a hint that any man's blood ought to be shed that man would have had a very short tenure of his life even brigham himself said publicly if men come here and do not behave themselves they will not only find the danites whom they talk so much about biting the horses heels but the scoundrels will find something biting their heels in my plain remarks i simply call things by their own names it is beyond a doubt that notwithstanding all the social changes and improvements of late years the secret police of salt lake city are in matters of crime as well as in fact though not perhaps nominally the successors of the original death society many of its members are known to have committed grievous crimes and to have repeatedly dyed their hands in blood the shocking deeds that every now and then are divulged to the world are all of their doing and no resident of salt lake city whether mormon or gentile although he might prudently decline to state his opinions would in his mind question the fact that it is fear of consequences and only because the saints are on their good behavior in the sight of the federal government that the hands of these wretches are withheld from a continuance of their old enormities as might be supposed the establishment of a secret band of men professedly ready at a moment to steal to shed blood or commit any crime at the command of their leaders created great excitement in the whole state of missouri and especially in the vicinity of the mormon settlements like the ishmaelites of old the hands of the saints were against every man and every man's hand was against them they were taught that they were a chosen nation a royal priesthood a peculiar people the sword of the lord and of gideon was to be theirs they were to go forth conquering and to conquer and the gentiles were to be trodden down beneath their feet as might be expected trouble immediately arose the people of missouri outraged the mormons and the mormons in return outraged them murders thefts and the most shameful atrocities were of daily occurrence and the history of those terrible doings would fill a good-sized volume suffice it to say that the excitement continued and increased reprisals being made on both sides finally the mob was triumphant and after committing many fearful excesses it was organized into a militia the leading men in authority declaring that the mormons must either leave the state or else they must be extirpated by the sword notwithstanding all this the mormons at all times an industrious people were in one sense successful and prosperous the morality however of some of their leading men was to say the least very questionable 
It was openly argued that the silver and gold were the Lord's, and so were the cattle on a thousand hills. The scripture says that God has given his people all things richly to enjoy. The saints were the people of God. He had given them all the wealth and substance of the earth, and therefore it was no sin for them to help themselves. They were but taking their own. To overreach or defraud their enemies was facetiously called by the Mormons, milking the Gentiles. Their city, called Nauvoo, the beautiful, a name given by the prophet Joseph and supposed to be of celestial origin, was well laid out and well built. A costly temple was nearly complete, and the leaders, at least, began to show signs of wealth and prosperity. This, however, was but the lull before the storm. Writs upon various charges against Joseph and the leading elders had always been floating about, and the serving of some of the later ones had only been prevented by technical difficulties or the personal fears of the sheriff. To enter Nauvoo for the purpose of arresting the prophet was like bearding the lion in his den. For by this time one of the best equipped and best drilled militia regiments under the name of the Nauvoo Legion had been organized, and Joseph had been elected lieutenant general. The regiment consisted solely of well-tried Mormons who were devotedly attached to their leader, besides which the whole of the population of the city was at his call at a moment's notice. Into the city of the saints, as far as it was possible to prevent it, no Gentile was allowed to intrude. It was at the risk of life and property that anyone ventured. One oddly original mode of driving out the devoted stranger is worthy of mention. It was called whittling a man out of the town. Opposite the victim's door, a number of men and overgrown boys would take up their quarters, each armed with a stout stick of wood and a huge knife. No sooner did the Gentile appear then the whole horde gathered in a circle round him. Not a word was uttered, but each man, grasping firmly his stick in his left hand, pointed its other end to within a few inches of the victim's face, while with the knife in his right hand he sliced a shaving out of the wood in such a way as to bring the point of the knife almost against the face of the unfortunate man. Wherever he turned they attended him, always preserving the strictest silence and never actually touching him. The intolerable sensation caused by the whittling of this strange bodyguard, who were in attendance day and night, and the unpleasantness of seeing half a score of sharp knives flashing perpetually within an inch of his nose, generally subdued the strongest-minded Gentile. Few could endure it for more than a day or so at the utmost. They were glad to leave, whittled out of town. The evil day, however, at last came. The prophet, fearing arrest, fled, but was persuaded to return and deliver himself up. The charge against him was one for which reasonable bail could be taken. Bail was offered, accepted, and the prisoners discharged. Before leaving court, however, the prophet and his brother Hiram, the patriarch, were arrested upon a trumped-up charge of treason, a charge for which it was impossible that bail should be taken. They were therefore committed to custody in Carthage jail, under solemn promise from Governor Ford of Illinois that the state should be answerable for their personal protection. The same day, however, a mob of over one hundred men, assisted, it is said, by the militia who were left in charge, burst into the jail and assassinated the prophet and his brother. As might be supposed, this outrage by no means weakened the Mormon cause. Their prophet was now a martyr, and his name more powerful after death than it could possibly have been had he lived. It was, however, clearer than ever that nothing could now reconcile the people of Illinois to the Mormons, and the latter seriously began to think of leaving the state in a body as they had formerly left Missouri. The terrible doings of those times I have no idea of relating just now. 
I simply allude to them in order that the reader may understand how, in the excitement produced in that border warfare, it was possible for such strange events as afterwards transpired in Utah to originate. I may simply add that the temple being completed, and the first endowments given there, the people gathered up what little property they could rescue from the mob, and under the guidance of Brigham Young, and amidst privations, sufferings, and outrages of the most painful character, left the city which they had founded in Illinois, and set out for the Rocky Mountains, where, beside the Great Salt Lake, they founded their modern Zion. Free now from the violence of mobs and Gentile enmity, it might have been supposed that the hatred which had so long been part of the Mormon faith would have died a natural death. The contrary, however, was the case. The Mexican War was then raging, and, en route to the Rocky Mountains, the Mormons had received a proposal from the federal government that they should supply a regiment, upon highly advantageous conditions, to join the United States troops, which were then operating in California. This suggestion was kindly made, for it was thought that the Mormon regiment thus raised would in reality be only marching their own way to going to California, and that the outfits, pay, arms, and so forth, which were to be theirs, after the year for which they were enrolled had expired, would be of essential service to them. It was like paying men liberally for making a journey for their own benefit. Notwithstanding all this, Brigham Young and the leaders represented the transaction in quite another light, and the people were taught that an engagement into which they had entered of their own free will, and from which they had derived substantial advantages, was an act of heartless cruelty and despotic tyranny on the part of the government. This feeling was fostered until at length the saints as a body regarded themselves as a wronged and outraged people, and considered every Gentile, in fact the whole nation, as their natural enemies. This was perhaps all the more singular, since after the vast tract of country, of which Utah forms a part, had, at the end of the war, been wrested from Mexico, Brigham Young had been appointed by President Millard Fillmore the first governor and Indian agent of the territory. He was, therefore, in federal pay, and bound, as long as he retained office, to support the government, or at the very least, not to stir up disaffection. Trouble soon arose between Governor Young and the Mormons on one side, and the judges and United States courts and officials on the other. Once an armed mob burst into the Supreme Court and forced the judge then sitting to adjourn. At another time a bonfire was made of the books and papers of the district courts. Then a judge on the bench was threatened with personal outrage, and subsequently a posse summoned by legal process encamped for a whole fortnight over against another posse summoned without legal process, the two bodies burning with bitter hatred and breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Such a state of affairs could not, of course, last long. On the one side the wildest statements were publicly made against the government, Threats, which uttered by a little band of pioneers against a mighty nation, were perfectly ridiculous, stirred up the hearts of the saints. On the other hand, it was pretty certain that federal troops would have to be sent out to Utah to preserve the peace of the territory. The federal government was nevertheless defied, abused, and derided, and the people thoroughly blinded by their fanaticism did not for a moment doubt that should Governor Young declare war, the United States troops would vanish before the armies of the saints like chaff upon the threshing floor. So absurd does all this appear that I should really hardly venture to repeat it were it not that everyone in Utah, Mormon and Gentile, knows that I am really understating facts rather than otherwise. Now came a crisis in Mormon history for which all these wild sayings and unlawful doings had been so long paving the way. The Reformation was destined to be the crowning point of saintly folly and saintly sin. 
End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of Terror in Utah, the Reformation of the Saints. The people were now thoroughly excited. Their religious antipathy, their political hatred, two of the most powerful passions which move individuals or bodies of men, had been appealed to and both in public and private they had been stirred up to a pitch of frenzy which it is hardly possible at the present time to comprehend there were whisperings now of a most fearful doctrine calculated not only to strike terror into the hearts of those whose faith was weakening but even to shock with a sense of horror those who only heard of it from afar i mean the doctrine of the blood atonement the saints had all along been taught to distinguish between murder and the shedding of innocent blood, the former being spoken of as a crime for which atonement might be made. But for the latter there was no repentance on earth. It was an unpardonable sin. They were also taught to distinguish carefully between sins which might be forgiven and sins for which pardon was impossible. Now the difference between murder and shedding innocent blood is this. The latter is the crime of killing a saint, which can never be forgiven but by the death of the transgressor. But the former is of a quite different character. To murder a Gentile may sometimes be inexpedient, or perhaps even to a certain extent wrong. But it is seldom, if ever, a crime, and never an unpardonable sin. A friend of mine was in a state of apostasy. The bishop went to her to expostulate and told her that if he were her husband, he would get rid of her and take away her children as well. He would not on any account live with her. Perhaps, she said, you would not allow me to live at all. Certainly not, he replied. I would think about as much of killing you or any other miserable apostate, as I would about killing a cat. If Brigham Young were to tell me to put you to death, I would do it with the greatest of pleasure, and it would be for your good, too. Thus, when the famous revelation on polygamy says that a man cannot be pardoned for shedding innocent blood, it does not mean that he cannot be pardoned for murdering a Gentile or an apostate for that under some circumstances might even be meritorious but that the murder of a saint by one of the brethren cannot under any circumstances be forgiven on earth and that his only chance of forgiveness lies in his own blood being shed as an atonement certain sins cannot be forgiven here on earth shedding innocent blood divulging the secrets of the endowment house marital unfaithfulness on the part of the wife apostasy these are unpardonable all other crimes which gentiles abhor may become even virtues if done in the cause of the church i do not of course mean to say that the mass of the mormon people act to such atrocious doctrines for although when among themselves they would admit that the theory was correct the better instincts of their nature keep them from even putting that theory into practice. But what I do mean to say is that such doctrines have, over and over again, been distinctly taught in the plainest words in the public hearing of thousands, that they have been printed and reprinted by authority, that they have been practiced, and the very highest of the Mormon leaders have applauded it is this day a matter of fact and not a matter of question that if any mormon apostate were to commit any of the unpardonable sins which i have mentioned and if he or she were to be assassinated by a private individual all zealous mormons indeed the leaders would maintain that not only was the deed justifiable but even meritorious this may seem bad enough but it is not the worst the doctrine of the blood atonement is that the murder of an apostate is a deed of love. 
if a saint sees another leave the church, or if even he only believes that his brother's faith is weakening, and that he will apostatize before long, he knows that the soul of his unbelieving brother will be lost if he dies in such a state, and that only by his blood being shed is there any chance of forgiveness for him. It is therefore the kindest action that he can perform toward him to shed his blood. The doing so is a deed of truest love. The nearer, the dearer, the more tenderly loved the sinner is, the greater the affection shown by the shedder of blood. The action is no longer murder or the shedding of innocent blood, for the taint of apostasy takes away its innocence. It is making an atonement, not a crime. It is an act of mercy, therefore meritorious. These were the terrible teachings which the Reformation brought to light. They had been whispered before among the elect, and had been acted upon by the avenging angels, but before this they had never been publicly and intelligibly explained. As I before said, the saints had been excited to a condition of frenzy, and were ready to engage in any fanatical folly. But the way in which the spark was applied to the powder was as ridiculous as its results were terrible. Jedediah M. Grant, an enthusiast of the wildest kind, a man without education or a mental discipline of any description, one of the First Presidency, and high in authority among the saints, had occasion to attend a meeting which was held at Kaysville, a place about twenty-five miles distant from Salt Lake City, and he invited some of the elders to meet him there to take part in the proceedings. To one of these, Jetty, as he was familiarly called, obligingly lent a mule. He himself did not accompany the party, but went on before. These elders were pretty well mounted, and one of them, being a good horseman, made the rest keep up with him. In consequence of this, when they arrived at Kaysville, the beasts were heated and tired. The Apostle Jetty watched them, but said nothing. Up to a certain point, the meeting passed off pleasantly enough. The elders present were good at testimony, and strong in exhorting their hearers to faithfulness. Jetty was the last speaker. He began in his usual way, but presently warmed up until he became quite excited, and then proceeded to accuse every one present of all sorts of wrongdoing. The elders who had preceded him came in for their full share. He denounced them for their inconsistency and hypocrisy, and bitterly upbraided them for running his mule and their own beasts in such a manner. The bishop of the place and his counsellors he accused of inactivity and carelessness, and he called loudly upon every one present to repent and do their first works, threatening them with speedy judgments of heaven. All this was well enough if it had stopped there, for it might have been taken for just what it was, an ebullition of temper on the part of Jetty, who was naturally vexed that his mule had been overheated. But, like many other manias and epidemics, this Mormon movement began with a most insignificant trifle, and the spirit of fiery denunciation became perfectly contagious. Another meeting was held in the course of a few weeks, and then the mutual accusations of those who were present became, if possible, more bitter than before. The saints were denounced as the vilest of sinners, and they were all commanded to be re-baptized. Accordingly, after the meeting, although it was night and the weather was cold, a considerable number were immersed by the elders, and Jetty himself was so enthusiastically engaged in the performance that he remained in the water so long that he got a thorough chill and contracted the disease of which he died. Sunday after Sunday similar scenes were repeated in the tabernacle, until, had it not been painful, the whole affair would have been ludicrous in the extreme. Everyone had strayed from the path of duty, and the fact was announced in the strongest terms. People were called upon by name to publicly confess their sins, 
and many were then and there pointed out and accused of crimes of which they were entirely guiltless but which they dared not deny in the midst of all this the duty of implicit obedience to the priesthood and the payment of tithes was loudly insisted upon then the missionaries were sent out all over the territory armed with the full authority of the priesthood and also a catechism which on account of its obscene character has been bought up so successfully by brigham that it is doubtful if there is a copy in existence the mormons have a curious way of appointing missionaries if a man is weak in the faith a depraved bad man or even a youth with wild tendencies and inclined to sow his wild oats a little too luxuriantly he is sent on his travels to preach the gospel nothing strengthens a man's faith it is thought more than having to defend it from the opposition of unbelievers and the enforced good example which the missionary is obliged to set will it is said produce a salutary effect upon the exuberance of youth or the depravity of more mature years in the present instance many of the missionaries thus sent forth were known to be as immoral as they were grossly ignorant there was one terrible meeting at which brigham himself was put to the blush men of note were there no one was present who did not belong to the priesthood jetty held forth and heber and brigham were strong upon the occasion in the midst of the proceedings brother brigham full of confidence in the plainest words called upon all who could not plead guiltless of certain crimes to stand up three-fourths of those present immediately arose utterly shocked the prophet entered into explanations but self-convicted these three-fourths of his hearers stood conscientiously firm even brigham saw the necessity of taking some stringent measures the saints were told that if they were rebaptized their sins would be washed away and they could then say they were not guilty of the crimes suggested in the catechism subsequently the catechism itself was as i said bought up and burnt the burden of every sermon was unquestioning obedience repentance payment of tithing and above all the taking of more wives the missionaries without the slightest ceremony would visit the houses of respectable saints examine them out of the abominable catechism and question husbands and wives in the presence of their children about even their very thoughts in a manner and upon subjects which would amply have justified their being hung up to the nearest tree lynch law was in fact too good for such atrocities wicked ideas the utterance of which would have called forth a blush even if heard from the lips of a drunken rowdy in a pothouse were suggested and explained to young children while it would have been literally at the risk of life for their parents to have expostulated to do so would have shown want of faith and want of faith would have justified some fanatical scoundrel in using his knife or his pistol for the loving purpose of cutting off his brother's soul from earth in order to save it in heaven meanwhile jedediah did not for a moment cease his exhortations the work must be done thoroughly the blood atonement must not be forgotten on one occasion in the tabernacle this crazy fanatic said i would advise some of you men here to go to president young and confess your sins and ask him to take you outside the city and have your blood shed to atone for your sins there are men and women that i would advise to go to the president immediately and ask him to appoint a committee to attend to their case and then let a place be selected and let that committee shed their blood i would ask how many covenant breakers there are in this city and in this kingdom i believe that there are a great many and if they are covenant breakers we need a place designated where we can shed their blood we have been trying long enough with this people and i go in for letting the sword of the almighty be unsheathed not only in word but in deed lest he be mistaken he said what ought this meek people who keep the commandments of god do unto them why says one 
they ought to pray the Lord to kill them. I want to know if you would wish the Lord to come down and do all your dirty work? When a man prays for a thing, he ought to be willing to perform it himself. Putting to death the transgressors would exhibit the law of God, no matter by whom it was done. Heber C. Kimball, the model saint, after a speech to the same effect, in which, as usual, he made use of the most disgusting language, added, Joseph Smith was God to the inhabitants of the earth when he was among us, and Brigham is God now. But more shocking than any other was the language of Brigham Young himself. On the 21st of September, 1856, in a discourse delivered in the Bowery, Great Salt Lake City, and afterwards reprinted by authority in the Journals of Discourses, Volume 4, pages 53 through 54, he said, The time is coming when justice will be laid to the line and righteousness to the plummet, when we shall take the old broadsword and ask, Are you for God? And if you are not heartily on the Lord's side, you will be hewn down. There are sins that men commit for which they cannot receive forgiveness in this world or in that which is to come, and if they had their eyes opened to see their true condition, they would be perfectly willing to have their blood spilt upon the ground, that the smoke thereof might ascend to heaven as an offering for their sins, and the smoking incense would atone for their sins, whereas, if such is not the case, they will stick to them and remain with them in the spirit world. I know when you hear my brethren telling about cutting people off from the earth that you consider it a strong doctrine, but it is to save them, not to destroy them. I do know that there are sins committed of such a nature that if the people did understand the doctrine of salvation, they would tremble because of their situation. And furthermore, I know that there are transgressors who, if they knew themselves and the only condition upon which they can obtain forgiveness, would beg of their brethren to shed their blood, that the smoke thereof might ascend to God as an offering to appease the wrath that is kindled against them, and that the law might have its course. I will say further, I have had men come to me and offer their lives to atone for their sins. It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall, and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which it can never remit, as it was in ancient days, so it is in our day, and though the principles are taught publicly from this stand, still the people do not understand them. Yet the law is precisely the same. There are sins that can be atoned for by an offering upon an altar, as in the ancient days, and there are sins that the blood of a lamb, a calf, or of turtle doves cannot remit, but they must be atoned for by the blood of the man." One would have supposed that even Brigham had now reached the culminating point of horror and blasphemy, but no, a month or so later he even surpassed himself, when in a tabernacle sermon he said, When will we love our neighbors as ourselves? In the first place Jesus said that no man hateth his own flesh. It is admitted by all that every person loves himself. Now if we do rightly love ourselves, we want to be saved and continue to exist. We want to go into the kingdom where we can enjoy eternity and see no more sorrow nor death. This is the desire of every person who believes in God. Now take a person in this congregation who has knowledge with regard to being saved in the kingdom of our God and our Father and being exalted one who knows and understands the principles of eternal life, and sees the beauties and excellency of the eternities before him, compared with the vain and foolish things of the world. And suppose that he is overtaken in a gross fault, that he has committed a sin that he knows will deprive him of that exaltation which he desires, and that he cannot attain to it without the shedding of his blood, and also knows that by having his blood shed, he will atone for that sin, and be saved and exalted with the gods. 
is there a man or a woman in this house but would say, Shed my blood that I might be saved and exalted with the gods? This would be loving ourselves, even unto an eternal exaltation. Will you love your brothers or sisters likewise, when they have a sin that cannot be atoned for without the shedding of their blood? Will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? That is what Jesus Christ meant. He never told a man or woman to love their enemies in their wickedness, never. He never meant any such thing. His language is left as it is for those to read who have the spirit to discern between truth and error. It was so left for those who can discern the things of God. Jesus Christ never meant that we should love a wicked man in his wickedness. I could refer you to plenty of instances where men have been righteously slain in order to atone for their sins. I have seen scores and hundreds of people for whom there would have been a chance in the last resurrection there will be, if their lives had been taken and their blood spilled on the ground as a smoking incense to the Almighty, but who are now angels to the devil until our elder brother, Jesus Christ, raises them up and conquers death, hell, and the grave. I have known a great many men who have left this church for whom there is no chance whatever for exaltation, but if their blood had been spilled, it would have been better for them. The wickedness and ignorance of the nations forbid this principle being in full force, but the time will come when the law of God will be in full force. This is loving our neighbor as ourselves. If he needs help, help him. If he wants salvation, and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. Any of you who understand the principles of eternity, if you have sinned a sin requiring the shedding of blood, except the sin unto death, should not be satisfied or rest until your blood should be spilled, that you might gain salvation you desire. That is the way to love mankind. Light and darkness cannot dwell together, and so it is with the kingdom of God. Now, brethren and sisters, will you live your religion? How many hundreds of times have I asked that question? Will the Latter-day Saints live their religion? And so, according to Brigham Young, their prophet, this was the religion of the saints, and the people acted up to the religion thus taught. And the story is so terrible that one dare not even whisper all its details. It is no secret that all this was understood literally. The wife of one elder, when he was absent on a mission, acted unfaithfully towards him. Her husband took counsel of the authorities, and was reminded that the shedding of her blood alone could save her. He returned and told her, but she asked for time, which was readily granted. One day, in a moment of affection, when she was seated on his knee, he reminded her of her doom, and suggested that now, when their hearts were full of love, was a suitable time for carrying it into execution. She acquiesced, and out of love he cut her throat from ear to ear. In many instances the outrages committed against persons who were known to be innocent were so revolting that no woman, nay, even no right-minded man, would venture to more than just allude to them. A few, however, and only a few, and they by no means the worst, of the milder cases I will just mention. There was the murder of the Aiken party, six persons, who were killed on their way to California. The same year, a man named Yates was killed under atrocious circumstances, and Franklin McNeil, who had sued Brigham for false imprisonment, and who was killed at his hotel door. There was Sergeant Pike, and there was Arnold and Drown. There was Price and William Bryan at Fairfield. There was Almond Babbitt and Brassfield, and Dr. Robinson. There was also James Cowdy and his wife and child, and Margetts and his wife, 
and many another too, to say nothing of that frightful murder at the mountain meadows. Besides these, there is good reason to think that Lieutenant Gunnison and his party were also victims, although it was said they were shot by Indians. The Potter and Parrish murders were notorious. Forbes and Jones and his mother might be added to the same list. The dumb boy, Andrew Bernard, a woman killed by her own husband, Morris, the rival prophet, and Banks, and four women who belonged to their party, Isaac Potter and Charles Wilson and John Walker. These are but a few. The death list is too long for me to venture to give it. One instance I can give from my own personal knowledge. A sister who occasionally does a little work at my house on one occasion said to me, Mrs. Stenhouse, when first I came to this country I lived in the southern portion of Utah. One day I saw a woman running across the field towards our house, pale and trembling. When she came in she looked round her as if she were frightened, and she asked if anyone besides our own family were present. On being assured that there was no one present whom she might fear, she said, Two men came to our house late last night and asked to see my husband, who had already retired. He was in bed, but they insisted that he must get up as they had a message from the authorities for him. When they saw him, they requested him to go with them to attend, they said, to some church business. I became very much alarmed, for my poor husband had been known to speak rather freely of late of some of the measures of the church. But he tried to reassure me, and finally left the house with the two men. In about an hour after, they came back bearing between them his lifeless body. They laid him upon the bed, and then one of them pulled aside the curtain which constituted our only cupboard, and took therefrom a bake kettle, and stood it beside the bed, in order to catch the blood that was flowing from a fearful wound in his throat. They then left the house, telling me to make as little noise about it as possible, or they might serve me in the same way. The men were masked, and I cannot tell who they are, but I spent a fearful night with my poor dead husband. This sister added, Sister Stenhouse, in those more fearful times we dared not speak to each other about such things, for fear of spies. These are all well-known and notorious instances. I say nothing of those of whose fate nothing, not even a whisper, was ever heard, and I say nothing of the frightful cuttings off before the Reformation and in recent years. Gentile men and women were killed for hatred, and that killing was no murder, for theirs was not innocent blood. Apostates and saints of doubtful faith and those who were obnoxious had their blood shed all for love, and that cutting off was also no murder, because to secure their salvation by cutting their throats was an act of mercy. Can it be possible that men should thus act and say, and believe, that Jesus, the gentle and merciful Savior, commanded it when he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself? All through this reign of terror, marrying and giving in marriage was the order of the day. It mattered not if a man was seventy years of age. According to Brother Brigham, he was still a boy. The brethren are all boys until they are a hundred years old, and some young girl of sixteen, fifteen, or even younger, would be counseled, that is commanded, to marry him. She might even have a sister no older than herself, and then as likely as not he would take the two to wife, and very probably both on the same day. The girls were told that to marry a young man was not a safe thing, for the young men were not tried. It was better to marry a well-tested patriarch, and then their chances of exaltation in the kingdom of heaven were sure and certain. In this way, the lifelong happiness of many a girl, little more than a child, was blighted forever. At the time of which I speak, every unmarried woman or girl who could by the utmost stretch of possibility be thought old enough to marry was forced to find a husband, or a husband was immediately found for her, 
and without any regard to her wishes, was forced upon her. Young men, and even boys, were forced not only into marriage, but even polygamy, and none dared resist. The marrying mania, in fact, was universal and irresistible. Everyone must marry or be given in marriage. So evidently was this the case that women in jest said, if one were to hang a petticoat upon a fence pole, half a dozen men would flock at once to marry it. Absurd as this may seem, it was not very far from the truth. Young men and maidens, old men and children, widows, virgins and youths, in fact everyone, whether married or unmarried, it mattered not, it was counseled, commanded, to marry. There is above fanaticism a stronger law which, despite every effort of the deluded victim, will occasionally make itself heard. The voice of nature. Even during that strange time in which every saint seemed to have gone stark crazy mad, the frightful anomaly of men of fifty, sixty, and even seventy, marrying mere children, girls of fourteen and even thirteen, forced itself upon the attention of some of the leaders. The question arose, an odd question to Gentile ears, at what age is a girl old enough to marry? Considerable discussion ensued, and even in the tabernacle the subject was taken up. The voice of authority, however, eventually answered the matter, but not in the way that any ordinary, civilized person would expect. In those times, unmarried girls were very scarce. In the settlements, it was difficult to find any at all. Not infrequently it happened that a brother was counseled to marry, but could not obey, as there was no unmarried woman in the place where he lived. But in that case, he generally paid a visit to Salt Lake City. But business at the endowment house, nevertheless, was pretty lively, in fact, so much so that it was deemed necessary to set apart certain days for the various settlements. Once, when the Provo Day was fast approaching, two old brethren from that town who had been counseled to enlarge their families, but who had been unsuccessful in finding partners, began to despair of being able to obey the word of the Lord. The day before that appointed for the endowments and celestial marriage arrived, and they were as far from success as ever. Being neighbors, the two old gentlemen met and mingled their griefs and considered what might be done. It then occurred to them that there was a certain brother who had two daughters, respectively twelve and fourteen years of age, and they resolved to call upon him about these children. As might be supposed, the father at first refused them, giving as a reason that the girls were too young. The old men explained that if they could not marry the children, it was impossible for them to obey counsel, and the father then agreed. The next morning the marriage ceremony was performed in the endowment house. One of these wretches was sixty years of age and the other a few years younger. The father of the children was about forty, I am really afraid that the reader will think that I exaggerate or misrepresent facts. I wish it were so, for the case is so outrageously atrocious. But I am sorry to say that scores and hundreds of instances similar to this which occurred during the Reformation might be given. Not long before this infamous transaction, one of these men, looking round in search of a wife, learned that a certain young English girl was stopping at the house of a certain brother in the neighborhood. He immediately visited that brother and said he should like to be made acquainted with the girl. It happened that the young sister in question had recently been married, but of that the ancient brother was of course ignorant, and his friend at whose house the lady was stopping, being fond of a little practical joke at times, did not inform him of the fact. The would-be lover, in a business-like way, at once began with his wooing, spoke to the young lady about the revelation, of the counsel he had received, of his desire to obey, and finally offered her his hand and heart, at least as much of the latter as remained. 
he expatiated upon his prospects and possessions. He had a small house and a large lot, a good farm, a few cows, a yoke of oxen, and a wagon. Another wife was a trifle which he himself was well able to keep. The sister listened in silence and seemed a little bashful. At last she said that about such a serious matter she must have a little time for consideration, and asked for a week's thinking time. Delighted with his success, the gentleman withdrew. But before the end of the week he found out that the lady was married. He saw her husband, he saw the friend at whose house the lady was stopping, and over the matter he made a considerable fuss. There are before me, as I write, letters, papers, documents of various sorts relative to marriage and the matrimonial affairs of the saints, at the time of which I speak, that I wish the reader could peep at. I would not like him to read them, in fact, I dared not read them all myself, for some of them are so shameful that the mere knowledge of having read them through would make any right-minded person blush. Taking more wives was the order of the day. How was of little matter. The work of reformation was in full progress. The people were excited to frenzy. The federal troops were expected. Men were marrying and maidens were given in marriage. Every one in Utah was looking forward to the time when the prophecies of Joseph the seer should be fulfilled and the Son of Man should come. And then when one would have supposed that every man would have wished that his hands should be pure, was perpetrated a deed which is unparalleled in modern civilized times, a deed at which angels and men have stood aghast with horror. End of chapter 22「by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mountain Meadows Massacre. I will repay, saith the Lord. I feel myself utterly inadequate to tell the story of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. It is so shocking, so fiend like, and yet it must be told. While the work of reformation was going on, and when the United States troops were constantly expected in the valley of the Great Salt Lake, a large train of emigrants passed through Utah on its way to California. The train consisted of one hundred and twenty or one hundred and thirty persons, and they came chiefly from Arkansas. They were people from the country districts, sober, hard-working plain folks, but well-to-do, and taken all in all, about as respectable a band of emigrants as ever passed through Salt Lake City. Nothing worthy of any particular note occurred to them until they reached the valley. That was the point from which they started towards death. My old friend Eli B. Kelsey traveled with them from Fort Bridger to Salt Lake City, and he spoke of them in the highest terms. If I remember rightly, he said that the train was divided into two parts, the first a rough and ready set of men, regular frontier pioneers, the other a picked community, the members of which were all more or less connected by family ties. They traveled along in the most orderly fashion, without hurry or confusion. On a Sunday they rested, and one of their number, who had been a Methodist preacher, conducted divine service. All went well until they reached Salt Lake City, where they expected to be able to refit and replenish their stock of provisions. But it was there that they first discovered that feeling of enmity which finally resulted in their destruction. Now it so happened that the minds of the saints in Salt Lake City were at that time strongly prejudiced against the people of Arkansas and for a most unsaintly reason. The Apostle Parley P. Pratt, who was one of the earliest converts to Mormonism, and who so ably defended his adopted creed with his pen and from the platform, had not very long before been sojourning in Arkansas, and had there run away with another man's wife. This was only a trifle for an apostle to do, 
and the husband, Mr. McLean, might have known it. But he was a most inconsiderate man, and was actually offended with the amorous apostle for what he had done. He pursued him and killed him, for in those rough parts it was considered that the apostle did wrong in marrying the man's wife. Nobody, however, took any notice of the matter or brought the murderer to trial. The Mormon people, of course, took the side of Apostle Parley P. Pratt, sensitive themselves to the highest degree concerning their wives and daughters. They considered McLean a sinner for doing just exactly what any saint would have certainly done. Their opinion, however, would have been a matter of consequence only to themselves had not such fatal consequences resulted from it. Reasoning without reason, they argued that McLean was the enemy of every Mormon, and every Mormon was the enemy of McLean. McLean was protected in Arkansas, therefore every man from Arkansas was an enemy of the Mormons. An enemy ought to be cut off. Therefore it was the duty of every Mormon to cut off, if he could, every Arkansas man. This appears to have been the tone of thought which actuated the minds of the leaders of the people at the time, when this emigrant train arrived in the city. Weary and footsore, they encamped by the Jordan River, trusting there to recruit themselves and their teams, and to replenish their stock of provisions. The harvest in Utah that year had been abundant, and there was nothing to hinder them from obtaining a speedy and full supply. Brigham Young was then governor of Utah Territory, commander-in-chief of the militia, and Indian agent as well. He was therefore responsible for all that took place within his jurisdiction. It was his duty to protect all law-abiding persons who either resided in or traveled through the country. The emigrants, so far from being protected, were ordered to break up their camp and move on and it is said that written instructions were sent on before them, directing the people in the settlements through which they would have to pass to have no dealings with them. This, considering their need of provisions, was much the same as condemning them to certain death. Compelled to travel on, they pursued their journey slowly towards Los Angeles. At American Fork they wished to trade off some of their worn-out stock and to purchase fresh. They also desired to obtain provisions. There was an abundance of everything from farm and from the field, for God had very greatly blessed the land that year. But they could obtain nothing. They passed on and went through Battle Creek, Provo, Springville, Spanish Fork, Payson, Salt Creek, and Fillmore, and their reception was still the same. The word of the Mormon pontiff had gone forth, and no man dared to hold communion or to trade with them. Now and then, some Mormon, weak in the faith, or braver, or more fond of money than his fellows, would steal into the camp in the darkness of the night, bearing with him just what he was able to carry. But beyond this they could procure nothing. Their only hope now lay in the chance of holding out until they could push through to some Gentile settlement where the word of the priestly governor of Utah was not law. Through fifteen different Mormon settlements did they pass without being able to purchase a morsel of bread. With empty wagons and on short allowance they pushed on until they reached Corn Creek, where for the first time in saintly Utah they met a friendly greeting from the Indians and purchased from them thirty bushels of corn, of which they stood very greatly in need. At Beaver they were again repulsed, and at Parowan they were not permitted to enter the town. They were forced to leave the public highway and pass round the west side of the fort wall. They encamped by the stream and tried, as before, to obtain food and fresh cattle, but again to no purpose. The reason why they were refused admission into the town was probably because the militia was there assembled under Colonel William H. Dame, which militia afterwards assisted in their destruction, for which preparations were even now made. 
they made their way to cedar city the most populous of all the towns of southern utah here they were allowed to purchase fifty bushels of tithing wheat and to have it ground at the mill of that infamous scoundrel john d lee upon whose memory will rest the eternal curses of all who have ever heard his name it was however no act of mercy the supplying of this corn the sellers of it knew well enough even then that it would return to them again in the course of a few days after all they had but forty days rations to carry them on to san bernardino in california a journey of about seventy days scanty kindness miserable generosity fifty bushels of corn for a seventy days journey for men women and young children and at least one little one to be born on the road they remained in cedar city only one day and so jaded were their teams that it took them three days to travel thence to iron creek a distance of twenty miles and two days were occupied in journeying fifteen miles the distance between iron creek and the meadows the morning after they left iron creek the mormon militia followed them in pursuit intending it is supposed to assault them at clara crossing that this was no private outburst and that on the contrary it was done by authority is evident from sworn testimony to the effect that the assembling of those troops was the result of quote, a regular military call from the superior officers to the subordinate officers and privates of the regiment said regiment was duly ordered to muster armed and equipped as the law directs and prepared for field operations end quote. a regular military council was held at parowan at which were present president isaac c Haight, the mormon high priest of southern utah colonel dame major john d lee and the apostle george a smith no military council whether of the militia or the ordinary troops of the line would dare to determine upon such an important matter as the cutting off of an emigrant train of one hundred and thirty persons without receiving permission from superior authority brigham young was in this case the superior authority he was the commander-in-chief of the militia the inference is obvious i do not of course say that he gave the order for this accursed deed but that it was his business to bring the criminals to justice no one can doubt or deny the regiment which started from cedar city under the command of major john d lee the sub-agent for indian affairs in southern utah was accompanied by baggage wagons and other paraphernalia of war excepting only heavy artillery which in this case would have been useless but at the same time a large body of the piety indians had been invited to accompany them an order came from headquarters to cut off the entire company except the little children the emigrants were utterly unprepared and the first onslaught found them defenceless accustomed however to border warfare they immediately corralled their wagons and prepared for a siege their great misfortune was that they had not any water major john d lee finding the emigrants resolute sent to cedar city and washington city for reinforcements which duly arrived the next morning major john d lee assembled his troops including the auxiliaries which he had summoned about half a mile from the entrenchment of the faded emigrants and then and there informed them with all the coolness which such an infamous scoundrel alone could muster that the whole company was to be killed and only the little children who were too young to remember anything were to be spared the unfortunate emigrants did not know who their foes were they saw indians or men who were so colored that they looked like indians and they saw others who were more than strangers to them but they had no clue to the cause of their detention to them all was mystery that indians should attack them was quite within the bounds of probability although there was at that time no cause for such an outrage but that such an attack should be persistent and should be carried on under the peculiar circumstances in question 
was, to say the least, highly improbable. A flag of truce was sent down to the unfortunate emigrants. But wherefore a flag of truce? Wherefore any conditions of warfare? And wherefore should the militia regiment be militant against them? No answer can be returned to these questions without disclosing secret scenes of sin and shameful iniquity at the mention of which even the souls of fiends might stand aghast. A message was sent to the emigrant camp, a message not of Christian love and help, but such as might be sent from one foeman to another. A flag of truce was sent, and with it a message to the effect that if the emigrants chose to lay down their arms and surrender themselves to the militia, their lives should be spared. Consider the atrocity of this. Here was a company of harmless emigrants, against whom not even the slightest wrongdoing had been suggested. Yet unquestioned, unaccused, innocent of all wrongdoing, the authorized and duly constituted militia of Utah Territory, a territory claiming even then to be admitted into the Union as the state of Deseret, was encamped against those unoffending citizens, with the cruel, the iniquitous purpose of cutting them off. Who could rightly tell a story so fearful as this? The emigrant train, men, women, and children, fainting and famishing for want of bread and meat. In their pockets was money wherewith the necessaries of life might have been bought, and the generous hand of the Almighty had that year been opened so wide, and had scattered those necessaries so liberally that nothing but the wickedness of man towards his fellow could have created a dearth. But so it was that darkness and the fear of death, a fearful death even at the door, was all those poor emigrants had standing before their eyes. What right had the Mormon militia to be pursuing, to be hanging about the skirts of any body of emigrants? Their very presence was in itself unauthorized, criminal. The emigrants supposed that they were surrounded by Indians, and expected the cruelest treatment in case of resistance, not death, but the outrage and shocking atrocities of savages. They did not know that the red men who threatened their lives, and the lives of their helpless wives and infants, were brought together at that spot for that same purpose by the Council of Mormon Authorities. They did not know that so many of the appearing redskins were only painted devils, mocks of humanity, wretches who under the mask of a redskin's color were eager to perpetrate the foulest of offenses, scoundrels a thousand times damned in the opinion of men and by the decree of God. Day after day went by, and the poor creatures began to despair. Who can wonder? The brave men cared little for their own lives, but there was something fearful in the thought that their darling ones would be scalped and torn in pieces and brutally outraged. Who can wonder that they resolved to sell life as dearly as they possibly could? They might at least die in defense of those they loved. So day followed day. The agony of the unhappy men and women who were thus besieged and were in daily hourly peril of the most frightful of all deaths can be imagined, not told. Meanwhile, what were those atrocious scoundrels doing who were lying in wait for their blood? Some of them were tricked out as Indians. Some were in their own proper dresses, and, moreover, real Utes were there. The unhappy victims could not possibly escape. There was time for the murderers to do their work leisurely. Between chance shots, which were intended to, and did, carry death with them, they amused themselves with pitching horseshoe quoits. Such heartlessness is almost beyond conception. In terrible need of water, they thought that even the Indians, who they supposed were their assailants, might possibly respect a token of truce. So they dressed two little girls in white, and sent them down to the well, but the fiends, the Mormon militia, shot them down. In the day of doom, the blood of those babes will testify more heavily against Major John D. Lee and Isaac C. Haight and Colonel Dame and George A. Smith 
and the other wretch who plotted and contrived that fearful iniquity than any of the base and cowardly crimes which have for years and years blackened their contemptible and miserable souls they could not possibly advance their corn would not last long they were famishing for water how long they could hold out was evidently only a matter of time had the train consisted only of men they might certainly if with loss have cut their way through their besiegers and escaped but with wives and children and others bound to them by the tenderest ties such a thing was impossible they looked and waited savage indians they supposed were their only enemies coldly strangely as they had been treated at the mormon settlements they could never for a moment suppose that white men could be in league against them or could meditate their destruction up in the meadows in the distance there was a white dusty cloud as if of some person or persons approaching the hearts of the emigrants leapt for joy was help coming at last it was evident that a wagon was coming near and the wagon was filled with armed men here was hope after all the misery of that waitful watching they were overjoyed and shouted aloud with gladness and sprang with open arms to welcome their visitors little did they suppose that the fiends who then came down with pale faces and the manners of white men were the same as those who painted and decked out like indians had been leaguered about their camp with murderous intentions for so many days the wagon came near and was found to be filled with armed men surely now the unhappy immigrants thought substantial help had come the authorities of utah in the neighborhood whether gentile or mormon had come out in the cause of civilization and humanity and succor was at hand a white flag was waved from the wagon as an emblem of peace and in order that the emigrants might know that it was white men and not the red demons of the hills who approached they did not indeed know that these themselves were the monsters who had wronged them all this time and who were even now compassing their death inside that wagon was president haight the infamous mormon bishop john d lee and other authorities of the church in southern utah they professed to the emigrants that they came upon the friendly errand of standing between them and the indians they said that the indians had taken offence at something that the emigrants had done that they were thirsting for their blood but that they the mormon officials were on good terms with them and had influence and would use their good offices in the cause of mercy and of peace after some discussion they left with the professed view of conciliating the indians then they returned and said that the indians had agreed that if the emigrants marched back to salt lake city their lives should be spared but that they must leave everything behind them in their camp even including the common weapons of defense which every western man carries about his person the mormon officials then solemnly undertook to bring an armed force and to guard the emigrants safely back again to the settlements the emigrants were not cowards and would doubtless have preferred to cut their way through to the south but they could not leave their wives and little ones and any terms however disadvantageous were better than leaving those they loved to the tender mercy of those wretches this agreement being made the mormon officials retired and after a short time again returned with thirty or forty armed men then the emigrants were marched out the women and children in the front and the men following while the mormon guard followed in the rear when they had marched in this way about a mile and had arrived at the place where the indians were hid in the bushes on each side of the road the signal was given for the slaughter so taken by surprise were the emigrants and so implicitly had they confided in these murderers that they offered no resistance the mormon militia their guard immediately opened fire upon them from the rear while the indians and mormons disguised as indians who were hidden among the bushes rushed out upon them shooting them down with guns and bows and arrows and cutting some of the men's throats with knives 
the women and children shrieking with mortal terror scattered and fled some trying to hide in the bushes two young girls actually did escape for about a quarter of a mile when they were overtaken and butchered under circumstances of the greatest brutality the son of john d lee endeavored to protect one poor girl who clung to him for help but his father tearing her from him by violence blew out her brains another unhappy girl is said to have kneeled to this same monster lee entreating him to spare her life he dragged her into the bushes stripped her naked and cut her throat from ear to ear after she had suffered worse at his hands than death itself about half an hour was probably occupied in the butchery and every soul of that company was cut off excepting only a few little children who were supposed to be too young to understand or remember what had taken place the unfortunate victims were then stripped without reference to age or sex and then left to rot upon the field there they remained until torn and dismembered by the wolves when it was then thought prudent to conceal such as lay nearest to the road an eye-witness subsequently visiting the spot said the scene of the massacre even at this late day was horrible to look upon women's hair in detached locks and in masses hung to the sage bushes and was strewn over the ground in many places parts of little children's dresses and of female costume dangled from the shrubbery or lay scattered about, and among these, here and there on every hand, for at least a mile in the direction of the road, by two miles east and west, there gleamed, bleached white by the weather, the skulls and other bones of those who had suffered. A glance into the wagon, when all these had been collected, revealed a sight which never can be forgotten. The remains were subsequently gathered together by Major Carleton, the united states commissioner who erected over them a large cairn of stones surmounted by a cross of red cedar with an inscription thereon vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord and on a stone beneath were engraved the words here one hundred twenty men women and children were massacred in cold blood early in september eighteen fifty seven they were from arkansas it is said that this monument was subsequently destroyed by the order of brigham young when he visited that part of the territory the little children while their parents were being butchered had clung about their murderers knees entreating mercy but none of them finding it save those who were little more than infants their fears and cries the night after the murder are said to have been heart-rending one little babe just beginning to walk was shot through the arm another girl was shot through the ear and the clothes of most of them were saturated with their mother's blood they were distributed among the people of the settlements and when finally the government took them under the protection of the nation the people among whom these little ones lived actually charged for their boarding two of them are said to have uttered some words from which it was presumed that their intelligence was in advance of their years. They were taken out quietly and buried. This happened some time after the massacre. Most of the property of the emigrants was sold by public auction in Cedar City. The Indians got most of the flour and ammunition, and the Mormons the more valuable articles. They jested over it and called it spoil taken at the siege of Sevastopol. There is legal proof that the clothing stripped from the corpses, blood-stained, riddled by the bullets, and with shreds of flesh attached to it, was placed in the cellar of the tithing office, where it lay about three weeks, when it was privately sold. The cellar is said to have smelt of it for years. Long after this time, jewelry torn from the mangled bodies of the unfortunate women was publicly worn in salt lake city and every one knew whence it came a tithing of it all is reported upon very conclusive evidence to have been laid at the feet of brigham young this is the story most imperfectly told 
for I dare not sketch its foulest details, of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Brigham Young, who was at the time governor of the territory, and also Indian agent, made no report of the matter. Let that fact of itself speak for his innocence or guilt. Would any other governor or agent in another territory have been thus silent? John D. Lee and Dame and Haight and the other wretches have never been brought to trial or cut off from the church, although their monstrous crime has never been a secret, nor have any endeavors been made to conceal it. This fearful deed was one of the unavoidable results of the teachings of the Mormon leaders during the Reformation. There were crimes then perpetrated in secret, which will never be known until the day of doom, and there were horrors which have been known and recorded, but for which no one has been brought to trial or has suffered inconvenience. There are men in Salt Lake City who walk about unblushingly in broad daylight, but who are known to be murderers, and whose hands have been again and again dyed with blood under circumstances of the most atrocious cruelty. There was one cruel murder, but by no means the worst, which came under my own personal observation, and which I have alluded to elsewhere. The murder of Dr. John King Robinson in Salt Lake City, which attracted more than ordinary attention. This gentleman was a physician of good standing, who came out as assistant surgeon with the United States Army, and afterwards began to practice in Salt Lake City. He was known as a man of unimpeachable moral character, and there are to this day hundreds of responsible people who would testify to his fair fame and rectitude, although he had by some means incurred the dislike of many of the Mormon leaders. He formed the idea of taking possession of some warm springs on the north of the city, and proposed to erect their baths, an hospital, etc., a small wooden shanty was erected for the purpose of holding possession, but the city authorities claimed the spring, and after some very unpleasant proceedings, the matter was referred to the law courts, and Judge Titus decided against the doctor. After this verdict had been rendered, Dr. Robinson seems to have acted very prudently, and to have remained indoors as much as possible during the succeeding days. Between eleven and twelve o'clock on the night of the third day, however, after the family had retired to rest, a man called at the house, and stating that his brother had broken his leg by a fall from a mule, and was suffering very much, he, after some earnest persuasion, induced the doctor to accompany him. Anxious as he might be to remain indoors at such a time, no professional man would refuse to perform an act of mercy. He accordingly went. At a distance of about a couple of hundred steps from the house, he was struck over the head with some sharp instrument, and immediately after shot through the brain. His wife, a young girl to whom he had only been married a very short time, heard the report of the pistol, and witnesses saw men fleeing from the spot. The police were sent for, and the body was carried to Independence Hall, and afterwards to the victim's house. The mayor of the city was not informed of the murder until ten o'clock the next day, and the chief of police, who was sitting round the fire with his men when news of the murder arrived, went to bed immediately, and did not visit the sign of the outrage for three days. The following Sunday Brigham Young, in the tabernacle, publicly suggested that the doctor had probably been murdered by some of the soldiers from Camp Douglas, who were dissatisfied with his treatment when they were under his hands, or else that he had fallen in some gambling transaction. Both of which statements, however, were known by everyone present to be utterly false. No one was ever punished for this cruel murder. This murder did not occur during the Reformation, but it was the natural result of the teachings of those times. I simply mention these facts without any comment of my own. Let the reader form his own conclusion. More of these frightful stories I do not care to relate, and I should not even have presented these to the notice of the reader, had it not been impossible otherwise to give any suitable idea of that terrible reformation. 
the Gentile army came in. The Union Pacific Railroad was opened. Changes and chances altered all that had been, and brought into being that which might be, and that which finally really was. Instead of looking to the events of three or four thousand years ago, men began to act up to things which were, to think and act in the present, not to dream of the past. The day has gone by, but not far, when the perpetration openly of such deeds was possible. But it is still boasted that when Deseret becomes a state, the saints will shew still greater zeal for the Lord. End of chapter 23「Ways and Works of the Saints – The Prophet's Millinery Bill » When I arrived in Utah I found that nearly all the elders with whom I had formerly been acquainted had more than one wife there. Many of these brethren called to see me and kindly insisted that I should visit their families, but this I felt was almost an impossibility. My whole nature rebelled at the thought of visiting where there were several wives, for in defiance of all the teaching that I had listened to, and the tyranny to which we had submitted, human nature would assert itself, and my womanly instincts revolted against the system. I could not endure the thought of visiting those families in company with my husband. I thought that perhaps sometimes I might venture alone, but, oh, not with him, no, not with him. It was bad enough, and humiliating enough for me to witness by myself the degradation of my sex, but to do so in the presence of my husband was more than I could calmly contemplate. I knew that I should not be able to control myself, and probably say some very unpleasant things which I should afterwards regret, for I so thoroughly loathed even the idea of polygamy at that time that I was filled with a desire to let everyone know and understand just what my feelings were on the subject. I had left New York against my will, although I had not openly rebelled. I had never reproached my husband about it, for I felt that his lot was irrevocably cast with the Mormons. I knew that when I married him, and it was of no use now for me to repine. I must go on to the end. There was no help for me. The journey across the plains, and all the discoveries which I had made, had not tended to soothe my rebellious heart, and I am not quite sure that I did not sow by the way a little discontent among the sisters. The idea, however, that such was the case did not, I must admit, fill me with much repentance. To my husband I had said very little, but I think he would bear me witness that what I did say was said effectively. Now, when I was brought face to face with practical polygamy, and could observe it in its most repulsive phases, I hated it more than ever. One day, not long after our arrival, as we were taking a walk together, I saw across the road a man gesticulating after an eccentric fashion and beckoning to us. Mr. Stenhouse said, That is Brother Heber C. Kimball, and I looked again with interest to see what that celebrated apostle was like. I had both heard and read a great deal about Brother Heber, and what I had learned was not at all of a character to impress me favorably. He had been so severe in his denunciation of every woman who dared to oppose polygamy. On the present occasion his conduct was, I thought, anything but gentlemanly, and when we crossed the road to him, which, on account of his position in the church, next to Brigham himself, we, of course, were compelled to do. My face must have betrayed my feelings, I am sure, for almost his first words after shaking hands were, "'Have you got the blues?' My answer was ready in a moment. I have had nothing else ever since I came here. Well, he replied, it is time that you should get rid of them, 
and i am going to talk to you some day soon for i rather like your looks i did not like his looks much however nor was i at all pleased with his manner i do not say that i was altogether without blame in feeling thus for i was prejudiced of course i was prejudiced from the first moment when i heard that polygamy was a doctrine of the church i was predisposed to be dissatisfied with everything i was henceforth not myself for the terrible apprehension of my own fate in the celestial order had changed my whole nature and that change of itself was a great source of grief to me i keenly realized that i was no longer the light-hearted pleasant companion to my husband that i had been and many a time and oft i wished for his sake that i could die for i felt that i never could be happy in mormonism again how many times i have knelt by my husband's couch when he was unconscious of it and have wept bitter tears of sorrow earnestly praying to the lord to subdue my rebellious heart and if it were necessary rather than i should be a continual annoyance to my husband whom i loved with all my soul that every particle of love in my heart should be withered so that i might perchance be able at least to do my duty i fully realized that in polygamy there could be no real love and while my affections were still placed upon my husband it was torture to live in a community where i was compelled to listen to the counsels which were given to him day after day regardless of my presence to take another wife i was too proud to notice any ordinary allusion that was made to the subject before me but when the conversation was turned in that direction by those who professed to be sincere friends and to entertain a kindly interest in my welfare i was compelled to listen and reply in my unhappy condition i thought that perhaps i might derive some consolation from the sermons in the tabernacle something that might shed a softer light upon my rugged pathway but instead of obtaining consolation i heard that which aroused every feeling of my soul to rebellion and kindled again within me the indignation which i had been so long struggling to conquer i heard that woman was an inferior being designed by the lord for the especial glory and exaltation of man that she was a creature that should feel herself honored if he would only make her the mother of his children a creature who if very obedient and faithful through all the trials and tribulations in life might some day be rewarded by becoming one of her husband's queens but should even then only shine by virtue of the reflected light derived from the glory of her spouse and lord he was to be her saviour for he was all in all to her and it was through him alone and at his will that she could obtain salvation we were informed that man was the crowning glory of creation for whom all things woman included were brought into being and that the chief object of woman's existence was to help man to his great destiny not a sentence indeed not a word did we ever hear as to the possibility of womanly perfection and exaltation in her own right and not only so but as if this were not enough to crush all ambition out of our souls we were instructed in some new views of marriage the great object of marriage we were told was the increase of children those diviner objects the companionship of soul the devotion of a refined and pure affection the indissoluble union of two existences were never presented to the yearning hearts of those poor women who listened to the miserable harangues of the tabernacle such aspirations had nothing to do with the hard cruel facts of their life in polygamy and this i found was how the women of utah were spiritually sustained seldom indeed was taught anything better but frequently much that was worse if nature asserting its right to a full return of love should manifest itself and inspire some of those poor wives to rebel against the lives which they were compelled to lead in polygamy 
then it would be said in the language of the tabernacle that the women were filled with the devil and that unless they repented speedily apostatize and go to hell an assurance which was scarcely necessary for many of those poor souls were enduring as much as if they were there already or if some woman was found objecting to polygamy on account of its crushing and degrading effects upon women generally then as i just said she was told in the coarse language of brigham young himself that such women had no business to complain it was quite enough honor for them to be permitted to bear children to god's holy priesthood i found therefore that the sermons in the tabernacle were not calculated to help me much spiritually i had neither friend nor counsellor on earth to whom i could turn for help my god alone remained to me but ah how different were my ideas of god then from those which i entertained before and since once i could look upon the beauties of nature and the varied experiences of human life and while my soul was lifted up with devotion and gratitude i could see the loving hand of my heavenly father in everything around me now there was neither light nor beauty before my eyes all was dark and dreary there was nothing to draw away my heart from such sad thoughts as these it was painfully clear to my understanding then as now that in mormonism woman was to lose her personal identity all that christianity had done to elevate her was to be ruthlessly set aside and trampled under foot and she was instantly to return to the position which she occupied in the darkest ages of the world's existence i had at that time the daily and hourly cares of a family devolving upon me and had not therefore much leisure to spend in visiting my friends even if i had desired to do so notwithstanding that however i had abundant opportunities of observation and thus my experience of mormonism and polygamy in utah is much the same as that of any mormon woman of ordinary sense i only tell what others could relate if they had the inclination to do so it was not possible for me to live in salt lake city without being brought face to face with polygamy in some shape or other every day of my life had it been otherwise and if remaining at home would have kept it from my view i probably never should have had the courage to enter a house where it was practiced to those who know nothing of that degrading system this may seem rather an exaggeration of feeling and yet even at that early day i had seen so much of the folly and weakness of the mormon brethren both in london and new york before we went to utah and had witnessed so many evil results of their teachings that it was with the greatest difficulty that i could control my feelings sufficiently to call upon any family where there was more than one wife and yet what i knew then was nothing in comparison to what i afterwards witnessed yes that i myself endured during the winter although i visited very little i attended a good many parties at the social hall but i did so more from a wish to be agreeable to my husband than from any pleasure that they afforded me for life had lost its charm to me and i was not happy how many times have i gazed wistfully at those lofty mountains which surround the city and felt that they were indeed my prison walls how bitterly have i realized that i should never be able to go beyond them but in a new country with a family to provide for a mother has not much time to waste in pining even if it be for liberty itself and i would willingly draw the veil over that portion of my life as my husband had been on mission for so many years and had spent all his time in the service of the church with the exception of a few brief months before we left new york when he was engaged on the staff of the new york herald i naturally enough thought that when we reached zion his occupation would be gone there would be no need of preaching to the saints on the contrary they would be able to teach us and we should have to find out what we could do in this new country to support ourselves and our children 
in this i was not mistaken now among the absolutely necessary things which i had brought with me from new york there were about three hundred dollars worth of millinery goods which i had secreted among our other properties thinking that they would very probably come in useful to the fair daughters of zion notwithstanding that the elders had told me of fiery sermons delivered by the prophet himself condemning all feminine display and that the sisters would scorn to wear gentile fashions i knew my own sex too well to believe that all this was strictly true and i felt certain that i should find even among the saints some weak sisters who would appreciate my thoughtfulness in bringing such articles for their use i had also noticed that the american elders themselves would frequently inquire where they could buy the best gloves and the prettiest ribbons and laces and that looked a little suspicious quite a number of such articles therefore found their way into my list of absolute necessaries and i know that my husband was secretly quite at a loss to know what had become of a certain sum of money which he was aware i had obtained from the sale of some of our things in new york but my foresight in this instance was very useful to us when we arrived in zion one day when mr stenhouse was absent seeking employment i thought i would make a display of my treasures and surprise him on his return accordingly with the assistance of our faithful domestic whom i had brought with me across the plains and who had also lived with me in switzerland we contrived to place two or three planks in such a way as to make a rough table on which to display the goods i had been secretly at work for about two weeks trimming the bonnets and hats and making a number of head-dresses such as were worn in new york when we left and although we had been three months on the plains and quite a month in utah yet those bonnets and head-dresses were of the very latest style to the ladies of salt lake city my swiss girl was quite a carpenter and when my temporary table was arranged i placed a pretty looking cloth over it to hide its defects and then began to arrange the various articles i found that i had a much finer assortment than i had imagined for i had bought them at different times and had packed them away hurriedly lest mr stenhouse or some of the other elders for there were generally two in the house should object to my taking them when my table was filled and i found that i had still more to display i was very much pleased for i saw in my hats and bonnets flour meat and potatoes for my children and i felt hopeful for one of the sisters had assured me that i should be certain to sell them the next thing to do was to advertise my stock after some reflection i remembered another of the sisters who was quite a good talker and who felt very kindly towards me i had known her in england she had been in utah about three years and her husband had by that time been blessed with two other wives she used to say that she had no patience with a set of grumbling women who did not know what was good for them i do not think that the blessedness enjoyed by her husband was shared by the two wives for more forlorn-looking women i never saw my husband however told me that this was none of my business and i believed him of course after the fashion of all good wives but to return this good sister besides being an excellent talker had really nothing else to do besides visiting her neighbors for the other wives now took entire charge of all the household duties so i made her a present of a new bonnet as i knew that then in two days my goods would be quite sufficiently advertised and in this i was not mistaken almost the first visitors who called to see me were a lady and her daughter i talked freely to her and answered her enquiries and she told me that she herself had had some experience in the business in salt lake city she said i think you will not be able to sell those goods they are too fashionable for the people here 
and there is no encouragement given to anyone in this business. I am afraid you will be disappointed. I believed every word she said, and felt all my airy, hopeful castles begin to crumble away. Before she left, however, she very kindly offered to purchase all my goods at a low figure, and thus relieve me of the anxiety and trouble of selling them. But I had had a little experience in the world, although probably I appeared to her somewhat innocent, and I thought that if she could sell them, there was a chance at least that I also might be able to do so. At any rate, I resolved to try, and I told her so when she left me with many kind wishes for my success. But what she had said during her visit had chilled my enthusiasm, and I pictured all my pretty, newly made articles becoming soiled and faded, with no one to buy them, while the little ones, barefooted, like so many children in Utah then, were running about crying for bread which I could not buy them. I felt bad, and, if I must confess it, I sat down and had a good cry. Just at that moment I heard a knock at the door, and, hastily drying my eyes, I opened it, and there stood my talkative friend. "'Stop crying!' she exclaimed. "'What is the matter, my dear? Oh, do stop crying. I don't like crying women. We see so many of them among the saints of God that it is really a shame and a disgrace. Tell me, what is the matter? Has your husband got another wife, or are you afraid that he won't be able to get one? Come, tell me.' All this was uttered in a breath, and without the possibility of my putting in a word by way of reply or remonstrance. At last I told her that I had just had a visit from one of the sisters and her daughter, whom I described. I know, she said, I met her as I was coming here. Do you know who she is? No, I replied, I do not think she told me her name. She simply came to look at my goods. And did she tell you that they would sell well, and that they are the best investment that you could have made? Quite the contrary, I said. She discouraged me so much that I could not help shedding tears. Well, now, she answered, that was Mrs. C., one of our milliners here. And you suppose she was going to encourage you to set up an opposition shop, do you? If you do, why, you've got something yet to learn. Indeed, I felt that I had got a great deal to learn. Now I have come to tell you quite a different story, she said. This very afternoon you will have at least a dozen ladies here, and ladies too, who have got the money to pay for what they have, and who won't pay you in salt chips and whetstones. Do they ever pay in such things? I inquired. Why, certainly they do. That is the kind of pay that the good saints generally expect their poor brethren and sisters to be satisfied with and to feed their hungry children upon. But I say that this is wrong, not that I want to set myself up as a judge in Zion, or that I should criticize the actions of the brethren. God forbid, but when I see the rich brethren grinding the faces of the poor in that way, why I say that it is wrong. But you must not take any such pay as that. You may not always get money, but you can at least get flour, potatoes, and molasses. Now I tell you that you are going to sell every article that you have got, and I shall take pleasure in recommending you and talking about it. Why, I've been to about two score people already. But there, I see your husband coming, and I must go. My husband indeed was there. He was not very fond of my talkative friend and passed her by with a polite salutation only. But when he saw what I had been doing, the light dawned upon his mind. He no longer wondered what had become of the dollars in New York, and, astonished at my success, he congratulated me upon the good use to which I had put them. After this interview I felt quite encouraged, and I very soon found that my friend's predictions were correct. I had no difficulty in selling, and I created quite a little business, although we lived a considerable distance from Main Street, and what with my efforts and some employment which my husband obtained, 
we contrived to get through our first winter in Salt Lake City. But I anticipate. One day my husband informed me that there was a house about to be vacated shortly, and that Brigham Young had told him we had better take it. It was pleasantly situated near the tabernacle, and as houses then were, it was quite a desirable residence. We had it thoroughly cleaned, and then moved in. When I arrived in the evening I found that Mr. Stenhouse, with the assistance of our faithful Swiss girl, had arranged everything as the goods arrived from the other house, and the place looked so clean, and there was such a bright fire burning that I felt that we now really had something like a home, and my heart was filled with gratitude. Soon after our establishment in our new home, Brigham sent for me and asked me to make a handsome bonnet for his then favorite wife, Emmeline. He left it entirely to my taste. I was to make just what I pleased, so that it suited her and gave satisfaction. I made my bonnet, and when I presented it, Brigham Young was so pleased that he immediately gave me an order to make one for each of his wives. I was very much pleased at this, for we needed furniture and many other necessaries very badly, and I thought that this would enable me to get them. I expected, of course, that my account would be paid in money, for I did not suppose that the prophet of the Lord would offer me chips or whetstones. He could afford to pay cash, and of course would do so. He had furnished me with some material out of his own store for Brigham Young had a dry goods and grocery store of his own at that time, and I was to furnish the remainder. It was very little indeed that he supplied, and therefore my account was likely to amount to a considerable sum, for almost every wife had at least one bonnet which she wished made over with new trimmings besides the new one. I worked constantly for three weeks with the assistance of two girls, to each of whom I paid six dollars a week besides board. This was a difficult thing for me to do at that time in Utah, for money was seldom seen there then, but I was rejoicing in the prospect of the comfortable new furniture which I should have when it was all done. Furniture at that time was very expensive. There was nothing better than white pine articles, stained or painted. The commonest kind of wooden rocking chair cost fifteen dollars, and common painted wooden chairs were six dollars apiece, with everything else in proportion. This being our first winter, we had not been able to get much, and I thought I would devote the proceeds of the work I was doing for Brigham to fitting up the house a little and with what I earned from my other customers I contrived to pay my help so as to have all the rest clear. All was completed, and great satisfaction expressed at the result of my labors. So I asked my husband to present my account, and if possible get it settled. It amounted to about two hundred and seventy-five dollars, although I had dealt very liberally with the profit and had charged for the goods but little more than they cost me. When he returned, I hastened to meet him, for I had partly selected the furniture, and I wanted to go and purchase it. But I was like poor Perrette, the milkmaid, who counted her chickens a little too soon, for Mr. Stenhouse told me that Brother Brigham had given orders that the amount should be credited to us for tithing. What a shock this was to me, for that sum, small as it may appear, was my whole fortune at the time, and it was gone at one sweep. Can it be possible, I said, that he can be so mean as that? Where can his conscience be, or has he any, to deprive me of my hard earnings in this way? He shall not do it. I will make him pay me. My indignation was so great that I did not reflect how imprudent I was to talk thus of the prophet of the Lord. But my husband said, What can you do? You can do nothing but submit. Let us try to forget it, 
or if not it will perhaps be a lesson to us but i did not forget it and never could although i tried very hard and when many months had passed and i no longer suffered from the effects of my loss i still remembered it and i always shall remember the way in which brigham paid for his wife's bonnets End of chapter 24「Mysteries of the Endowment House, Fearful Oaths, and Secret Ceremonies » Not many weeks after our arrival in Salt Lake City, my husband told me that we might now enjoy the privilege of going through the Endowment House. This was intended as a great favor to us on the part of the authorities, for most people have to wait a long while before receiving their endowments. But my husband's influence and position in the church was, I presume, the reason why we were admitted so soon. Now I had heard so much of the endowments and the endowment house that I quite dreaded to pass through this ordeal. The idea of the whole ceremony was that thereby we should receive the special grace of God, be united, man and woman, making one perfect creature, receive our inheritance as children of God, and in fact be made partakers of the plentitude of every blessing. All this sounds very well as a statement, but it is only the statement which would be made from the ideal Mormon standpoint. I had heard other things about the endowments which did not present such a favorable impression, and although I do not wish to record all the absurd stories which were, and are, current among the Gentiles, I think it only right that I should state what my own views were before we received our privileges. Joseph Smith the prophet and very many of his early associates belonged to the ancient and honorable order of Freemasons. When he was initiated into the mysteries of that society, and what position he attained therein, I do not know. But one thing is certain, that when he, under the influence of his own peculiar religious fanaticism, endeavored to engraft upon Freemasonry some of the leading ideas of the new religion, he and those connected with him were publicly disavowed by the lodges in the West. I cannot without some trouble here give any documentary evidence, but I may be permitted, perhaps, to state that I have myself seen newspapers of that period, and the West then was a very primitive country, which contained formal official declarations, duly signed by respectable persons, stating that Joseph Smith and others were no longer to be considered in fellowship with any of the Western lodges. The idea of a bond of brotherhood, secret and indissoluble, seems ever to have been present in Joseph's mind. Whether the germ of this idea was derived from masonry or not is of little moment. Gentlemen who certainly ought to know have assured me that such a notion was altogether ridiculous, but of that, as a lady, I am, of course, not competent to judge. It is, however, quite clear that the clannish or fraternal spirit among the Mormons has always preeminently distinguished them, and is just as noticeable at the present day as it was in Joseph's time. It has always been commonly reported, and to a great extent believed, that the mysteries of the endowment house were only a sort of imitation, burlesque it might be, of the rites of masonry but I need hardly say that this statement, when examined by the light of facts, is altogether ungrounded and absurd, as the reader will presently perceive. Still, the notion that some deeply mysterious ceremony was celebrated by the initiated has always possessed a charm to the Gentile, as well as Mormon minds, and the most extravagant statements have been made in reference to the endowment house. In fact, to such an extent has this been the case, 
that most if not all of the saints who have passed through the house have looked forward to the period of their initiation as a most impressive and painful ordeal and the influence of this feeling i myself fully realized i knew well that no marriage was considered binding unless it had been celebrated in that place i knew that the saints however long they might have been wedded were under the necessity of being reunited there before they could be considered lawfully married and their children legitimate according to the highest mormon authority no marriage is valid unless the ceremony is performed in the temple the temple is not yet built and as joseph the prophet said no fellow can be damned for doing the best he knows how the saints meanwhile do the next best thing and are married in the endowment house i knew that there and then the faithful were said to be endowed with their heavenly inheritance i saw how absolutely needful it was that my husband and myself should become partakers of those mysteries but i was influenced by the strange stories which i had heard of unhallowed and shameful doings in that same endowment house and consequently i feared to enter in my fears were not however altogether groundless or visionary it has been whispered falsely perhaps that in the endowment house scenes have been enacted so fearful that words would falter on the lips of those who told the tale concerning them i have heard of such things from men of integrity and honor but they were not eyewitnesses of what they related and they could not or would not give me their authorities one thing i am certain of if such horrible deeds were ever perpetrated within those walls there remains no living witness to testify of them the lips who alone could tell the whole truth are sealed in silence which the trump of doom alone shall break when i refer the reader to what i have already spoken of the blood atonement and of the reformation i think that that plain statement of facts renders it clear to any ordinary intelligence that if in the endowment house no such deeds of darkness were ever perpetrated it was not because such things were contrary to the spirit of mormonism as taught by brigham young and the apostles nor was it because such things had never been done with the full approbation of the leaders of the church but on account of some accidental reason into which it is needless to inquire it was of course no fear of any personal violence or any painful disclosures in that respect that made me reluctant to receive my endowments for at that time i was by profession apparently a good mormon if i had my doubts and misgivings i had them in common with nine-tenths of the mormon women and had therefore nothing to fear the true cause of my reluctance was of a more delicate and personal nature i had been informed that if i refused to go my husband could not go alone he would be compelled to take another wife and go with her this was not all i found that it was quite common for the elders to take a second wife when they took their first endowments and thus as they coarsely expressed it kill two birds with one stone moreover i had heard of men who feared to introduce polygamy into their households presenting to their wives while going through the house a young girl as their intended bride feeling sure that the wife would not dare to make a scene before the assembly how could i know that my husband also had not such an idea in his mind true i trusted him implicitly and did not believe it was possible that he could deceive me but had not men who were universally known for their integrity and honor acted in the same way to their wives and so with so many evidences of the best and most honest natures being corrupted by the unrighteous teachings of their religion could i be blamed for doubting him whom i loved best wives out of utah doubt their own husbands and very frequently have the best of reasons for doing so but what woman other than a mormon 
ever lived in constant dread that her husband who she knew was devotedly attached to her would do to her the cruelest wrong that man can inflict and woman can endure for the sake of his religion and in the holy saviour's name my mind was agitated by conflicting thoughts sometimes fear and apprehension sometimes indignation and hatred would make me perfectly reckless then love to my husband and thoughts of our little ones calmed my troubled mind and i was tranquil until excited by some injury which i witnessed when once more brooding over the cruel wrongs which in god's name had been inflicted upon the women of utah my anger would revive again there was also another reason why i particularly objected to passing through the endowment house i had been told many strange and revolting stories about the ceremonies which were there performed for it is said that in the nauvoo temple the most disgraceful things were done about what was done at nauvoo i can say nothing as it was before my time but still it is only fair to say that people who in every other relation in life i should have deemed most reliable and trustworthy were my informants respecting those strange stories of the endowments in utah i can of course speak more positively as i myself passed through them and i wish to say most distinctly that although the initiation of the saints into the kingdom appears now to my mind as a piece of the most ridiculous absurdity there was nevertheless nothing in it indecent or immoral of which the reader himself shall presently be the judge it is an invariable rule among the mormons as i have before intimated for every man or woman to mind his or her own business and nothing else in this respect they certainly present a good example to the gentile world thus it was that until i myself went through endowments i was totally ignorant of what they were although of course so many people with whom i had daily intercourse could so easily have enlightened me if they had been thus minded with apostates i of course had nothing to do and had it been otherwise it is most probable that they would have been so much ashamed of the folly of the whole performance that they would not have spoken explicitly about it besides this every mormon's mouth was closed by the oath of that same endowment house the penalty of breaking which was death a penalty which no one doubted would be sternly enforced thus totally in the dark and remembering only the strange stories about washings and anointings and an imitation of the garden of eden with adam and eve clothed in their own innocence alone it can be no wonder that any modest woman should wish to evade all participation in such scenes i spoke to my husband about it and he tried to reassure me but what he said had rather a contrary effect before we left england when speaking of these ceremonies my husband told me that they were simply a privilege and a matter of choice but what a choice i might go or refuse to go but if i refused he must if he went through at all take another wife in my place and as i knew there would be no difficulty in finding one i should in consequence be known as a rebellious woman annoyance and indignity would be heaped upon me while within my own house i should be compelled to occupy the position of second wife as the one who is married first in the endowment house is considered the first wife and has the control of everything my husband told me that now he was most anxious to go he had already been notified three times that such was his privilege and there were he said good reasons why we ought gladly to accept the opportunity it was an honor he said for which many people had waited for years my husband reminded me that we had been married by a gentile and while living among the gentiles and that as i said before our marriage was not valid and our children were not legitimate only those children of ours who were born after the ceremony in the endowment house would be legitimate 
the others were outcasts from the kingdom unless we adopted them after our initiation and thus made them heirs in any case poor children they could never be considered the real heirs they could only be heirs by adoption so i agreed to go trying to persuade myself that it was a sacred duty for although my faith in mormonism had been roughly shaken i still believed that its origin was divine as we had been but a few weeks in utah we had not prepared our temple garments not thinking that we should be called upon so soon to go through we had therefore to borrow as most people do for the occasion the temple robe which is a long loose flowing garment made of white linen or bleached muslin and reaching to the ankle had been placed upon us just before we took the oaths it was gathered to a band about twelve inches long which rested on the right shoulder passed across the breast and came together under the left arm and was then fastened by a linen belt this leaves the left arm entirely free the veil consists of a large square of swiss muslin gathered in one corner so as to form a sort of cap to fit the head the remainder falls down as a veil the men wear the same kind of undergarment as the women and their robes are the same but their head dress is a round piece of linen drawn up with a string and a bow in front something after the fashion of a scotch cap all good mormons after they have received their first endowments get whole suits of temple robes made on purpose for them so they may be ready for use at any time when they are needed all marriages in the endowment house are performed in these robes and in them all saints who have received their endowments are buried besides our robes we were instructed to take with us a bottle of the best olive oil at seven o'clock in the morning of the day appointed we presented ourselves at the door of the endowment house and were admitted by brother lyon the mormon poet everything within was beautifully neat and clean and a solemn silence pervaded the whole place the only sound that could be heard was the splashing of water but whence the sound proceeded we could not see in spite of myself a feeling of dread and uncertainty respecting what i had to go through would steal over my mind and i earnestly wished that the day was over we waited patiently for a little while and presently a man entered and seated himself at a table placed there for that purpose upon which was a large book he opened the book and then calling each person in turn he took their names and ages and the names of their fathers and mothers and carefully entered each particular in the book our bottles of oil were then taken from us and we were supposed to be ready for the ceremony first we were told to take off our shoes and leave them in the ante-room and then to take up our bundles and pass into another room beyond this was a large bathroom which was divided down the middle by a curtain of heavy material placed there for the purpose of separating the men from the women here my husband left me he going to the men's and i to the women's division in the bathroom there were two or three large bathing tubs supplied by streams of hot and cold water we were as much concealed from the men as if we had been in an entirely separate room and everything was very quiet and orderly miss eliza r snow the poetess and a mrs whitney were the officiating attendants on that occasion the former conducted me to one of the bathing tubs and placing me in it she proceeded to wash me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet as she did this she repeated various formulas to the effect that i was now washed clean from the blood of this generation and should never if i remained faithful be partaker in the plagues and miseries which were about to come upon the earth 
when i had thus been washed clean she wiped me dry and then taking a large horn filled with the olive oil which we had brought she anointed me the oil was poured from the horn by mrs whitney into the hand of eliza snow who then applied it to me the horn was said to be the horn of plenty which like the widow's cruise of oil would never fail as long as the ordinance should continue to be administered in addition to the crown of my head my eyes ears and mouth were also anointed my eyes that they might be quick to see my ears that they might be apt at hearing and my mouth that i might with wisdom speak the words of eternal life she also anointed my feet that they might be swift to run in the ways of the lord i was then given a certain garment to put on now this garment is one peculiar to the mormon people it is made so as to envelop the whole body and it is worn night and day i was told that after having once put it on i must never wholly take it off before putting on another but that i should change one half at a time and that if i did so i should be protected from disease and even from death itself for the bullet of an enemy would not penetrate that garment and that from it even the dagger's point should be turned aside it has been said that the prophet joseph carelessly left off this peculiar garment on the day of his death and that had he not done so the rifles of his assassins would have been harmless against him when thus arrayed i proceeded to put on a white night-dress and skirt stockings and white linen shoes a new name was then whispered into my ear which i was told i must never mention to any living soul except my husband in the endowment house this name was taken from the bible and i was given to understand that it would be the name whereby i should be admitted into the celestial kingdom this was of course very gratifying a circumstance however occurred which took from me all the pride which might have been mine in the possession of a new name there was among our number a deaf woman mrs whitney had to tell her her name once or twice over loud enough for me to hear and thus i found that her new name as well as mine was sarah to make the matter worse another sister whispered why that is my name too this entirely dispelled any enthusiasm which otherwise i might have felt i could well understand that i might yet become a sarah in israel but if we were all sarahs there would not be much distinction or honor in being called by that name as a matter of course i supposed that the men would all become abrahams our washing and anointing being now over we were ready for the initiation there were fifteen couples in all a voice from behind the curtain asked miss snow if we were ready and was answered in the affirmative we were then arranged in a row the curtain was drawn aside and we stood face to face with the men who had of course on their side of the curtain been put through the same ordeal i felt dreadfully nervous for i did not know what was coming next and i could not quite dismiss from my mind the stories that i had heard about these mysteries but in spite of my nervousness curiosity was strong in me at that moment as it was i suppose in the others for as soon as the curtain was drawn aside we all cast our eyes in the direction of the men they as might be expected were looking in our direction and when i beheld them i must say that my sympathies were drawn out towards the poor creatures however little vanity or personal pride they possessed they must have felt it unpleasant to have to appear in the presence of ladies in such a dress or rather undress and notwithstanding the solemn meaning of the ceremony there was just the ghost of a smile upon our faces as we looked at each other and dropped our eyes again to any one who did not feel as we did the religious nature of the initiation the scene must have appeared perfectly ludicrous in fact 
some of us felt it so one sister just as the curtain was drawn up and we came in full view of our lords cried out oh dear oh dear where shall i go what shall i do this as may be supposed caused a laugh which was of course immediately suppressed we could see how the men looked but of our own appearance we could not so easily judge certainly we must have looked anything but handsome in our white garments and with the oil trickling down our faces and into our eyes making them smart and look red there was nothing however for us to do but to submit quietly and make the best of it we could ashamed as i was i thought i might venture to look at my husband there could be no harm in that but when i saw his demure looking countenance and his efforts to keep his clothing in order i thought i should be compelled to laugh outright for i could see that his thoughts were more occupied about his personal appearance than with the solemnity of the occasion the men were all dressed in the same kind of garment as the women drawers and shirt all in one very much like those which are used for children to sleep in and over that an ordinary white shirt such as men always wear that with socks and white linen shoes completed their toilet clad after this interesting fashion we sat opposite to each other for several minutes and then my husband and myself were instructed to come forward and kneel at the altar while all the rest remained standing it is the custom thus to select two persons and we were either picked out by chance or it might be as my husband was thought a good deal of by the authorities that they considered he would feel honored by the preference suddenly a voice was heard speaking to some one who also replied this voice from the unseen was supposed to be the voice of elohim in conversation with jehovah and the words that were used were much the same as those contained in the first chapter of the book of genesis describing the creation of the world finally jehovah and elohim declare their intention to come down and visit the earth this they do and pronounce all that they behold very good but they declare that it is necessary that one of a higher order of intelligence than the brute creation should be placed in the world to govern and control all else michael the archangel is now called and he is placed upon the earth under the name of adam and power is given him over all the beasts of the field the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea moreover the fruits of the earth are all given to him for his sustenance and pleasure but he is strictly charged as in the bible story not to eat of one particular tree which stands in the midst of the garden this tree is represented by a small real evergreen and a few bunches of dried raisins are hung upon it as fruit it is now discovered that it is not good for man to be alone elohim and jehovah therefore hold another conversation upon that subject and they finally determine to give a companion to adam they therefore cause a deep sleep to fall upon michael or adam as he is now called and they prepare to operate upon him here we were all instructed to assume the attitude of deep sleep by dropping our heads upon our breasts elohim and jehovah then came down and go through the motions of removing a rib from the side of the sleeper which said rib appears immediately upon the scene in the person of eliza r snow elohim and jehovah are generally represented by two of the twelve apostles when brigham is present he plays a prominent part and now the devil makes his appearance in the person of w w phelps phelps used always to personate the devil in the endowments and the role suited him admirably he is dead now but whether it has made any difference in his status i cannot tell nor do i know who has succeeded him in his office 
the devil wears a very tight-fitting suit of black muslin with knee breeches and black stockings and slippers this dress had all the appearance of a theatrical costume and the man himself looked as much like one might imagine the devil would look as he possibly could he began by trying to scrape acquaintance with eve whom he meets while taking a walk in the garden the innocent unsuspecting woman is fascinated by his attentions father adam who seems to have had a touch of the mormon about him perhaps was not the most attentive of husbands or he may have fallen into the same error into which many of his sons have fallen since neglecting to pay the same attentions after marriage as he was wont to before and left his young wife to the mercy of the tempter however that may be satan and eve are soon discovered in conversation together and eve appears to be particularly pleased with satan at length he offers her some of the fruit of the forbidden tree and after some little demure she accepts it and eats thereof then the devil leaves her adam makes his appearance and eve persuades him also to eat of the fruit of the tree after this they make a dumb show of perceiving their condition and an apron of white linen is produced on which are sewn pieces of green silk in imitation of fig leaves and in these they both attire themselves then all the brethren and sisters produced similar aprons which they had brought with them on purpose and these they put on as adam and eve had already done elohim now appeared again and called adam but adam was afraid and hid himself in the garden with eve the curse was now pronounced upon the serpent the devil who reappears upon his hands and knees making a hissing noise as one might suppose a serpent would do we were then all driven out of the garden of eden into another room which represented the world and this ended the first degree we were now supposed to be out in the world earning our daily bread by the sweat of our brows and we were informed that although we had been driven out from the presence of the lord yet a plan of salvation would be devised for us by which we should be enabled to return to our first estate we were to wait patiently until this plan should be disclosed to us there was here such a mixture of persons and events that i could not exactly follow the idea that was intended to be conveyed if there was any idea at all men representing the ancient prophets entered and gave instructions to the people to prepare themselves for the first coming of our saviour upon the earth then we were taught certain passwords and grips and then we were all arranged in a circle the women covered their faces with their veils and we all kneeled down and with our right hands uplifted towards heaven we took the solemn oath of obedience and secrecy i myself made a movement with my hand for i believed that my life was at stake and i dared not do otherwise the words of the oath i did not utter we swore that by every means in our power we would seek to avenge the death of joseph smith the prophet upon the gentiles who had caused his murder and that we would teach our children to do so we swore that without murmuring or questioning we would implicitly obey the commands of the priesthood in everything we swore that we would not commit adultery which was explained to mean the taking of wives without the permission of the holy priesthood and we swore that we would never under any circumstances reveal that which transpired in the endowment house the penalty for breaking this oath which was worded in the most startling and impressive way was then explained to us the throat of the traitor was to be cut from ear to ear his heart and tongue were to be cut out and his bowels were while he was yet living to be torn from him in the world to come everlasting damnation would be his portion let not the reader think that this was merely an imaginary penalty 
or that it was expressed merely for the purpose of frightening the weak-minded for i have already shown that punishments quite as horrible as that have been deliberately meted out to the apostate the gentile and the suspected saint by the mormon priesthood the innocent blood which cries for vengeance against brigham young and some of the leaders of the church is sufficient to weigh the purest spirit which stands before the throne of god down to the nethermost abysses of hell after these fearful oaths had been taken with due solemnity we were instructed in the various signs representing those dreadful penalties and we were also given a grip peculiar to this degree we were next entertained by a long address from the apostle heber c kimball never in my life except from brigham young had i listened to such disgusting language and i trust i never shall be compelled to listen to anything like it again brother kimball always used to pride himself upon using plain language but that day i think he surpassed himself he seemed to take quite a pleasure in saying anything which could make us blush the subject of which he discoursed was the married life in the celestial order he also laid great stress upon the necessity of our keeping silence concerning all that we had witnessed in the endowment house even husbands to their wives and wives to their husbands were not to utter a single word with the sermon ended our second degree we were now taken to another room for the purpose of passing through the third degree of the order of the melchizedek priesthood when we were all arranged on one side against the wall a number of individuals entered who were supposed to represent the ministers of every denomination and religion upon the face of the earth the devil also makes his appearance again the ministers set forth the various claims of their respective creeds each one striving to show that his is the purest and the best but the devil sows division and hatred among them and a good deal of confusion ensues then came in personages representing peter james and john the apostles and they commanded ministers devil and all to depart they then appeared to organize a new church in which the true principles of the gospel were to be taught our temple robes were also all changed from the right shoulder to the left indicating that we were now in the true church and that we were to be absolutely and in every way dependent upon the priesthood another grip was then given to us and thus we received the third degree of the order of melchizedek priesthood in that room was a division made of bleached muslin in the division a door and in the door a hole with a lap of muslin over it through which to pass the hand whoever was on the other side could see us but we could not see them the men first approached this door a person representing the apostle peter appeared at the opening and demanded who was there he was told that someone desired to enter hands came through the opening in the muslin curtain and mysterious fingers cut a mark on the left breast of the men's shirts one mark also over the abdomen and one over the right knee which marks the women religiously imitated upon their own garments when they got home the applicant was then told to put his hand through the opening and give the last grip belonging to the third degree and mention his new name he was then permitted to enter this was called going beyond the veil when the men were all admitted the women were suffered to approach and were passed through by their own husbands when a woman has no husband she is passed through by one of the brethren and to those who are not going to be married or sealed for eternity here the ceremonies end now as i before stated according to mormon ideas we had never before been legally married it was therefore necessary that we should now pass through that ceremony 
we accordingly were conducted to a desk where our names were entered and we were then passed into another room in that room was a long low altar covered with red velvet and an armchair placed at one end of it in which sat brigham young my husband knelt at one side of the altar and i at the other with our hands clasped above it in the last grip which had been given to us then the ordinary formula of marriage was gone through with and we were informed that we were sealed for time and for eternity thus we passed through the mysteries of the endowment house and at three o'clock in the afternoon we found ourselves at liberty to return home the various ceremonies had occupied eight hours when we reached home my husband said well what do you think of the endowments but i did not dare to answer him truthfully at that time had i done so i should have told him that i was ashamed and disgusted never in all my life did i suffer such humiliation as i did that day for the whole time i was under the impression that those who officiated looked upon us as a set of silly dupes and i felt annoyed to think that i dared not tell them so so i told my husband that i would rather not speak about it and we never have spoken of it to this day what were his own feelings about the matter i do not know for mormon wives are taught never to pry into their husbands feelings or meddle with their actions but notwithstanding all my feelings in reference to the endowments so foolish was i that when i afterwards heard the brethren and sisters talking about the happiness which they had experienced while going through and saying how privileged we ought to feel at being in zion among the saints of god secure in his kingdom where we could bring up our children in the fear of the lord i began again to think that the fault was all in myself and that it was i who was wrong and not the endowments i wondered how with such a rebellious heart i should ever get salvation and i mourned to think that i had not accepted everything with the simplicity of a child some time after our initiation i met the apostle heber c kimball and he asked me how i felt upon the occasion i frankly told him all but added that i regretted feeling so he said i shall see if you cannot go through again it is not just the thing but i shall try and make the opportunity nothing more however was said about it but that which troubled me most was the fact that while the oaths were being administered i dropped my hand and inwardly vowed that i would never subscribe to such things and at the same time my heart was filled with bitter opposition this although i did it involuntarily my better nature rising within me and overcoming my superstition i thought at the time was sinful i now however rejoice that such was the case for not having actually vowed to keep secret those abominable oaths i can say without any cavil or equivocation that i have broken no promise and betrayed no trust by the discoveries which i have just made i wish distinctly to make this statement others have more or less divulged the oaths of the endowment house and have excused themselves with much doubtful sophistry i never really took the oaths although present and therefore no one can charge me with treachery at a later date some of the sisters kindly suggested that the spirit of the evil one had entered into me at that time but this was at least a very inconsistent statement for the mormons believe that no evil spirit can enter into the endowment house of one thing i am certain i was then indeed a miserable slave with no one to stretch forth a kindly hand and strike away the fetters of my mental degradation and lead me forth into light and liberty end of chapter twenty five
Chapter twenty six of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Secrets of Saintly Spouses A Visit from My Talkative Friend. Not long after I had received my endowments, my talkative friend, of whom I have already spoken, came to see me and to offer her congratulations. She was quite enthusiastic upon the subject, spoke of the honor which had been conferred upon us, and promised to call frequently to build me up. She was particularly anxious to learn whether I did not feel much better and happier now. On that point I could say little, for to have answered her truthfully would have provoked discussion, into which I did not care to enter. I knew, too, that anything I said to her would soon be known to everyone else, so I told her that I was feeling well enough. "'Well enough,' she said. "'Is that how you feel? Come now, I thought you would have got over all that when you had been through your endowments.' You remind me of what Brother Brigham says. We have so many whining women in Zion that it is quite a reproach. I do hope that you are not going to become one of them. Let me give you a bit of advice. The wisest thing you can do is to look out for another wife for your husband and get him to marry her. Oh my, I said, what are you talking about? You surely cannot be in earnest. I was never more earnest in my life, she answered. If you had persuaded your husband to take another wife when you went through your endowments, you would have got over all your troubles at one time. The anticipation is ten times worse than the reality. I do not see it in that light, I said. My own opinion is that my troubles in that case would only then have begun. I do not think that you yourself are really happy. "'Oh, nonsense!' she exclaimed. "'Why, you can see how happy I am. "'My husband has two other wives besides myself, "'and a more comfortable family could not be.' "'You never told me,' I said, "'how your husband managed to get those wives. "'I should like to hear.' "'My husband managed? "'Why, he did not manage at all. "'It was I who arranged everything for him.' and I'll tell you how it was done. During the Reformation, she continued, you of course know the men were constantly urged to take more wives, but my husband was rather backward, and used to tell me there was plenty of time and not the slightest occasion for him to be in a hurry. I had my own opinion of the matter, and did not agree with him, for, you see, I was afraid that, after all, he would pick up some young girl or other and fall in love with her, and all my plans would be disarranged. It is, you know, much the best for the first wife to look out for some girl who will look up to her and respect her, but not love her husband too much, and then they are likely to get on well together. If the first wife selects the other wives, it has the effect of showing them that the husband thinks much of her judgment and is willing to abide by it, and that they will have to do the same. This, of course, is as it should be, but if she lets her husband choose his own wife, he is almost certainly to take a fancy to someone whom the first wife does not like at all, and consequently her authority is undermined. The first wife ought to keep all the power in her own hands. Well, I said, I should not care much, I think, who ruled in my home if another wife was there. You think so now, she replied, but when you get used to polygamy you will feel quite otherwise. People get used to it, the women as well as the men, and then they leave off fretting and become less selfish. But I was going to tell you how I managed my husband. I was very anxious, as I told you, to find another wife for him, and I took into consideration all the suitable girls I knew. There was some objection to almost every one. Some were too pretty, and I knew I should detest them, and others were not good-looking, and those my husband could not bear. So I waited patiently, but did not give up the hope of succeeding eventually. At last I met with a girl who I thought would do. 
she was certainly not bad-looking but she was very young and i thought i should be able to manage her the name of this girl was alice maynard she was a neighbor of ours and one of a large family she seemed to me to be a quiet modest little creature and i knew that she had to work hard and received very little in return in fact she led at home a life of drudgery and even her very clothing bore witness to the poverty of the family her mother had often told me that she felt badly for alice for mr maynard had three other wives and it was more than he could do to support them all properly i called one day upon mrs maynard to broach the matter to her she received me very kindly and entered into my views at once she was anxious she said for alice to get married for then she would be better off i asked her how she would like her to marry my husband and told her that we were very comfortably off as you know we are and that my husband owned his house and lot and was doing a very good business and of course ought to take another wife would she agree to my proposal and let me mention alice to him she said she herself had no objection but that perhaps my husband might not like alice or alice might not like him i felt indignant at the idea that any girl should hesitate to marry my husband and i told sister maynard that there could not possibly be any hesitation on alice's part i'm sure i have no objection she said if alice has none i should only be too happy to see my child in a more comfortable home well then we'll consider the matter settled i said and asked if i could see alice so her mother called her in and i proposed to her for my husband you can guess perhaps how astonished i was when she actually laughed in my face and said she should like to consider the matter i did not however show her what i thought but assented to what she said and invited her to come and take tea with us my husband had often told me when i was teasing him about taking another wife that he would willingly marry any girl i might choose for him and I felt pleased at this, for it showed confidence in my judgment. So when he came in later in the day, I told him I had found a wife for him at last, and that I knew he would like her. Why, Anne, he said, I do believe you are going crazy over the wife question, but if you are, I do not want you to drive me crazy also. I really thought this was too bad, after all my trouble for him but nevertheless i was resolved that the marriage should take place three days after that in accordance with my invitation alice came to take tea with us and i fixed her up to look nice when she was ready i took her into the parlor to introduce her to my husband who was sitting there reading henry i said this is miss maynard the young lady of whom i spoke to you the other day he looked up from his paper and to my astonishment said why, Alice, my girl, how do you do? How are mother and father? What, I said, do you know Alice, Henry? Certainly I do, he answered. Alice and I have met many times before this, haven't we, Alice? Yes, sir, she said, and oh, so demurely. Why, Sister Stenhouse, I began to think that I had actually been deceived, and that while I had innocently supposed that I had found out the girl myself, it was the very one upon whom my husband had had his eye for a long while past. I watched them, however, very narrowly, for I was determined that if my husband had really taken a fancy for the girl, he should never have her. Why, that would have facilitated matters, would it not? I said. Do you think, she replied, that I would have allowed them to marry if they loved each other? no indeed the saints marry from principle and not from love as brother brigham has often told us i hope you believe me dear when i say that i'm not at all a jealous woman but if my husband dared to fall in love with a girl and to hide it from me i could not stand it i am sure no principle is the only thing there can be no love in polygamy if a man loved his wife do you think he could have the heart to pain her by taking another 
on the other hand it is because of the love which still remains in their hearts and which they weary themselves to crush out that so many of the first wives are miserable but i am going to tell you about alice i was mistaken in thinking that my husband had been paying her any attentions it appeared that he was acquainted with her father and mother and that at their house he had frequently seen the child alice but never supposed she was the miss maynard of whom i had spoken but now they had come together at last and she to him and really i sometimes almost thought that they wished to ignore me altogether i did not let them waste much time fussing with one another but they got on very rapidly nevertheless and before i had had time to arrange matters properly my husband told me that to please me he was going to marry alice only fancy me being pleased at him marrying alice why it wasn't to please myself that i introduced the child to him but simply because if he must have another wife it certainly was best for me to choose one whom i could manage however they were married not long after and really i think i never was more disgusted in my life than i was on that occasion i was not jealous but i do think he might have paid her a little less attention in fact i quite regretted when it was too late that i had ever brought them together the mormon men always do make themselves silly over their new wives and i did not expect my husband to be an exception to the rule but i was perfectly astonished at the change that took place in alice instead of the quiet modest girl she used to be she put on all sorts of airs and treated me as if i were not of the slightest consequence i couldn't stand that and i resolved if it were only to take the pride out of her i would get my husband to marry another wife still he wouldn't object i knew for he takes life very easily and he has a great respect for my opinion besides which he is quite well enough off to support three wives and as a matter of duty if nothing else he ought to do so that would soon bring miss alice to a proper state of mind and she needed something of the sort for do you know she had actually made that silly husband of mine think she ought to be treated with the same consideration as myself well but i said if the principle of polygamy is of god it is only just that all the wives should be treated alike if my husband were to marry another woman much as it would pain me i should certainly treat her as an equal then she replied if you do so you will find that the first wives will have nothing to do with you you will find when you come to be better acquainted with the people here that the first wives do not waste much love over the polygamic wives and of course as a rule the polygamic wives detest the first wives then the plural wives get together and talk all manner of evil about the first wives who do pretty much the same in respect to them it is only natural that they should do so but i was going to tell you she continued how i selected the third wife there was an emigrant train expected in every day and you know when the emigrants arrive all those women who want wives for their husbands and all those men who want to choose for themselves go down to the camping ground and if they see a girl who takes their fancy they ask her if she has got a place to go and if she has not they offer to receive her themselves there are hundreds of young girls who arrive here without anyone to look after them and who are only too glad to accept a home for the winter now this was exactly what i did i went down to the camp and looked round for myself and at last my eyes rested upon a young woman of about thirty or thirty-five years of age who i thought would be a more suitable wife for my husband than that giggling chit that i chose for him at first i decided at once that she would do so i went up to her and asked her if she had any friends she said she had a brother living in the city but when i explained to her how we were situated and said that i should like her to come and stay with us till she could look round a little for herself she agreed at once now i thought miss alice we shall see whether you are going to have things all your own way any longer i told her however 
as well as my husband, that I had brought home a sister to stay with us a while, and they received her very kindly, and she soon made herself very useful and agreeable to us all. The bishop came and talked to my husband, and he made no difficulty at all in acceding to my wishes, and before long he made our visitor wife number three, and Alice, as a matter of course, lost a good deal of her influence over him. For my own part I am much more comfortable. The two plural wives do nearly all the work, and I have little else to do than superintend the household and enjoy myself. My husband is one of those quiet sort of men who never interfere with domestic affairs, and I have matters pretty much my own way now. The only thing that annoys me is his fondness for Alice, who makes herself appear most amiable to him, deceitful thing. I can't break him out of that, but I often tell him that he will find her out some day. He tells me that he looks upon her as a child and feels like a father towards her. No woman, he says, can ever have his love but me. That sounds all very well, but as for believing it, that is quite another thing. I keep my eye on them and watch them well. But, I said, it appears to me that it would have been far better if you had never given him another wife at all. You would have been saved from annoyance, and the privacy of your home would not have been disturbed. I am the more surprised, as your husband did not himself desire it. When you understand better the order of the kingdom, you will not speak in that way, she said. Do you suppose that I should be satisfied to be the wife of a man who could not exalt me in the celestial kingdom, a man with only one wife? Why, I have often told my husband that if he did not get other wives, I would leave him. It is necessary for a man to have two wives at least, if he would enter into the celestial kingdom. That is why I have been so anxious to get wives for my husband. At the same time, there is no necessity for him to fall in love and act in a silly way over them. The only way in such a case is to set one to watch the other, and then they are pretty certain to keep the old man straight. You think, perhaps, that I don't feel all this, but you must not be deceived by appearances. I try to do the will of heaven with a smile on my face, and the brethren have often told me that if the other sisters were more like me, they would not have so much difficulty in establishing polygamy. But dear me, Sister Stenhouse, what a long talk we've had. I'll come and see you soon again, for my husband will be home to supper by this time." So she left me wondering over her strange story of a woman's experience in supplying her own husband with wives. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Social Life in Salt Lake City ballrooms, wallflowers, and divorce. Spring opened bright and beautiful, and I began to feel more at home in Zion and more contented with my position. I do not, however, mean that I was satisfied with polygamy or that I contemplated calmly the prospect of my husband taking a plurality of wives but that I had begun to adapt myself to the manners and customs of the saints, and had already formed many of those pleasant intimacies which lend such a charm to life. My talkative friend was a constant visitor at our house, and her strange views of life and of that all-absorbing subject, the management of man under the plural wife system, together with her lively conversation and unceasing flow of spirits, made her visits acceptable, and she often banished from my mind thoughts which, if unchecked, would have made my life unbearable. Her husband, too, poor creature, sometimes followed in her train, and on one occasion she actually brought Alice with her, that I might see what sort of a girl she was. I found her quite good-looking, intelligent, and as pleasant a little body as one could wish to know but at the same time I detected in the expression of her features 
lively and self-reliant as she was too many traces of that look of subdued sadness which casts a cloud over the countenance of every woman living in polygamy other friends besides i had too numerous to mention friends whom i had known in england and whom i had wept over the horrors of polygamy when it was first announced and dear swiss friends not a few who had come to zion before us and were now quite settled and at home two faces i longed to see but of their owners i could at first get no tidings poor dear madame belif my old swiss friend who in past days had shown me so many kindnesses and whom i had so tenderly loved where was she somewhere i knew in zion but not in salt lake city and to the chapter of accidents i felt that i must leave it whether i ever saw her again or not and there too was mary burton with all her sweet winning ways she whom i had known as a child whose early womanhood had been darkened by apprehensions of that accursed abomination polygamy who had suffered that terrible martyrdom upon the plains who for aught i knew might at that very time need most my sympathy and sisterly love oh where was she poor mary might it not be that worn out with the fearful sufferings which she had endured she had gone to that peaceful rest which she had so vainly sought on earth i had asked every one who came across my path who was likely to know whether they could give me any information as to where she was but i could learn nothing more than that not long after their arrival she and her husband had left the city and had gone to one of the settlements in southern utah i had therefore to wait in uncertainty for any chance which might accidentally bring us again together i was very glad that the winter was over for we had had rather a rough time during our first months in salt lake city and the various associations of our life had tended rather to strengthen than to relieve my apprehensions respecting the future the ball season which of course i cannot pass by in silence had been a source of annoyance and i may say disgust to me i had seen so much that was unpleasant at those balls and although what i witnessed did not then affect me personally yet it was painful to see others suffer and to hear poor women whose hearts were crushed and broken tell each other in whispers the sorrow which had blighted their existence dancing was always very popular among the saints and the leading men among them have wisely fostered a taste for it when the people first went out to utah as may be supposed life was hard and amusements were few the mormons as a body are examples of industry and diligence to them labor is one of the cardinal virtues and like all other pioneers they found plenty of employment for their energies houses had to be built land prepared for cultivation the commonest necessaries of life to be manufactured or raised and busy hands were perpetually engaged in a thousand useful industries and the dust of toil was washed from the careful brow it was but natural that the need of a little recreation should be felt so in very early days brigham built a theatre and a very fair amount of histrionic talent was developed among the saints the social hall in which were held balls public entertainments and other amusements was used for histrionic performances before the theatre was built brigham owned the theatre money was to be made out of it and the chance of making money brother brigham never permitted to slip through his fingers brigham's eyes were sharp enough to see that a theatre would be to him a source of profit but he did not look far enough that theatre under the immediate direction of the prophet with his own daughters acting in it with the plays which were performed under his own censorship has been one of the many causes which have perceptibly although perhaps indirectly shaken the hold which mormonism had upon many a woman's mind a man would probably witness the performance of a play with no other thought than the remembrance of an hour's amusement but not so a woman to her the play suggested something more and her daughters would share her thoughts 
daily and hourly it might be the effects of polygamy would be brought under their notice as a matter affecting themselves personally they might be firm in the faith but the observant instincts of their sex could never be wholly crushed they would notice the neglect which wives endured even from good husbands they would see a man leaving the wife of his youth the mother of his children and careless of the cruel wrong he did her leave her in lonely sorrow while he was spending his time in love-making with some young girl who might have been his daughter they would see a wife crushing out from her heart the holiest impulses which god had implanted there striving to destroy all affection for him whose dearest treasure that affection should have been because indeed polygamy could not exist with love and themselves personally feel the degradation and misery of the celestial order of marriage and that to them would be the practical picture of life but in the theatre short-sighted brigham to allow it to be so another picture would be presented for their consideration a picture it might be ideal in its details and surroundings but true to the letter and the lesson which it conveyed and the thoughts which it suggested the disgusting the brutalizing cruelties of polygamy were never represented on the stage thoughts so coarse so sensual could never inspire the true poet's pen no the tale of love as the poet tells it is all that is refined and chaste and delicate and pure the commingling of two souls the unison of two loving hearts the hopes the aspirations the tender joyful sorrows of two fond natures of two alone such is the picture presented as the ideal of the beautiful and of the good then too the delicate attentions of the devoted lover his happiness even in the shadow of a smile from her the lofty pedestal upon which to his imagination she stands a queen and peerless or the confiding love of the heroine of the story blushingly confessing to herself that there is one heart on earth which is all her own and in which none but herself can ever rule or reign the mormon women are not devoid of common sense nor are they destitute of those quick perceptions which under all circumstances distinguish their sex they see on the stage representations of the happiness attendant upon love and marriage such as god ordained and such as finds a response in every heart and they compare such pleasant pictures with what they know and have witnessed of polygamy and they draw painful inferences therefrom their faith may be proof against apostasy but the impression left upon their minds produces its effect notwithstanding another institution was the dance brigham and the leaders knew that it would never do to leave people without amusements of some kind and thus the balls and social gatherings were originated the idea of prophets apostles high priests and patriarchs attending a ball and joining in a dance must appear grotesquely incongruous to the gentile mind but out among the mormons it is quite the thing and to the men those balls and parties were very pleasant i do not think that many of the mormon women enjoyed the ball season and i know to some of them it was the most painful part of their lives it is a cruel thing for a woman anywhere to know that her husband's affections are divided that she is not his only love and that his heart is no longer all her own but far worse is the lot of the wife in utah she has to see and be present when the love-making is going on when her husband is flirting and saying soft nonsense or looking unutterable things at silly girls who are young enough to be her daughters nay her own daughters and her husband's may actually be older than the damsel he is courting for his second wife such an outrage upon the holiest feelings of womanhood would not for a moment be tolerated in any civilized community but among the saints women are taught that this is but one part of that cross which we all have got to bear cross-bearing is all very well and i do not doubt that sorrow and trial have a sanctifying influence upon the soul but by all means 
let us have a fair division of the burden it is not just that the heaviest end of the beam should be placed on poor weak women's shoulders and that her lord should even find pleasure in that cross which weighs her to the dust and crushes out from her weary soul the last sparks of love and happiness and hope how sweetly did the men preach patience and submission to the will of heaven i wonder where their own patience and submission would have been had matters been reversed and their wives had been taught that it was their privilege and a religious duty to court and flirt with and marry men younger and handsomer than their husbands the brethren never forget what brother brigham once said about the mormon men being all boys under a hundred years of age and they do not neglect their privileges here in the ballroom you may see men of threescore years and even older joining in the dance with girls of sixteen and even younger making love to them flirting with them marrying them age or plain looks are nothing with such men the girls are taught that they can exalt them to greater honor and happiness in heaven than young and untried men could and that they ought to feel honored by receiving tender attentions from the chosen servants of the lord one wife or even half a dozen if they chance to have so many of course will not stand in the way the husband is the lord and master and a woman's wishes count for naught in the ballroom the company of the first wives and in fact of many of the plural wives once worshipped but who had had their day was not so much sought as that of young and interesting maidens and after having stood up with their husbands in the first dance as a matter of form many of those forlorn wives might be seen sitting along the sides of the hall keeping each other company and talking over their sorrows we used to call these poor ladies the wallflowers sitting there watching noting all that their husbands did or said those poor women were in themselves a touching protest against the cruelty of the system such as none but a mormon heart could have resisted but for that horrible system these balls and parties would of course have been extremely pleasant with the feeling of fraternity which exists among the saints such gatherings ought only to be a source of pleasure but polygamy blighted everything and it is with the feeling almost of hatred that i recall some of those occasions how many an aching heart has there felt weary felt so weary as to long for death no change of feature might betray the mental struggle but the bitterness of the soul was all the same and i have seen wives there whose husbands paid them marked attentions so that the girls to whom they were making love might notice their devotion and draw favorable auguries for the future in case they married them and the wife has known all this and has valued her husband's attentions accordingly and yet the poor deluded women persuade themselves that this system is right and in accordance with the revealed will of god and they think that the evil poor creatures is in their own hearts and that they deserve to suffer the mormon men sometimes would be rather surprised i think if they could hear what their wives say of them at those balls i have seen very obedient wives so goaded to anger by the conduct of their husbands that they have said very bitter things indeed and what was not spoken was felt i know by every wife in whose nature the last traces of womanly feeling had not been altogether crushed out at one of those balls the apostle heber c kimball came up to me and said in his jesting way that he would introduce me to his wife he brought up five or six ladies of various ages one after the other and said there now i think i'll quit now for i'm afraid you are not too strong in the faith are these all you have got i asked oh dear no he said i have a few more at home and about fifty scattered over the earth somewhere but i've never seen them since they were sealed to me in nauvoo 
and I hope I never shall again. Heber was called the model saint. But the ball season passed, and the spring came on, and our prospects began to brighten. My husband not only found remunerative employment for his pen in Salt Lake City, but was also engaged as special correspondent to the New York Herald and several of the California papers. One morning a countryman, roughly dressed and looking the picture of care, called at our house and asked to see Mr. Stenhouse. I gazed at him for a moment, for I thought there was something familiar in the sound of his voice. He looked at me, and I at once recognized him. It was Monsieur Beliff himself, in whose house we had lived in Switzerland. But, oh, how changed he was! Once a refined, handsome, gentlemanly man, now a mere wreck of his former self. Careworn, roughly looking, poorly clad, he and his family had been in Utah six years, and had suffered all the ills that poverty can induce. The change which was wrought in him was so great that for some moments I was so overcome by my feelings that I could not utter a word. In the few short years which had elapsed since I saw him in his own bright and happy home, he had become quite an old man. I hardly dared to ask about his wife, for I feared what his answer might be. But after a little while he told me that she had sent her love and would like to see me whenever I could find an opportunity to call upon her. They lived some miles from the city, but I told him that I would not fail to visit them whenever it was possible for me to do so. I talked a long while with Monsieur Beliff and was much interested in what he told me. He made no complaints, he had still firm faith in Mormonism, and said that if the brethren had not dealt fairly by him, they would be answerable to God for what they had done. Besides, he added, I do not blame them so much, for they are Americans, and would not be happy if they did not get the advantage in some way. I was anxious to ask him if he had been induced to take another wife, as he had been in Utah during the Reformation, and I did not see how it was possible for him to have escaped. But while I was thinking how I might put the question delicately, he saved me the trouble by himself telling me that he had married the young servant girl whom his wife had taken from Switzerland with her. This information was quite a shock to me, for I well knew the proud spirit of his wife, and I could realize what anguish this second marriage must have caused her. I did not, however, like to question him on the subject, so I turned the conversation into another channel, and when he went away I sent kind messages to Madame Beliff, saying that I would seize the very first opportunity of hearing from her own lips the story of all they had gone through. Here again I found the trail of that monster, polygamy, this time in the home of my dearest friend. From the moment when she and I had mingled our tears together in Switzerland over that abomination, life had been to me one long, weary, sickening battle with my own heart, one futile attempt to fully convince myself that polygamy was right and that I was wrong. I certainly did believe, or thought that I believed, the doctrine was true, but at times nature prevailed in the struggle and womanly indignation and anger rose in arms against faith. These feelings were, however, at once and unhesitatingly subdued. Faith returned triumphant, and I was again convinced that the revelation must have been the will of the Lord, and that my duty was to submit, but not to question. In moments of comparative self-control, I had even tried, as a missionary's wife, to justify it to others, but only to witness an outburst of sorrow and anger, and to feel still more the weakness of my position. That had been my own experience, but how had the time passed with my dear old friend? She must, no doubt, have been as greatly disappointed as I was when she came to Zion, 
and saw things as they really were, and not as they had been represented to us. My own eyes had certainly been opened not a little since my arrival. Instead of finding the people enjoying the comforts and blessings of life, which we had been taught were strewn about them in profuse abundance, we found, among all but the leading families, the greatest poverty and privation. The majority of the people were living in little log or adobe houses of one or at the utmost two rooms of the most primitive construction, and without the slightest convenience of any description. Their food was bread and molasses, and it might be an occasional morsel of meat, but many of them scarcely even indulged in the latter or in any article of grocery for months at a time. Their floors and walls were bare, and their clothing poor and scanty and yet, destitute as they were of all the comforts and conveniences of life, they were conscientiously endeavoring, like good saints, to practice polygamy, because, as they believed, the Lord had commanded it. In respect to education, they were in even a worse position. Books, pictures, and periodicals of any kind there were none, with the exception of that dreary organ of the church, the Deseret News, the soporific influence of which some wicked apostate has likened to a dose of Winslow's soothing syrup. Brigham Young, himself an illiterate man, and the leading elders frowned upon every attempt to raise the intellectual status of the people, and so little encouragement was given that no one could afford to keep school. The consequence was that the boys and girls grew up with little more education than their own sense of necessity taught them to acquire for themselves. And it was not until very recently that any suitable efforts were made to supply trained teachers, and to open schools in which a thorough education could be afforded. I have already mentioned the sermons in the tabernacle, and observed how little calculated they were to elevate the character or cultivate the minds of the people. I have before me, as I write, a choice morsel extracted from one of the sermons of Heber C. Kimball, which I think I must give for the reader's benefit. Fancy an apostle thus addressing a large and mixed congregation of men, women, and children. Here are some educated men just under my nose. They come here and they think they know more than I do, and then they get the big head, and it swells and swells until it gets like the old woman's squash. You go to touch it, and it goes cur smash. And when you look for the man, why, he ain't thar. They're just like so many pots in a furnace. You know, I've been a potter in my time, almighty thin and almighty big. And when they're sot up, the heat makes them smoke a little, and then they collapse and tumble in. And they ain't no war. This was Heber's style in general. Next to making modest people blush, nothing pleased him better than to annoy or ridicule anyone who had the smallest pretensions to education. And yet, naturally, Heber was a kind-hearted man. Brigham's style is very little better, and the substance of his discourses quite as bad. I will give a very favorable specimen, taken from a sermon on polygamy, delivered some years ago, touched up and corrected, and published in the official organ, the Deseret News. Men will say, my wife, though a most excellent woman, has not seen a happy day since I took my second wife. No, not a happy day for a year, says one, and another has not seen a happy day for five years. I am going to set every woman at liberty, and say to them, Now go your way, my women with the rest, go your way. And my wives have got to do one of two things, either round up their shoulders to endure the afflictions of this world, and live their religion, or they must leave, for I will not have them about me. I will go into heaven alone rather than have them scratching and fighting around me. I will set all at liberty. What, first wife too? Yes, I liberate you all. I know there is no secession to the everlasting whinings of many of the women in this territory. 
I am satisfied that this is the case, and if the women will turn from the commandments of God and continue to despise the order of heaven, I will pray that the curse of the Almighty may be close to their heels and that it may be following them all the day long. And those that enter into it, the celestial order, and are faithful, I will promise them that they shall be queens in heaven and rulers to all eternity. Now, if any of you will deny the plurality of wives and continue to do so, I promise that you will be damned. This was sweet language for a prophet and a saint to utter, and yet it is not half so coarse or improper as some whole sermons that I have listened to from the lips of Brother Brigham and the other leaders of the church. The Apostle Orson Pratt is the only one who has dared, in the presence of Brigham, to say that education was a proper thing, and that there were many books which would be of good service to the saints if they obtained and studied them. On one occasion Brigham arose in ire and said, The professor has told you that there are many books in the world, and I tell you that there are many people there. He says there is something in all these books. I say each of those persons has got a name. It would do you just as much good to learn from somebody's names as it would to read those books. Five minutes' revelation would teach me more truth than all this pack of nonsense that I should have packed away in my unlucky brains from books. But the prophet has changed with the times, and there are now in Utah very good schools, both Mormon and Gentile. But none of them are free schools. Bishop Taylor once said in a public lecture that they were destructive to the best interests of the community and the bishop's lord in the lion house is exactly of the same opinion for he has repeatedly declared there shall be no free schools within his saintly kingdom on earth nevertheless brother brigham and his infallible priesthood are at last beginning to discover that although the night of ignorance and superstition may hate the clear daylight of truth and knowledge when the great ruler of all commands the light to come forth it is not in the power of man, with all his boasting, to forbid the sun to shine upon the dark places of the earth. Balls, parties, and the theater provided amusement for the people in Salt Lake City itself, but in the settlements there was little else in the shape of recreation than idle gossip or the harangues of the tabernacle. In the city, of course, this has all been changed of late years, but in the settlements of Utah, there is the same lack of civilization as there was fifteen or twenty years ago. At the time when we went to Utah, Mormon society was slowly recovering from that terrible marrying mania which has set in during the Reformation, and a season of divorce was the result. The authorities at that time, as I have already observed, had urged every person without distinction into polygamy. Men and women had been forced to marry one another without any respect to affection or fitness, and the result was that hundreds of marriages were entered into, which made those who contracted them miserable for life, but the consequences of which they could not avoid. At the same time, not a few were divorced almost immediately after they were married, and these things were a matter of daily occurrence. Brigham Young, with his eye perpetually on the dollar, finding that his marrying scheme, like many other of his divine plans, was a failure, saw at once that quite a nice little sum might be realized by charging a fee for divorces. Nothing was charged for marrying, but if the people insisted on having divorces, why the best and certainly the most profitable thing was to make them pay for it. When we first went to Utah, the prophet was doing quite a flourishing business in that line. Anyone could get a divorce for ten dollars, and Brigham publicly, in the tabernacle, jested about it, and said that the money thus obtained came in very conveniently as pin money for his wives, though I doubt if they ever received a dollar of it. He added that so far as eternity was concerned, 
these divorces were not worth the paper they were written on the people had married for eternity and in eternity they would have to live together whether they liked it or not he says the same today but still he sells his divorces and gathers in the ten dollars all this is an anomaly although the people do not appear to see it while more than any other community they profess to regard marriage as a sacred institution they marry and are divorced in a more careless fashion than the people of any civilized country i could mention instances which would be really ludicrous were they not so shocking i know a young woman in salt lake city who is not over twenty-one years of age she is a very pretty girl and has engaged quite extensively in the divorce business for she now lives with her fourth husband she was in my employment after she left her third and i had an opportunity of studying her character i noticed that she was frequently visited by a certain young man who seemed to make himself very agreeable to her and feeling a great deal of interest in her for she had left her father and mother in england when a mere child in order to gather to zion under the paternal care of one of the elders i asked her why the young man came to see her so often he is my intended husband she replied why i said quite astonished you have only just been separated from your last husband and after so much ill-treatment i should have thought you would have been afraid of trying another at any rate so soon as this you're wrong there she replied in quite a serious earnest way i am determined to marry until i get the right one even if i have to do so a dozen times don't you think i am right this really seemed so shocking that i did not know what to say the most absurd point in all this was that of her three former husbands one was a gentile and two were mormons the gentile of course would have no chance in the world to come but to each of the two mormons she was sealed for eternity now if brigham's divorces are of no force in the next world and if his marriages are binding what will this young woman do between her two mormon husbands to say nothing of the two other gentile ones who do not count for the mormons though they are so generous to themselves in the matter of wives will not allow a woman to have a couple of husbands either here or in eternity what nonsense is all this what blasphemy to ascribe to it the lord how different i found the mormon lord from that great and glorious being source of all goodness holiness and truth to whom in the days of my childhood I had looked up and adored. The Lord of whom they so flippantly spoke was not the same Him to whom things in heaven and earth do bow, by whom and in whom are all things. He never blighted the heart of woman or cursed her with a perpetual curse. But to Him, since I escaped from the cruel thraldom which once blighted my existence day by day, my soul goes out in love and gratitude would that i could infuse into the worn and weary hearts of the women of utah the knowledge that god has given freely to all his creatures to woman as well as man no cruel law to torture their souls no wretched revelation to embitter their lives but a gospel of peace and gentleness and love which makes perfect those who walk therein End of chapter 27